Hit the techie! Hit the techie in the halls! Good evening, how you doing? Bring your mic in a little. Oh, fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> people like to hear you, I know. Well, Some okay. people are trying to get to sleep and they need your soporific voice to lull them over. Well, you could have told me that before we bloody started. I always tell you, I always tell you that. <laughs> so, special one tonight. Because it, last week Ed suggested that we go more kind of current, current, not not like current since Sultanas, but you know current as in the current world that we're living today. And so we're going to try and save the world. And we invited we invited Elon Musk along because I think he's got it completely wrong when he said that Jack Dorsey's right. And I've got a video about Jack Dorsey, but we don't need to rush to that. Ed, how have your week been? Oh, my week's been really good. Yeah, I've uh, been working on a new uh, client website, which oh, has right. presented some stuff that I haven't done before, and I've basically nailed it now. And we haven't shown it to the client yet, but also the internal team is happy with it. So, yeah, no, it's good. I love love weeks like that. Productive, busy. Cool. cool. Cool, cool, I've been doing a website as well for La Petite Cherie Bakery. Oh, cool. The Wife's Bakery. So... Your wife's um, got bakery. Yeah, yeah. I um, I sent a tasting box to Julie. You know, from from that comes on here and support. In fact, Julie's here. Julie C. Good evening, Julie. So Julie got a tasting box, her and Adam, and um, I think they enjoyed it. And I would send you a tasting box, but I don't want to be accused of making you fatter than you really are. Well, I'm trying to lose weight, and I'm very <laughs> and I'm very partial to pastries. So, oh, I don't. It, it's listen. It's hard life because I'm having to taste everything. Uh, well, just having a wife that's a good baker, I'm surprised you're not already the size of Jabba the Hutt. <laughs> <gasps> your friend, your friend has just castigated you, mate. He's called you out. Oh, shut up, John. <laughs> <laughs> And he's not talking to me. He's talking to the other John. Yeah, no, the other John. I've, I've known I've known John for thirty years, so I can tell him to fuck off. When I want to. <laughs> yeah. So, um, if you've come here looking for a, a rabbit hole of gargantuan proportions, we'll probably dive into one at some point. Um, but tonight we're we're staying away from the cryptids and um, the esoteric, the supernatural, the paranormal. And we're going more mainstream, so we're going to really just have a kind of chat about what's going on in the world and and how we could fix it. And um, th there's lots going on in the world, and <laughs> some of the stuff going on in the world right now <laughs> just beggars belief. Like, you know, Russia sending a flotilla to Cuba and then Joe Biden pooping his pants <laughs> on stage. I mean, uh, what the actual? <laughs> it it's completely crazy. I mean, the the Russians are the bear is now. He's been poked, and and his patience is kind of wearing out. It's like, stop poking me, stop it. Just I'm going to hit you. Stop it. And now the Russians are basically. Well, the thing is that they're really clever, and they're not. They don't want to start nuclear war. They don't want to blow the world up. But equally, as is their right, they have lines and they have yeah. national self-interest. I mean, the the best argument is if you put, I mean, what, what the Americans were doing in Ukraine, it's exactly the same as if the Chinese went to Mexico, overthrew the Mexican government, installed someone that was massively pro-Chinese mm -hmm. and suddenly gave them permission to start building naval bases and yeah. stationing troops yeah and and then and then started basically giving them tacit permission to um to fire missiles at texas yeah and and, and start essentially killing u.s civilians which is what what's been happening happening in belgorod uh -huh. um but it's also i mean if, we, if we're going to follow the mexican analogy it would be something similar as if um, say, for example, the people in around Juarez in Mexico, which is near the U.S. border, um, identified as um, Americans, and they all spoke English, which obviously they don't. This is all hypothetical. Yeah. Um, but then 
the, the, the Chinese started encouraging the Mexican government to start firing missiles into Juarez because they didn't want to play ball and they didn't want to do the yeah. thing. It, it's, mm-hmm. I mean, that is the analogy that we're talking about. And for an American, <laughs> I mean, Americans would be like, no way. And, and what makes the Russians any different? Why, why do the Americans in the West get to be the ones that decide on the rules? It's like they say, oh, no, we can't change borders. And yet they bombed the crap out of Belgrade for 72 days in order to create the state of Kosovo, where they then built the largest bloody air base in the yeah. Eastern Med. So yeah, the whole the whole Serbian Yugoslavian thing was mm. a complete and utter shit show, and we were very much involved in that. Oh, we've been involved in all of it. Yeah, I think I know. some something. I don't know if we're if we're talking rabbit holes, then we go back to Cecil Rhodes um, mm-hmm. and his will, the, the stated aim of which was to bring the United States back into the British Empire. Um, and if you look well, at the way the US is acting. You have to wonder who's actually in charge. It's, I mean, it's Bibi Netanyahu actually running the US government. Oh, well, <laughs> yes, kind of. Yeah, maybe because they do have a they do have a lot of lobbying power. They really do. Um, but apart from that, some some would say that the American, the US, never ever left the British. In some respects. Yeah, I mean that's. There's, there's. If you look at the banking, it's the same with the colonies. Yeah. Um. I mean, okay, the colonial administrators left, but all of the corporations that were given a toehold in places like Africa, all of them, all they, all they all stayed, and all of that money was still being exported, and there was no, it, very little development happened in those countries, certainly after colonialism. But the colo- the colonials only did the bare minimum they had to, to make things work just enough that they could exploit the country. Yeah. So he says we're frozen, but uh, sorry, no, it's not us. I think it might be you, Shalini. I think it might be you on your Brixton powered, you know, hamster wheel powered internet. (laughs) Don't start insulting Shalini's internet, John. (laughs) Come on, be nice. It's not, it's not the fact that, it's not the fact that it's bad. It's the fact you won't pay for decent internet. <laughs> Vaughn moans about it all the time because he can't play any games when he's over there. And when he does, he just annoys us all because he's like, it, it mucks up everybody's game. Mm. Anyway, sorry about that. I, didn't, no. I shouldn't have really interrupted you. No, that's fine. It's, we need to be interrupted. <sighs> right, if, uh... let's um, let's let's play the first video then. I've only got a couple, um, so let's play this video, um, that is to do with uh, China, China. Uh, what one is it? Oh, <laughs> this is wrong one. Let's go with that one. This is proving that the United States is the biggest land grab. 全球治理进程的最大绊脚石地区和平稳定的最大挑战对美方双标来说规则次序是化权霸权化术合着用不合则弃用来管从不管自己一贯 Yes, I, I think what I'll do is I'll restart that and I'll read along in a suitably un-Chinese voice Facts are proven. The Chinese. <laughs> don't, don't start doing Sorry. that. You'll insult people and you'll get the Sorry. diversity Fact, facts crowd have all proved you. that the United, the United States is the biggest source of chaos in the international order, the biggest stumbling block to global, global governance, and the biggest challenge to regional peace and stability. The US uses the rules and orders as hegemonic narratives. When these rules and orders serve their purpose, the U.S. employs them, the U.S. discards them. The U.S. uses the rules to suppress others, but never to restrain itself. It has always acted egotistically, doing whatever it wants, from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Ukraine to Gaza. All these crises and conflicts are results of the self-serving double standards of the U.S. There you go. Well, actually, that Chinese... Spokesman's not far away from the truth. 
Absolutely not. I mean, I've, I've been a student of history, certainly for 30 years. Um, yeah. I did international relations at university and geopolitics, probably because of my background, but it's always been a massive interest to me. Um, and what the, the Chinese general is saying is absolutely spot on. And, and you see it with this whole nonsense about rules-based international order. I'm sorry, we have international law and you're only creating a rules-based international order so you can change the bloody rules and do whatever the hell you want. Mm. And they've, I mean, the US has been going out of its way. It's like Brzezinski. It, it speaks to the idiocy of the current American government because Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was, um, I think he was Jimmy Carter's national security advisor. And he, yeah. was, uh, he was, I mean, he was... Uh, he's uh, been around um, for a while. Yeah. I think he's dead now, but or if he's not, he's on his last legs. But he was massively influ influential in U.S. foreign policy circles. And I agree with pretty much nothing that he ever said. But one of the <laughs> things that he and Henry Kissinger, who's another person who was a giant in, in terms of U.S. foreign policy, but yeah. again, I, I think he was an evil bastard and I, can't, I don't agree with him about anything. But both of those two spent almost their whole careers trying to keep the Russians and the Chinese apart. And Brzezinski himself said, the worst thing you can do is let China and Russia get close together. Mm -hmm. um, and that's exactly what the current US administration has done. And they've, they've basically undone 50 years worth of diplomacy in the space of about mm -hmm. four or five years. And, and it's completely and utterly crazy yeah. and dangerous. Yeah. Um, and, and the fact, because of the lapdog media who aren't telling people the truth, People don't understand just how close. I mean, I think that the atomic, the, the, the let's just check the current atomic clock. The, uh, oh, the it, minutes uh, to midnight? Is yeah, it like minutes. 59 yeah, minutes and a half to or something. Because we're at the closest it's ever been. 20 seconds and, to Mars. Um, and <laughs> Jeffrey Sachs actually wrote, I don't know if you've heard of him, he's a very influential economist, um, and he's currently a professor of emeritus oh, or tenured or something. Gunky says 90 seconds. I said a minute seconds. and a half. I think that's the same thing. <laughs> um, so, it, and, and I mean, they set that clock up in the 1950s. And Dr. Jeff Strangelove. Sachs actually... Dr. Yeah, Strangelove but, set it up, didn't he? Well, not quite, but <laughs> pretty much. Sorry. I mean, there were some very strange Lovian characters in the US oh, military yeah. in the 1960s. Yeah. Uh, people like Lemnitz uh, and, and they're just some, some proper crazies. MacArthur. Yeah, but it, Jeffrey Sachs wrote a really good, interesting article about analysing US presidents in terms of what impact they had on the doomsday clock. And there's only a few of them have actually taken us away from midnight. And since, pretty much since Reagan and Bush, every single US president has taken us closer to midnight. Yeah. Um, and we're now hovering at 90 seconds and we have a geriatric old fool that doesn't even know what he's doing and he's pooping himself at important events. Um, and I th it's like with the D-Day oh. celebrations that people are also, the thing that I find, because I'm, I'm, I've never been to Russia. I'm not, I've always had a massive respect for Russians and I think oh. that Russian culture is unbelievable. And Russian people also, I've, I mean, you do have the sort of Sharm el Sheikh tourists who are really loud and irritating and stuff, but fundamentally, they're basically just like us, you, different, uh, different sort of language, yeah. different priorities. I, I would say you cannot judge people until you have seen them in their own country, mm, because agreed. Germans, Germans abroad are complete and utter arseholes. Mm -hmm. Germans at home. <laughs> aren't quite as bad in fact i've actually had i i really enjoy going to germany on holidays and when traveling through it and things like that. germany's not a bad country to visit you know and it's it's quite, lovely it's quite beautiful but most countries are I yeah mean, i've 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 lived in five different countries on two continents mm -hmm. and you'll see beautiful sunsets everywhere yeah. you will find nice people everywhere you will find horrible people everywhere as well but actually, the nasty ones, they're kind of a really vocal minority. There's not very many of them, but they, they do an awfully good job at making life miserable for the rest of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, but it's people are just people. They fundamentally they might speak different languages and follow different religions and have different cultures and eat different food. But when you take all that away, we just want the same fundamental thing. We want to live our lives in peace. We want a roof over our heads. We want to have a, our families and, and a nice life for them. Maybe a couple of holidays a year if we can. An interesting job. Most people don't ask for much, mm -hmm. but we have this. We've got small minorities at either end, the really rich ones and the really, really poor ones. And both of those small minorities are kind of ruining the world for the rest of us. Um, and and it's, it's a shame because there's, there's more than enough food on the planet to feed everybody. Oh, yeah. And there's, there's plenty of space. Precisely. And this whole notion that the world is overpopulated. It's uh, nonsense. Uh, have you flown anywhere recently? It's not. It's nonsense. It's just nonsense. Exactly. I mean, you you so, could put you could stand everyone in Texas and have a meter of space around them all, and you wouldn't have filled up Texas. Precisely. It's all so, about control. Yeah, it is all about control. The what we have is we have areas that are densely populated because everybody wants to stay there, like London, Paris, Munich, Hong Kong, San Francisco, New York. You know, LA. These these areas all attract a lot of people because they're big and they've got loads of business and loads of opportunity, and that's why everyone wants to be there. But they're, I mean, look at Scotland. You've got eight people per kilometer uh, per square. Is it square mile? Actually, it's something like eight people per square mile in Scotland. That once you get above Glasgow, there's nobody in Scot. Scotland's empty. Mm. Now the thing is, people will say, "Well, Scotland's right for migration." Then if it's empty. But there's nothing to do up there, you know. And and when I say nothing to do, what are they going to work on? You know, how they're going to make an, a living? Because the place is full of sheep or or land that's owned by people, right? And is then set aside for, well, I mean, I mean, a lot of scrubland as well. I mean, why do you think Scotland only had clans, small clans living in the hills? Because you can't sustain a big population on shit. Because that's basically all you've got, heather and shit. I mean, what you you're gonna? I mean, look at Braveheart days. You're gonna be running around chasing three-legged haggis. You know, I mean, you've got a few sheep. You'll be eating rabbits and the odd deer if you can catch one. You know, because you'll be tripping over that fucking stupid thing they call a kilt. And when you actually see a real kilt, not just the dress one that we wear today, which is kind of like a skirt. It's not a skirt, it's a kilt. But apart from that, the full kilt with all the stuff that you put around you and all that, it's like, for fuck's sake, it's like walking about with a, a, a continental quilt and the sheets and duvet cover and pillowcases. Because that's what you did. You slept in it. You wrapped it around your head and went to sleep. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, people have this romanticised idea of what it was like to live in early Scotland and boy you didn't want to you really didn't well that's the thing about the middle ages and and time periods in the past that people look back on now mm -hmm. and think oh that was must have been so idyllic but when if you actually live there and you you realize the insanitary hellhole that you were living in and it's and, cold and wet all the time yep and you have no central heating or any of the kind of nope. modern conveniences that we all take for granted um and you realize it actually wasn't as pleasant as all that we did we didn't have central heat until we came back from hong kong in our house i i remember when i was a, a young kid i used to scrape ice off the inside of the my bedroom window you know because it was that cold i mean windows were only single paned you know we didn't have double glazing we didn't get double glazing until the 80s we didn't get central heating until the late 70s yeah it must have, it, yeah it must have been the late 70s I think my dad was out in the Navy by the time we got central heating. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you have to think about what, what we were talking about a minute ago with lots of people living in cities and not, mm -hmm. not really elsewhere. An awful lot of that is because of the Industrial Revolution and because you had these factories start up and mm -hmm. places like Scotland, you have Glasgow and Edinburgh and Aberdeen and yeah. all of these places. Um, and the people would gravitate there from the countryside because they can earn some money and yeah. have a house and all that kind of stuff. And then um, what they would do, they would set up schools, right? And they would model the schools on 
the conditions that people were working in in the factories. So what happened was you got nice big schools that looked like factory buildings, right? And everybody had their own desk and you went and went and sat at your own desk at your rework station and then got conditioned. So when you left school and moved into the factory, it was seamless, absolutely seamless. So basically you were being conditioned and brainwashed into being a nice little wage slave from day one. And nothing's changed. Nothing has changed. Well, apart from the fact that they now condition you to be a good little wage slave and to be totally fucking confused about your gender. <laughs> yeah, well, that. To be fair, that's a that's a fairly new thing, and I'm not sure that I'm not sure that's government driven. I think this, I think it might be corporate driven with this ESG crap that came out of Larry Fink, and I'm not quite sure what is aim was i don't know if it was to initially drive down maybe it's to drive down the cost of companies so they could invest cheaply you know well i i i don't know i i think it's about control i think esg is essentially social credits for companies for companies yeah but it's um, kind of it's kind of getting it's getting pushed to the wayside now i mean netflix have kind of dropped it because basically they were losing both subscribers and money hand over fist weren't they well, this is the thing about all of this green social justice nonsense is that it actually just turns out to be a massive con and a way mm -hmm. for people to make money. Because it, it's if you look at the... It, it's like the hypocrisy of um, people who support... There are all these climate change people refusing to talk about the fact that wind turbines kill large numbers of birds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, they do. And, and, they and the vibrations send whales off course because it screws up with their internal navigation systems. And they're noisy. If you have, if you live near one, they are noisy. And they, they are, they're, and they're quite intrusive. And none of it is recyclable. No, I know. If you actually look at all this green tech, the electric cars, the batteries, the wind turbine blades, the solar panels, none of it's recyclable. And, and they don't and, last forever. Yeah, and remember, they use they use about eight hundred gallons per gearbox of oil that has to be changed every year. <laughs> and you look at the just because uh, that's the, what goes on fire. Mm, it's well, the oil in the gearbox that goes on fire initially, and then the whole thing just burns down. Yeah, I mean, there's a great infographic that I've seen floating around on Twitter um, that just details all of the the. Uh, energy that goes into producing the batteries for an electric car mm -hmm. and they're not green at all oh no of course they're not they're not it's just it's it's it, it it's basically you're exporting the pollution somewhere else although china's coming out with a new technology i think it's like a sodium ion battery or something um, which is much much cheaper to make and performs better than a lithium ion so that could be interesting and sodium's sodium's it's prevalent it's easy to get it's cheap um and it's not so it's not so volatile when it comes to shorting out and things like that so hopefully we wouldn't see too many teslas on fire if they change the batteries sure i mean um but even better with the wind just the last thing on the wind turbines maybe is um remember scottish power they um they were found out to be running diesel generators to turn to turn the wind turbines during the winter when the wind wasn't blowing to stop them freezing up and becoming useless <laughs> and and there's there's plenty of there was one brilliant one that i saw which is a tesla owner had installed a rack on the back of his car so he could put a petrol generator there and he had him he had the generator running yeah. and had it plugged into the electrical socket and he was driving along i just the, the whole thing if okay it's if, madness it's it's complete madness but the world seems to have lost its mind this is this is part of the problem that we've got with trying to save the world it's yeah. because the world doesn't seem to want to be saved or at least a certain, a large... Right, well, well, let's think about this, right? Let's think about this. Humans are... Humans are basically tribal... They're, they're, they're a tribal, you know, animal, right? We live in small tribes, and we, we like to know the people that we deal with. And we don't, we don't have necessarily the urge 
to to travel that far that often. I mean, we like our holidays and things, but basically we just want to be left alone and left to get on with things. But we really, really re react badly when people start taking away our toys or making us pay through the nose for them. They mean we can't get enough to eat or enough to buy other toys. And, and it seems to be that governments recently have done nothing but do that. You know, they've just poked us and poked us and poked us. Are they trying to find a breaking point? Are they, are they actually trying to do that? Because that's what it seems like. Well, maybe they are, because it, it, it's the whole build back better, great reset mm -hmm. thing that to build back from something, you basically have to destroy it first. And they are trying to well, create maybe. their... And, and, and the thing is that there are... There are people in this world, I'm not talking about James Bond level bad guys or any of that kind of nonsense. I mean, Klaus Schwab might look like a James Bond bad guy, but the impressions of people who are a bit sort of neutral who have met him. I mean, Tucker Carlson's impression of Klaus Schwab was that he's a senile old fool that doesn't know what he's talking about in a nutshell. Um, and if you look at the caliber of leaders, like these young global leader idiots that we're, we're saddled with, people like Trudeau and stuff like that, um, I think they were chosen because they displayed particular qualities, but I don't think any of the qualities they displayed are actually ones that make them good leaders. I think that's basically it's because they're obedient and they're compromised and they're essentially sociopaths and don't don't actually care about anybody apart from themselves because unless you have that sort of personality type they're not going to be able to do some of the things that these people have done and are doing um and you can see that in terms of how they deal with the russians i mean on the russian side you have very smart people i mean you just to start with sergey lavrov he's the best diplomat the world's seen yeah. since Otto von Bismarck easily um, and Putin himself is a very smart man you love him or hate him he's a bloody good chess player and he understands his his enemy he understands his own side he's a patriot mm. and but the thing the thing is that because of Western media have this whole Putin derangement syndrome where where it's not they don't talk about Russia it's just the Putin and it's one of the reasons that he's been so successful is he has bloody good people around him. I mean, even just, um, what's her name, Yulia Navalny? No, not that one. Um, oh, she's the head of the Russian Central Bank. Um, and she's, I wish she, she was running the Bank of England for crying out loud. Um, and the sort of economists, and they have people that are actually trained. It's like Budanov, the guy that was just you appointed. <clears throat> No, go on. Yeah, no, I, I was just just wrapping off a point you made there. Should we have a central bank? Well, one of my, if we're going to start start down that one, when I said to you before the show that I had some ideas about how we could save oh, the world. Oh, this could my, be Ed's idea number one. If you, if you gave me complete power in the country mm -hmm. and said, okay, you can do one thing and you have complete authority to get it done, but you can only do one thing, what would it be? And it would be simple. It, it would be to take the creation of money away from private banks and totally redesign uh -huh. how money is created yeah. so that it works in the interests of society and not bankers. Mm -hmm. And that's fundamentally, if you did that, an awful lot of other change would flow from it. Do you know how you would do that? Or is that something that you would have to explore in more detail on another? I, I'm not, I'm not an economist. I right, mean, okay. I have, I have some ideas. Well, I'm not it, a gynecologist, but I can tell you what a woman has. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but the, the thing is that I would, I would actually convene, you would convene a council of people who shared the same viewpoint of with, as you people like Catherine Austin Fitz, for example, uh -huh. who is very smart knows no shit in and out and if you look at one of the things that i think is has contributed to russia's success is because putin got the banks under control uh -huh. and he he chucked out a load of bad bankers and he kept yeah. a few good ones yeah 
Um, and now the Russian banking system is like the Russian military industrial complex. It works in the interests of Russia and not private shareholders. Yeah. And the problem that we've got with the military industrial complex in Western Europe and the US is that it's all profit driven. Yeah. And it's not, it, it, and doing things in the national defense, like having factories that produce artillery shells that you don't, we, where you build, the, you build the factory, what the Russians do. So they say, okay, we need to build artillery shells, but we need to take into account that we, get, we might get some arsehole like Napoleon or Hitler trying to invade us. So just to be on the safe side, we're going to build this thing three times bigger than it needs to be. Mm-hmm. And we'll just mothball two thirds of it. Mm-hmm. And we're going to make sure that we have, we're producing engineering graduates. I mean, if you look at China and Russia and India, the number of edu- engineering graduates they're churning out every year yeah. um, is comparable with the number of gender studies graduates that Western universities are turning out. <laughs> well, that's obviously an exaggeration, but it's probably not me. It's it, they have <clears throat> this focus on this. I mean, I guess maybe it's a, a throwback to the fact that China and Russia both started off as communist. And mm. so the whole notion of having certain things that are state controlled is not this massive taboo like it is here, where we just have to privatize everything and the whole lot goes to shit. I mean, if you look at all of the industries that they privatized in the UK. Yeah, but, but the thing is, when we don't privatize stuff, it goes to shit as well. Well, yeah, because uh, I mean, the, 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 the SNP are the SNP are running the trains now. The well, trains have gone to shit. Mm, there, there is another thing that certainly we could do something to save the UK, um, which would be a few well, a few well placed missiles at West, Westminster. <laughs> I mean, honestly, the political class. You just have to look at the the election. It, it's we are so utterly screwed. <laughs> oh well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we are. But I mean, ultimately, is it going to make much difference? Only in the sense that things are likely to get worse. Yeah, but they'll get worse and by a small incremental amount. Well, not necessarily. No? Not necessarily. No, you think things could go, you know, tits up? Well, as the thing say? is that if, if, if Starmer comes in with gigantic majority and there isn't another party in Westminster that can touch him or or get in the way then he's essentially got a mandate to do whatever the hell he likes and he can then say oh look at me I've got a big mandate even if it's only 40 percent of the bloody electorate that actually turn out to vote for him um and then he can start making things if you if you look at how he was during the Rona Uh he was the government on steroids. He wanted to Jacinda Ardern the hell out of this country. It yeah, been like, yeah, would, he did, yeah. I mean, it was like if if harder, such, harder, yeah. go harder, yeah. go further, go harder. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I mean, the people like that look at Jacinda Ardern and think, "Oh, my hero." It's just it, it, no. It, people it, up here look at Nicola Sturgeon and go, oh, "She did a great job." <laughs> they really do. No, seriously, they really fucking do. Ah, uh, this just like see. I this said. is the thing when we're sitting here chatting amongst our peers and the people in the chat room and that we're, we're all among friends and we've all got generally the same viewpoint, right? But when you go out there and you speak to people in the real world, it's amazing the amount of them that actually don't don't have a fucking clue about what's going on, right? <laughs> and two, think the government is actually doing a good job. It, it just... but, I mean, see, this is the thing that gets me. It's like you, you had four years of, of CV, right? And the media did nothing but lie to you initially, right? They're now starting to come out with some half-truths, right? But they did nothing but lie. And then you have Russia and Ukraine, and the media again do nothing but lie about it, right? And now you've got, you've now got Israel and Gaza, and suddenly the media is telling the truth all the time. I don't think so, right? You know, I don't, I don't think the media is suddenly your your pal now. 
you cannot believe anything you're told. You have to look at everything and just take it as with a pinch of salt. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, it, I mean, it, it, and, and that might sound harsh, but, you know, unless you've been there and seen it, you don't have a fucking clue what's going on. No, that's absolutely true. And I, I, I have so little faith in what we call the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. I like to call it the dinosaur media because that's basically what they are. Yeah. The thing is that they are controlled. They have agendas. They have people that pay them. They had, have advertisers. But they have. So, they does, have, so does yeah. the independent media. That's the problem because you see that. You see that amongst people that we know, right? I've spoke to and, and you can see they have their own agenda as well. They will drive things a particular way, you know, and, and but isn't that just, you can't, I mean, it's, it's, it's that a human, human condition. condition. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It is a human condition. <laughs> but if you want to, if you want, if you honestly want to look at things impartially and, and to some degree, you have to look at them unemotionally as well, because if you let your emotions start to get involved, you start to sway things. So if you look at things impartially and sit on the fence, kind of like Ben and I do on a lot of occasions, right? People fucking hate it because they just say you're not picking a side. And why do you have to pick a side when both sides can be wrong? Can I, here's, here's a little anecdote. And this is something, it's something that has driven me absolutely mental my entire life about being half English and half Dutch. Mm -hmm. is that for me i i couldn't pick a side i don't want to there's there's things about holland that i love there's things about holland that i hate yeah yeah there's things about holland that i love and things about england that i hate yeah and you know what the first bastard question that most people ask me is oh so if england play holland who do you support my response is i fucking hate football don't watch football man. <laughs> But, but that, that, that's but that's it, our circus maximus isn't it that's our that's our you know throw the christians to the lions thing that's where we go for our entertainment we go to big stadiums just like they did two thousand years ago and shout at people in the middle of the stadium that are battling against each other today we battle virtually right and and i'm just as guilty as anyone because my stadium is formula one right but everybody has their particular stadium and that's what people do and the thing is, when you get into a big stadium like that, you start to have that mob mentality, and that mob mentality is great. Because once you've given people a mob mentality, all you need to do is put, find the button that pushes that trigger, and there you go. I hate it. I can't. I, yeah. I've, I've never, I've never actually once been to a massive concert in my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, I've never been to a football match. Um, I can't. I, I can't abide massive enormous crowds of people because you start to feel like you're losing control of yourself well you, you are become... because you're part of the mob precisely and that yeah. whole mob thing the thing that i find hilarious is that we have people that will lose their minds <laughs> we, we over fight. football yeah. but yeah, the go, government comes along and starts taking their freedom away and they all bend over and say oh well, yeah because the government's got your best interests at heart oh yeah yeah <laughs> when has that ever been true so we we fact shards asking your question there red just to say one of the things about humanity that astounds me <laughs> he's is ignoring how, me fat <laughs> how we can lose we how we can have just not learn from history and i'm not paying attention to the chat because i know what he's like i've known him for, I've known him for well, it, it, a giant yeah. pain in the ass oh yeah yeah so, <laughs> I, I met him i met him on um i met him on unn well i was chatting with gold eagle and he was on there yeah he is he is i mean he, he... <laughs> but aren't we all absolutely aren't we all? no and i will i will caveat it by saying i do love him to bits and he's he's the best friend a person could have but I, I'm also entitled to say that he's an annoying little shitbag sometimes. <laughs> not quite as annoying as the seagull, but sometimes not far off it. Yeah, that's see, that, I tell you, I, I don't know, I don't know how you're so patient, mate. I would have, I would have had the old rifle out. You should have seen me at twenty past four this morning. <laughs> I, yeah, if, I... there was, if there was, a, if there was a curse in the in the tongues of men or elves that i knew that i could have <laughs> inflicted on that bird i would have done it 
<laughs> he was still tapping with the, when the show started. I had to close the, the kitchen oh door. Oh, my God. You know, it's the bloody... I tell you what, the one thing those girls have given me is an appreciation for winter. Those those short winter days where the, the little buggers... Oh, yeah. Because one flight at night, will they? No, they're gone by four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, and they don't turn up until half past seven or eight o'clock. I bloody love it. <laughs> I, I, I detest seagulls. I just... The flying vermin. I, to be honest, if they weren't tapping, if if they would come at a civilized hour and tap for a little bit and not come five, six times a bloody day, um, yeah. I have developed a new appreciation for them. Um, but the tapping on the window at twenty past four in the morning is enough. But the problem is, you've trained them to do that. I didn't. No, oh, they, yeah, trained, okay. they have trained me. I yeah, they've stop. trained you to feed them, so you shouldn't have fed them. You should just have hit them with a water glock from day one. I'm blaming the guy that did the kitchen because they started tapping oh, no. before I had the kitchen done, and I didn't feed them up until that point. And then the guy that was um, doing the kitchen was giving them bits of his lunch. No. Um, God, these and, people and, are stupid. And then that basically kind of ruined it and I, I mean i do i have this love hate relationship with them the, the little one stephanie the female she's not the one that comes tapping on my bedroom window it's smeagol that is a really irritating one which is also yeah. why, why i call him smeagol um and yeah. sometimes i think he just likes messing with me he <laughs> probably really does do. um and and i have my water glock which is an actual water pistol it's an electric water pistol that is shaped like a glock um and it's pretty effective, but it's still having to get out of my bed at four twenty past four in the morning to fire a water pistol at a goddamn seagull that's tapping on my front window, my bedroom window. And I mean, my bedroom's not that big, so when I when when I say he taps on the window, the window is probably about four foot, five foot away from maybe six foot away from where my my head will be when it's on my pillow. Right. Okay. Um and it echoes through the whole room and they sound i the first time it happened i thought there was a person tapping on my window because it, it sounded exactly like a, a human knocking on the window <laughs> it, it that's exactly what it's like it, it's crazy um and and i was just like because i'm I, i'm, I'm so Ed, it's a police open up <laughs> yeah. and, and i'm i'm three floors up so it, it's kind of there's not going to be a person tapping on the window and i go out God. and it's a bloody seagull that was a bastard wasn't it when you yeah. flush, flushed your stash and, <laughs> not quite no there would have to be a little bit more yeah <laughs> I would put uh, I would put those spikes out so they can't land. I don't, I just it's cruel. I just no, it's not cruel because they wouldn't do it. They just they, they would see the spikes and go, I can't land there. It's like um, it's like flying a it's like flying a you know starship or something. Go, oh, I can't land in that. I'm just going to dump it in the ocean. Boom, because the the booster missed the fucking ocean, didn't it? It missed the landing pad. To yeah, death. but the thing is, if I put spikes out and one of those little idiots tried to land and got spiked and then i had this i had dead smeagol on the bloody window <laughs> tapped, well that's a cracking warning for everybody no, else isn't it? it's like I, I don't i don't need that oh don't point. don't go there there's a dead dead seagull over there boys <laughs> Wait, that's one of ours don't don't go there uh, he's no. a bad man bad man i no i couldn't I, that's that no. right let's let's <laughs> let's let's go off this subject and yeah. let's um let's listen to jack and see what jack's got to say okay um Ignore him. He'll be out of here in a second. <laughs> Just ignore him. He's not there. This is going to sound a little bit crazy, but I think the, the free speech debate is a complete distraction right now. I think the real debate should be about, about free will. And we, we feel it right now because we are being programmed. We're being programmed based on what we say we're interested in. And we are told uh, through these discovery mechanisms what is interesting. And as we engage and interact with this content, the algorithm continues to build more and more of this bias. But the algorithm, even if it's open source, is effectively a black box. You cannot predict 100% uh, of the time how it's going to work, what it's going to show you. And it can be moved and changed at any time. And, be and because people become so dependent upon it, it's actually changing and impacting the, the agency we have, the free agency we have. 
And I think the only answer to this is not to work harder at open source in algorithms or making them more explainable about what they're doing and why they're doing it, but to give people choice. Give people choice of what algorithm they want to use from a party that they trust. Give people choice to build their own algorithm that they can plug in on top of these networks and, um, and see, you know, see what they want and they can shift them out as well. Um, and give people choice to have really a marketplace around an algorithm that you can choose Right, so... Right, okay, hang on a minute. So this is the guy that created Twitter. Yeah, yeah. And he had the opportunity to do all of this. Yeah. And he instead does. he turned it into a censorious nightmare that was basically doing the government's bidding and yeah. boot, booting us all off uh, trying to express ourselves. Yeah. And okay, uh, you, can have a, you can have a kind of road to Damascus moment and um, go off and he seems to have turned into a bit of a hippie since he, he well, finished with Twitter. Yeah, uh-huh. Um, and in principle, I agree with him, but I don't. well, I think it, I'll give you my reasons. If we, if we sure, no, if we boil it down to the whole, it's not a case of freedom of speech, but freedom of will. Surely, it's the same thing. Yeah, what's, well, what's your right. So, what, there's a couple of things wrong with what I think he's saying, and I think he's looking at it from the wrong point of view, and I think. I think he thinks that, you know, a small amount of technologically adept people are driving where the human race is going. And I don't think it is, right? Because I think what's happening is the human race is driving where the technologically adept people are making their choices, right? So it's the majority of the people and what they choose and how they choose to consume and how they choose to look at things and what they want, it, they're already doing this. They're already picking the path they want to go down. And I think he's got it backwards. And and Elon Musk agrees with him. And I think Elon Musk has got it backwards too. And that's why I invited Elon onto the program. Because I wanted to tell him that I thought he has it backwards. Because five or six or, or 50 or 500 technologically adept people cannot change 8 billion people once they start on a course. And, you know, you don't start 8 billion people just by influencing one or two. What happens is the groundswell of opinion always influences the minor people. It's only the very, very occasional standout that will not go with the people. It's people like us, Ed, people that rebel against the system all the time that are the standouts, right? But the majority of people have picked their path already. And they know where they want to go. And it wouldn't matter how you try and drive them with algorithms or with ESG or whatever. They're already going down the path, you know. And, and unfortunately, many of these people have picked the wrong path. And the problem I see is you can't change that because the groundswell of opinion is already there. They've already got their path set and, you know, they're not for moving. I see this as a big, big problem, and it doesn't matter how many algorithms you dig into, you're never going to change the path that they're going in. You can influence the young, right? But once people are 30 and up, that's it. They're set. Generally. Uh, yeah, I mean... I'll, generally. I'll, yeah. I'm talking generalities. I'm not talking individuals, right? Because you can always... you can, But having said that, have you ever, ever, ever tried to convince an individual that they're wrong? Um... It takes a I, lot, and not many people will admit it. And I am one of those people that will admit it when I'm wrong, right? And and, and it's not often, but it, it happened to me the other day because there was a thing up about the Met Office, and I said, that the Met Office is nuts. That it can't possibly be a 25-degree average temperature in Scotland and, and me. And I read the thing wrong because there was a point in it. Now, to be fair, it was on Twitter, which is a tiny screen, right? But it was a plus point. It was a plus two point five centigrade increase. They said, right now, whether that's right or wrong, I still had to say, yeah, okay, because ultimately, what the Met Office was saying that the average temperature was thirteen degrees centigrade, right? So I said, yeah, okay, fair, fair point. Hands up, you're right. I'm wrong. I apologize. And then people come back at you, right? Going, you need to amend that tweet. And I'm like, fuck off. <laughs> I've apologised, right? 
I don't have a blue tick. I can't amend anything. Well, Take it out with fucking Elon. Well, not just that, but even if you do have a blue tick, you still can't. You you can you can only edit uh, tweets that you've yes. actually posted. You can't edit replies. That's correct. Um, yeah. So saying you you've got to amend that tweet, that's just someone being bloody minded. I actually remember blocking that particular person because yeah, my, probably arseholes. I mean, I I get people leaving nasty comments. Um, relative depends on the tweet um and because i've blocked a ridiculous number of people there's loads of oh. idiots don't even see anything i post anyway i went on um, a blocking spree as well you know what i did i blocked everyone that started a tweet with what do you think or what would you do and then there was a picture right so i just blocked all these people and it, it's actually made a substantial difference now it took me about a week right but now when I get people, when I get, when I see people on the timeline, generally it's people that are actually genuine people and not just trying to click farm. Well, this is, uh, that's exactly one of the reasons that I block with abandon because I mean, yeah. I block, I block probably four or five times more people in a day than I follow or that follow me. I don't um, follow anyone. And I, I mean, sometimes <laughs> if I'm, I, I'll go on blocking spree, like the nudes in bio thing, just block loads of them. And now I get, the occasional one um but i found that with those instead of just blocking them straight away if you if you go into it and you actually hide the reply you then get an option to block them and that actually seems to be more effective than just blocking them um because you're, you're basically influencing the algorithm in your mm -hmm. own way and this is the thing going back to what you're saying about algorithms i mean fundamentally i i agree you can't change the path that eight billion people are on but to say that eight billion people are all on the same path, I never said that. Is, well, it was you implied it. No, I didn't. No, I did not. Mm, okay, well then I read that. What I said is most people have chosen their path, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, doesn't... okay. Yeah, no, right. I see what you mean. Yeah. Okay. Right, but that obviously it depends because some people have chosen more positive paths than other people, um, and you can have you can have two people who could potentially have very similar life experiences who could end up going in completely different directions mm -hmm. and and one of them can be can go into a really positive in a really positive direction mm -hmm. and and kind of help themselves and pick themselves up and do things that that mean that they end up with a kind of happy positive life and another person who's made mm -hmm. who's had similar experiences and made different choices ends up on the streets dead or homeless or whatever or a good looking hooker well, well yeah <laughs> <laughs> i guess that was a bit random but yeah whatever oh it's just this, the sign of a failing economy is when the hookers get back better, better looking and cheaper <laughs> i i have no idea I, I no it's not it's not my thing so I wouldn't no know. it's not my thing either but i mean I, I and when i say i've had experience of hookers i don't mean carnally <laughs> I mean, I have spoken to them. I have spoken to them on a number of occasions in a purely professional capacity. Oh, right. Yeah, because you were a former police. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> we, had that, you... we, we had an inspector and when I, was, when I just joined the traffic, we had this inspector and he was a strange, strange, strange man. Strange, very strange man, right? And he used to, he was, uh, he was a wee free. Do you know what that is? no idea right so the we freeze are staunchly religious christians from the north of scotland or usually the islands i think kate forbes is one right kate forbes of the smp so they are incredibly incredibly religious and this guy he used to come i mean it, it was like when i just joined the traffic and they said to me one night they said inspect it was a night shift and, they, and i'm sitting in the canteen at at break time one night and the the um the guys will say the inspector will take you out one night this week and i'm like yeah okay because you want to see how good you are and i'm going yeah I, I, i'm only just here and he's going yeah but he'll take you out in the estate you know because we're in an estate car and i goes right and he said he'll pull on and he'll ask you to open the book and we'll i'm like yeah and they go when you open the book, right, 
he'll thrust you into to the back of it, drop your kegs and have his wicked way with you. <laughs> and I'm like, get out of here. I mean, I mean, you, you've got to be in the police for what you, I was in the police for four years before I was moved into the traffic. So I'm not, you know, I'm not a probationer, right? I'm get, I'm get to fuck, idiots. And anyway, the next night I comes in, we're at the briefing and it's like the old Hill Street Blue things, you know, the inspector stand, or the sergeant usually stands up there and gives you a briefing, but the inspector's there beside him. And the um, inspector goes, John, you're coming out with me tonight. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I said, okay. So he's good. here, there's the car. Go and bring it out the garage. And I looks at the keys and it says state. And I'm like, <laughs> no, no, that's, that can't be right. So anyway, pulls the car out of the garage, sitting there, and he jumps in the driver's seat. And they said, whatever you do, don't let him drive. And I'm like, oh, fuck. That's right. So anyway, he's in the driver's seat. So um, I jumps in the passenger seat and he's going, right, okay, let's go. I think we'll go up the to town to Blythewood Square and see what the hookers are doing. And I'm like, what the fuck? That's not even... We we were traffic south. So everything south of the Clyde was our remit. Blythewood Square's in the city centre, north of the Clyde. And I'm like, that's not even in our area. <laughs> so anyway, we start driving towards it and then he pulls in and stops in the side street. And I goes, I'm looking at him and I goes, and he's going, John, someone's left the tailgate light on. Could you go back and turn it off? <laughs> you know, the courtesy light at the back. And I'm like, ah, no, it's coming true. <laughs> <laughs> but luckily that's as far as it went. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, freaking nuts. But anyway, yeah. That's so, random. It was random, but I like <laughs> I like to inject these little random stories. <laughs> so anyway, he used to drive around the hookers and go, look at that dirty, 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 dirty woman there. That's a disgrace. She's a dirty, dirty woman. <laughs> and you're like, what the freaking hell? I mean, that's nothing to do with us. We're traffic. We're we'll traffic. We not supposed to even look at these people. He's probably going up there when he's off duty. In a trench coat or something, oh, and pick, picking think so. them up because that's, that's guy, just yeah. This uh, guy, the, the inspectors had a room. You know, there was a room that was the inspectors' rooms. So you had four shifts, so four inspectors shared the room. Each one had their own desk, right? But there would only ever be two inspectors on at one time. You know, when they were changing shifts. So anyway, he used to cook chips in a deep fat fryer that he kept in his drawer. <laughs> Their other inspectors fucking hated them because they'd come in and there'd be this greasy smell in the room oh, from all the chips. That's disgusting. The guy was a Fruit Loop. That is absolutely disgusting. I remember a story that my dad told me once of uh, so he was a, a hotel manager in Zambia and he once had to chuck a guest out because basically they were found cooking a steak <sighs> on this old, you know, those old 70s heaters so it's like a grill with a thing yeah. yeah he was cooking a steak on one of those and basically nearly set fire to his room yeah um and yeah that to be escorted we, out we went <laughs> into a house we went into a house one night that was having a disturbance and first of all as we opened the front door i said to the guy next to me i goes watch out for the dot and he, just as i said dog he stood in it dog shit right inside <laughs> the house right Oh. Yeah, yeah. No carpets, just plain floorboards. So we walk in, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going, what the hell is that smell? And it wasn't dog shit, right? So I goes into the kitchen, and they are on the electric ring, okay, which was bunged up to full because the ring was glow glowing. On the electric ring was a chicken. No pot. The chicken was sitting on the electric ring. This was Irvin. This is where Nicholas Sturgeon comes from. <laughs> yeah, Irvin. <laughs> Fucking tinkles, that's what they were. Oh my God, what the hell? Okay, so essentially what we're saying is that we can't save the world and they're all, yeah. fucked. They're all completely screwed, basically. Uh, <laughs> do you think Elon's got... I mean, well, let's talk about Elon saving the world because, I mean, he hasn't turned up. Bugger. But, um, but anyway... Do you, th 
do you think taking a small part of humanity to another planet is going to save the human race? I, well, I, my, my personal view is that we have to sort our problems out at home first, because until, um, this, this, uh, I, I, I am a big fan of sci-fi and there's a couple of 90 sci-fi shows, but one Babylon five and the other. I still Star haven't Trek. seen that. It's but it's Battlestar Galactica is the best. The, I mean, the, the remastered Babylon five that they've, they've recently put out in 1080p. It's really good, and okay, the, it's all a bit dated, but the, the fundamental story is absolutely brilliant. Um, and one of the things, it's a quip that I can't remember which character is towards the beginning of the series. And it's a kind of sidelong dig at Star Trek, because in the Star Trek world, mm. everything's perfect, and it's all kind of global communism. And <laughs> they're all kind of, we don't have money, and we all kind of, Work yeah, for ourselves and all of that kind of thing. I never figured that out because if you don't have anything, you know, you you get everything you want. Base or do you get everything you need? How do you get things you want but don't need? It all comes out need? of a replicator. Yeah, but how do you get something you want? Well, not everything. Only food come out of replicators. But so, what do you? How do you get? Say, I want um, say, I want a new radio. How did I go and get, well, I mean, a radio, I mean, what the fuck? Where did that come from? Hello, 1980. They want John back. <laughs> well, I... Right, say I want a new phone. How do I get a new phone? Because everybody's, nobody's got money and everybody gets well, what they need. Well, but I want is, a new phone. This is something about Star Trek that has, I've never, nobody, I've never found an answer to, is that in the, the series Deep Space Nine, which was actually a competitor to Babylon 5, um, uh -huh. and basically it's, it's another show about a space, a space station, but the mm -hmm. commander of the space station, his Cisco. Dad, yeah, Cisco, his dad runs a restaurant in New Orleans. And the question mm -hmm. that I've never figured out is how the hell do they pay for the restaurant? Where yes. does the restaurant get yes. produce from? How? And, and if they don't pay. How that and because it, if it's supposed to be a really good restaurant and nobody has to pay, then how how do you actually stop everybody well, showing up every single night? That's even better question than that, right? But hang on, let me just before I forget right, that train okay. of thought. But someone in Babylon, because Babylon Five was a more realistic human universe where people were basically still assholes. Mm -hmm. Um, and one people of the are things, assholes. yeah, and one of the things that the character says in that is it takes a lot longer than a couple of hundred years to to breed a better human. Um, and that's a sidelong dig at Star Trek because fundamentally humans are imperfect. But that was that was just that that little point that I was trying to make. Okay. Uh, but Babylon right, Five, right, honestly, right. it's worth it's yeah, worth watching. Right, I, I, I'll maybe give it a go. Um, I tell you what, let, remind me about Star Trek. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. But what aspect? In this, well, the just just about it continuing. But anyway, um. So, the perfect Star Trek universe. What gets you out of bed in the morning? Uh, well, this is the question. I mean, the, the 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 classic stock Star Trek response would be that humans work to better themselves. So, you what what gets you out of bed in the morning is you you're able to do anything because the planet has pretty much unlimited uh -huh. free energy. Yeah. Um. Anything that you need, if you want to be an artist, you can go to a replicator and get it to pop out some paintbrushes for you or if you want to make music or i i mean there's people still growing wine because captain picard's family mm -hmm. has a has a vineyard yeah but also one interesting thing is that not quite not everybody still has that whole star trek philosophy because if you look at picard for example um his brother is a a grumpy old uh, yeah vineyard yeah, owner in uh Typical yeah. Frenchman. Yeah, typical Frenchman. Yeah. But then that still begs the whole question of how do they get along with that money? Exactly. Because I think it's all bullshit, mate. I think it's bullshit. Well, it's... I think I think what they've done is they've, they've looked at how people exist on, like, say you're on an aircraft carrier like um, the Enterprise, well, the Enterprise or, or the Dwight D. Eisenhower or whatever it is. So you're on a big aircraft carrier and everything's provided for you and you do your job and all that. But what they forget is... 
you still get money. You just can't spend it because you're stuck on the ship. So you don't need money on the ship. Oh, right? no, you do. The, well, the yeah, aircraft yeah, is... oh, yeah, well, okay, okay. Right, you're splitting hairs now. You don't need a lot of money. Everything's provided. You've got your clothes, you've got your laundry, you've got your food. You don't need to spend anything unless you want a bit of chocolate, right? Or I don't know if they have hookers on aircraft carriers. <laughs> Uh, the Americans wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> probably not. Um, I I think you might be surprised these days. <laughs> well, I mean, speaking of enterprise, did you see the footage that <sighs> has been floating around online of uh, aerial shots of an aircraft carrier in Saudi Arabia with what looks like a sort of very big hole in the front? No, I did not. Yeah, no. I've um, if you talk to the Houthis. Uh, well, that's that. Yeah, I mean, there's no one else that's really got the balls to shoot at an American aircraft carrier at this point. I'm. I'm oh, have you seen what su- Russia's done? You seen what Russia said? No. You, uh, let me just see if I can find. Talk yeah, see if you can find that. Minute. See if you can find that. Have and you I'll seen see. what? Have you seen what Putin said? Right. So Putin has said that he is, there is the possibility of sharing Russian weapons <laughs> with com- with countries or regions that are enemies of America. Well, yeah. I mean, that. but the thing is that that's exactly what the Americans are doing in Ukraine. And they're, oh, they're, yeah, they're I know, supplying, I know. And it's it's retaliatory. Yeah, of course it's it not. is. He, of didn't course just, it is. he didn't just pull this out of his arse. Yeah, but this is, this is a biggie. Putin. But this is a biggie because nobody nobody normally stands up to America. This is, this is the end of the... Economy, that is. Well, um, American hegemony has already hegemony, ended. Economy, whatever. Yeah. Um, well, yes, it has, but it, it, it just, they don't realise yet, mate. They don't realise. It's no, and and the, the world doesn't realise because. Right, have you actually, got this picture? Well, uh, no, I'm still. It's not a picture. It's a video. I'm still trying to. Ray says he's seen it. Uh, what still, is that a video? It, yeah. Well, it's yeah because it looks like it's. You can share aerial it. footage. See if you go to um, see the buttons that say if share video. If, if someone has it, send it to me on Twitter, um, and I can or stick it in chat or something. I'm just scrolling through my profile. Well, you don't just send it, and you, you can watch it here. Share video. See that button there that says share video, the last one in the center block. You can do that. Yeah, no, I'm just trying to find the bloody thing. I thought mm. I shared it earlier. Oh, oh, I hate that. Oh yeah, there we go. Hang on, I found it. Uh, Right, let me just share my screen. Okay. This is going to sound a little bit crazy, yeah, but I'll I think the, the free speech debate Ignore. is a complete distraction, right? Now. Bye, bye, Jack. Bye, Jack Horsey Face. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Jack, can you see me? You are sharing screen. Add to scene. Here we go. Hold on, hold on. I'm going to make this bigger, mate. It's very small, right? Wait Let's a mute it. Yeah, mutant. That's fine. Right. Okay. That's fake. Well, that's fake. Is, let's speed. Let's slow it down. Yeah, that's fake. It just the scheme's fake to me. See if you can pause it. Yeah. Yeah. That's fake. That's passion. Fake. Yeah, it does look. That looks CGI. Yeah, CGI. That's crap. Yeah, or it looks bend. like a like a bug splat on the. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that. Maybe it's just maybe it's just the Hooties have found have, have figured out how to do. Um... Oh, hang on. <laughs> Can I the, stop sharing my screen. I've done that. I've, it's fine. Um, I, the oh. Hoot, the, it's all right. Nobody can see it now. You're you're just on screen with just all you. Right, cool. So don't worry about it. So the Houthis are um the Houthis are the Houthis are finding out how to do uh what would you say, um Palestinian level propaganda. Well, the, yes, in that case, maybe it's maybe it's them, maybe it's just some some person editing video <laughs> in order to try and I mean it's perfectly possible that someone edited some aerial footage of aircraft carriers and made yeah. it look like a hole and then put it out just to get um likes and yeah, and, click farming. All of that nonsense, but I mean, the simple fact is that the Houthi, the Houthis are having an effect. They haven't. Oh yeah. Put a, they haven't put a hole in an aircraft carrier yet, but they've they've scared plenty of ships off, and well, they've that, certainly done damage to some of them. See, this is the point. This is the point that I was making. 
you know, there's no point in the US and the UK having bombing missions against the Houthis because by the time you get there, they've gone. They live in tents. You know, they're, they're, they don't have big Navy bases and Army bases and military airfields and things. They, they come along, they set up their drones, up they go, boom, job done, pack up, move on, right? So what are you going to do? All you're doing when you're bombing the Houthis is making glass in the desert. That's all not, you're doing. Not just that, but the other thing that I've seen um, videos of is that the Houthis are really good at um, the, what, what we did um, during World War Two before D Day, mm -hmm. yeah. um, with the, with the fake armies, yeah. and yeah. they they literally have like blow up um, things that look like missile batteries and stuff, and they just stick them out in the desert, mm -hmm. and then the, the, then the, some uh, some US or UK warplane or essentially spunk a large amount of our tax money firing yeah. a bloody missile at a at a, a blow up mock yeah. missile battery. So, so gun, right, so Gunky Fadgets here says, I have a theory the war is to save the economy. Well, yeah, that's what they normally do with wars, right? Not Wars are normally thrown in to save economies. They're, not, they're never really put in for anything else. It's always for some kind of capitalistic or economic gain. It's um, like Michael Rivera says, all wars are banker wars. Well, of course they are, Fun yeah. Fundamentally. And if you look at this whole brouhaha against China, um, it, it's the american economy the thing that i find utterly i don't know it's morbidly hilarious is how much of a militarized economy the u.s has got with their military industrial complex and how rubbish it is yeah oh, fuck I, I, well, I mean yes because because it's, this it's, time they are fighting a peer group army it, that's the problem they've never fought a peer any time they've fought anyone, well, they've they've been close to fighting a peer in Korea because they nearly got China involved, right? Um, so when they did the Korean War, they weren't far away from fighting a peer. And how did the Korean War turn out? Nobody won, right? How did Vietnam turn out? They were fighting fucking rice paddies, rice paddy farmers. And how did the Vietnam War, War turn out? They lost convincingly. Having said that, no shame. The French fucked up in Vietnam as well. You know, they lost convincingly. Um, they didn't fight a peer group in Afghanistan. They were fighting, you know, ragheads and cheap herders. And how did they get on in Afghanistan? They lost. The Russians did exactly the same because they underestimate asymmetric warfare, right? Mm. And this is the problem. So they've been they've been fighting non-peer groups and thinking, yeah, our stuff kicks a shit out of them. I mean, look, look at the amount of bombs they dropped in Vietnam. I mean, I'm surprised the country's still above sea level. Well, Vietnam's actually a good example of, of what we're talking about because on the one hand, you had GIs using their M16 rifles uh -huh. that were absolute rubbish. Yeah. Um, and the Viet Cong using their AK-47 AK that you can literally, you could drag it through mud and the, uh -huh. the thing will still fire. Yeah, you, you could use it to fucking knock your fence posts in and then you could go and <laughs> kill a few deer with it, yeah? Absolutely, and, I mean, and this is keep it simple, keep it effective. Precisely, and this is something that the Russians have had to learn because you you can't the the West is really good at forgetting history. It's like everything in mm -hmm. Gaza happened started on October the seventh, which is nonsense. Everything in no. Ukraine happened when on the Rus Russia's unprovoked invasion, which was not unprovoked at all. Yeah, and that that's a whole load of history that people aren't told. That's, that's but, current. That's current conflict in Ukraine started in twenty fourteen. Oh no, it started in well, yeah, but the, 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 cur mid, the current the conflict 90s. really started in twenty fourteen yeah. when America made the decision. Well, they overthrew an, an, an elected democratic government. Like yes, they, they did. Do. Yeah, um, and I mean the the thing with Russia goes back to the nineties because. NATO, they were promised that NATO wouldn't move eastwards. Um, well, and actually, they did uh, nothing but. Here's a question I'd like to ask you and the, um, the, the room about NATO. What is NATO's function? Its original function was a counter to the Warsaw Pact. It's, that, a, defensive whole... organ it's a defensive organization. Now, I, I thought when, because I mean, I very clearly remember the the end of the Cold uh -huh. War and yeah. the fall of the Soviet Union. Yeah. And yeah. I was, I mean, I was just just about to go to university. Yeah. Um, and I actually visited Eastern Europe. 
we we I mean, we went on a school trip to Dresden and Prague about six months before the wall came down. Yep. Um, and I've, I've NATO has no reason to exist apart right. from okay, but so NATO is a defensive organization. Okay. Well, no, it's a tool of American foreign policy. No, no but NATO on paper is supposed to be a defensive organization. Yeah. Well, it was defending against the Warsaw Pact, but yes, there's no right. Warsaw, Warsaw yeah, Pact. Yeah, no, no, I know, I know, but NATO's raison d'etre is defense. Yeah. yeah. When was the last time that Europe was what was attacked from out with Europe? Um <laughs> I don't know, Mongol invasion? Or, or <laughs> Alexander Roman? the Great? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, a long, long, long freaking time ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, th th that's the whole point. NATO is one of those, it's one of those bureaucracies that has to find a reason to exist. And the thing is that NATO is not a good organization. I mean, we, we did a, the, the show about Pope and talk, we talked about Operation Gladio. Mm -hmm. um, and who knows if some of the nightmares that we're having in Europe at the moment aren't an offshoot of the whole Gladio thing and that that structure and those, those, because people don't give up power like that. And NATO oh, yeah, they don't, they is, don't. I mean, it, it's now it's, it's, it's the warmongers. I mean, well, with, it's crazy. Yeah. But I mean, you, you put yourself, say, say you're a high ranking military officer in the UK. And you see, you see your service has been eroded on a daily basis by budget cuts and lack of manpower and n no recruitment and improper training. You're getting to the point you can't even feed your soldiers that you've got or whatever. So what do you do? You try and make things better for them. And sometimes if you try and make things better for them, it might be that you're steering people towards a war. Because well, then you're going to get a shitload more money and equipment and the backing of the government and the backing of the people, you know? Well, the, that... the, the, the problem with soldiers is that if all you've got is a hammer, then every problem gets hit, basically. I well, mean, yeah, it, that's, it, that's, well, that's like a surgeon. Sure. But it, yeah. it, oh, this is why the Romans were effective, because the Romans put their soldiers to work building roads and actually doing things but see the romans you, you, but the romans were really super effective because when they conquered the place they didn't conquer it they assimilated it the romans were the fucking borg sure but if and, and they just went awry at the end mm -hmm. <laughs> but the thing is that if you deal with your if you deal with your neighbors honestly and you have skilled um diplomats we don't seem to have any diplomats at all in the, in the west anymore at least we do but nobody's nobody's using them or listening to them um there's no talking it's like even during the cuban missile crisis there was back channel communication between kennedy yeah. and khrushchev yeah the world yeah. um and it was after the cuban missile crisis that they established uh, the emergency phone line and that emergency phone line doesn't exist anymore and the americans are not talking to the russians and that's why one of the reasons it's so bloody dangerous um and there's there's a even even back in the 60s i mean those create those generals and the american military policy of we, we're going to emerge on top even if we have to nuke the whole world and there's only 30 percent of america survives but it's still the biggest mm -hmm. surviving population um there are crazy people who think that way and there are oh yeah there are yeah. military plans to that effect we've got yeah. something in the chat yeah, I, I, I like this question. If an alien species were looking down on Earth now, they would be scared to approach us. We are a threat to ourselves when really we should be a, be in peace. Fix the environmental impacts. Get off this rock space, but whatever, right? Okay. And I know what you're saying, but here's the thing, right? So, you know the Fermi paradox in that if there were any aliens out there, then we should probably, they should probably have... Have you ever considered the fact that, you know, how... Stephen Hawking said you don't want to attract aliens because they're aggressive. The, anybody who's got the capability of doing these kind of things will be super aggressive and probably wipe you out, right? Have you ever considered that's us? Uh, that could be us. And I, people are going, 
don't go fucking near that blue planet that's the third rock from the sun because they will fuck you up. Um, Have yeah. you considered that's the case? Yeah, I, I mean, if, if they're sufficiently advanced to be able to get from their planet to ours... Yeah, but look at us, we're insidious little bastards. We just yep. fucking keep going and we don't, we don't know when to say quit. Yeah, but that's one of the reasons we've got no bloody reason leaving leaving our planetary system. Yeah, but and that's maybe why nobody comes here. Or they come and keep tabs on us, going, "Oh, it's okay. They don't have warp drive yet. We're all right." You know. Well, you know, you know how there's there's various episodes in Star Trek where after the Enterprise is yes. through some right, just before they finish off, the captain will say, "Right, leave a boy there to warn yeah. everybody to a stay boy. away." <laughs> so they probably, if if you look at the solar system, they probably just have a ring of these buoys around the outside of the solar system that yeah. is just like stay away from these people they are completely <laughs> mental you, you don't probably, you probably find that the guy that was piloting onoma onoma or whatever it was called right what lost the lottery right he drew the short straw and said right okay you take a run through <laughs> <laughs> and see if the, and see if they come for you. And he's going, okay, I'm going to go as fast as I can. Whoosh! <laughs> because remember that thing accelerated after it passed the sun. Yeah, how'd that work? I don't know. I mean, because it is... wasn't on a parabolic tra trajectory, so it shouldn't. It didn't get a gravity slingshot. So how the hell did it accelerate when the sun should have been pulling it back? Well. That's a good question. It's a very good question. And it's one of those questions that we like to speculate about. Yeah. And there's certain, it's like we were talking about last week about physics. There's certain, that's why things like that are so interesting because it shouldn't be. Yeah, when it you shouldn't actually, be. When you think of the sun, I mean, if you look at what the sun's gravity does to Mercury. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you think of how much closer, whatever that was that we saw, was to the sun than Mercury, how mm -hmm. the hell did that even happen? Unless yeah, it was something, some sort of ejector or something from the sun, perhaps, that maybe didn't come into view until it was a certain distance away from the sun or something. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. maybe it had a set of solar sails that it deployed. Sure. You know, that, I don't know. I mean that's the problem. We don't we don't look at these things with enough resolution to determine what they really are. No, and but we, I mean, don't, we don't have a quick enough response to go and intercept them. That's the problem. Sure, and it's I mean it's difficult enough to see anything that's near the sun or get anywhere yeah, close. Yeah. I mean if you think, but even if if we're going to speculate that that's some sort of alien craft, then the the shielding that that thing must have. Yeah, to protect itself from what the sun is spewing out. I mm. mean, that that's is that even possible in physics? Well, could, uh, you, uh, could you create an energy shield that would do that? I don't know. I mean, you, technically, I don't know. Could you could you imbue some kind of electromagnetic field that would repel cosmic rays? Sure. Well, I, possibly, I, I, maybe. I mean, the, the only way that I could see that being remotely possible is if you have some kind of device that gives you un, an unlimited amount of energy. Because, <sighs> yeah, well, I mean, you couldn't create a, a ship that had a physical shield like lead or some other. No, metal I, I, or I, I'm thinking something. I'm thinking some kind of electromagnetic thing or something like that, you know. Mm. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I had a. a delved into zero point briefly a few weeks ago and i did find out that i did a little bit more quantum research and what about scalar physics have you looked well, at that one i haven't gone into that in great depth but what i did find out about zero point energy is yeah you do have zero point energy but the problem is right the problem with zero point energy is anything you take out has to be paid back the more you take out, the quicker it has to be paid back. So I don't think zero point energy is a viable source of energy. Because you know how you talk about the quantum foam where things pop in and out all the time. So the bigger the quantum event, the quicker it has to pop back. 
So it's got to be paid back really quickly. You can't take energy out of the quantum form and not pay it back, which is what we would want to do. So I think zero points are non-starter if that's the case. If that's the case. But, um, but that doesn't... I don't know. The thing is that we don't know what we don't know. And... Yeah, we speculate. You don't about zero even point. know what you don't know. Sure, I mean, that's a, that, no, that's a very, that's a very valid statement. Mm. It is, and I mean, Nikola Tesla claimed that there was an infinite amount of energy, and you could just tap into it at will if you had the correct sort of device. Yeah, um, but but that, that is does... he forgetting that you have to pay it back, or well, do you not have to pay? Maybe you don't have to pay it back, but I think you maybe do. Well, because you don't you. When did you ever get a free ride, Ed? Ever? Well, but surely that's... If you look at every other creature on the planet, apart from humans, they basically get a free ride. They don't have to pay for anything. It's only... It's only no, 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 no. Right. So you, maybe, you, maybe the What universe... are you talking about? Are you talking about money? Well... Animals don't get a free ride. There's always a trade-off. True. There's always I, a trade-off. But then... I don't know. Maybe the universe just doesn't work the way we think it think it works, and that maybe there is free energy. Yeah, I think. I, I mean, think, if you think um, about how we'll much, be struggling to find it. That's a problem. Well, if you think about how much energy the sun dumps out and how much electromagnetic energy there is swirling around well, in the universe, maybe I, maybe I, there isn't it. I don't know. Actually, here's another good point, and and let's just let's just cover this. So, Elon Musk is on about Dyson spears quite a lot. You know, and how you could get all yeah. the energy. Why? What do you do, right? Should we? Should we just okay? Just for the benefit of the audience, a Dyson sphere is essentially yeah. where you construct some a shell around a star, and you harness one hundred percent of that star's energy. Yeah, and then you could have a civilization that lived on the inside shell. Yeah. Of that Dyson sphere, right? And I just no, that's fine. That's fine. Just, yeah. just stop there. I'll I'll take over now. So mm. my point is, how do you dodge a solar flare? <laughs> that's the break. That's the problem. You, you need to have some way of going. Well, there's a solar flare heading for sector A sixty two twelve. How uh, you evacuate or open it or whatever? Do you can you open the shell to let the solar flare through? I don't know because you can't dodge a solar flare at all if you're in a Dyson sphere. Uh, that's yeah, that's, that's true. Tricky. Uh, that's tricky. Whoa. That's uh, true. God, that's true. Well, there's. I mean, how the hell do you build something like that in the first place? Oh, that, right, I mean, okay, but that's 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 neither here nor there. But there, if well, you do kind, start, kind of but is. if you but if you start thinking about trying to build those things, then you have to think about that's a problem. Well, and it, solar ejectors going coming off that start all the time. What the hell? How the hell are you going to cope with that? But John, if we look at the problems building a Dyson sphere. On a, on, a, on a scale of 1 to 100, <laughs> with 100 being you're done yeah. and 1 being how the hell do we start, you're still floating around on 1. There's yeah, no I know, I know. thinking about 100. I mean, okay, once you've built it, you... you but uh, I, That's not the one I wanted to show. That's the one I wanted to show. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> John, please, you do know that... <laughs> <laughs> magnetism Honestly. says John and John. Maybe maybe you use electromagnetic magnetism and tractor beams and things to capture it and steer. Maybe you've got a big hole at the end. In fact, maybe your Dyson feels like a hollow earth. Hold on. <laughs> Do we live in a Dyson sphere? <laughs> well, uh, no, because no, but you don't know because. We might be on the outside edge. Maybe we are the monkeys that escaped the blab and we're on the wrong side of the Dyson sphere. There might be a minor sun in the centre of the planet. Hollow yeah. Earth. Yeah, but that would mean that the outside of the Dyson sphere had an atmosphere. Which... Yeah, but it does. Because it's leaked out the holes. Because the holes are there to let the solar flares from the inner <laughs> sun out. 
Boom. Okay. This hey, is... <laughs> we're making new science here. <laughs> it's science. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> Oh, come on, you got him, but that's a good idea. That's a good theory. Well, yeah, okay. Well, oh, he likes it. You do like it. You like it a little bit. You do, <laughs> uh, don't you? Uh, well, it's funny. I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, what time is it? What the hell? That time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it does. Um, Christ, yeah, an hour and a half. Um, have we still got anyone watching? Yeah, apart from Oh John. yeah, we've got more people watching than where we started. <laughs> I need to get I'm I'm gonna get a restraining out order on him or something. Who? <laughs> John. Oh Johnning John. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh dear. Oh, yeah. So uh oh right, well, hold on, hold on. Janet Janet says right, so Janet, you, you you need to watch the scrying episode if you haven't seen that one. So That's Janet says one. Janet says her tablet was turned off, but it was reflecting off those flails at night. Work that one out. Watch this crying episode, there, Janet, and then be afraid. Be very afraid. Well, it's the black mirror. Yeah, the black mirror. Just don't, just never stare at your tablet for too long when it's switched off. Oh, yeah, don't do that. It's like going to the toilet at night, don't look in the bathroom mirror. Well, maybe that's what's wrong with the world, is all the demons have come out through all of the, the little black mirrors that we've got everywhere well that's hey that's maybe a possibility I, maybe. Know. <laughs> I think i mean someone said earlier why can't we just live together in peace and you know that would be the ideal right but we are by nature we are we are, we are two contradictory things we are gregarious and we're super aggressive so we are gregarious and that we need people yet we don't like people but you see that strangers that, in particular you know sure and uh, the, the thing is that the whole not liking strangers that's that's a defense that's natural yeah of course not that's... being being conscious of people that are not in your group is a survival skill particularly mm -hmm. amongst primitive humans and you can't you can't take the primitive out of the human very easily um and every single culture that i have ever i mean i you could go to zambia and you'll experience black racism everybody's racist. oh yeah the, the japanese so. i mean if you look at the number of different in in zambia the white people would be called muzungus in um japan we'd be called gaijin which means mm -hmm. barbarian and thailand you'd be called farang yeah which in means china foreigner. it's guelo i think yeah yeah so, i mean everybody's racist and yeah. and to be fair the asian um the asians are kind of more heterogeneous than anyone else when it comes to those society so mm. they they have more uh, a, a more deeply rooted suspicion of the foreigner it's like you know they, they just they just find white people strange but why is it that only white people are the ones that are supposed to be feeling guilty about it i'm not sure i'm not sure i because we're steering into difficult it, territory. I but know. Well, that, that's just, I'm just popping that one out there, but that's, it, it, that's a, kind of how it seems sometimes. It's, yeah, well, no, I think you're right. It, it does seem like that. And I think probably big because, and this isn't going to go down. I can't even, I don't even know. I can't, can stack it. I can't go down this route. I cannot go down this route, but you need to look into things like, <laughs> you need to look into things like, no, yeah, I can't even. I no, can't even, don't. I can't no, even don't. see it. No, I just no, can't see it. You, you don't. You, you don't want to have to be calling Ben up tomorrow morning and go, "Yeah, Ben, about oh, you." Yeah, that that <laughs> channel's gone, mate. Let's start again. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't. I can't go down that kind of route. But you know, there's a. I tell you what, though, right? And I'm not gonna. I, I'm gonna couch this very carefully because I watched something on YouTube yesterday, that was all about an event that involved maybe six million people right and debunked it but it was on youtube i found that strange oh ah, the world because you so you used to get that stuff on youtube but then youtube went all oh dude, you can't deny you know you can't be a denier um, and and they're still doing it with things like you know weather, right? Mm. But um, and you can't you can't 
you can't monetize a channel or you can't monetize a video that um, makes money or you can't monetize a video that talks about the war in Ukraine, you know? I, would you, why would you want to? No, but do you not think it's sensible to discuss what's occurring, right? Between well, I, this yeah, side and this side. And I'm not even talking about talking about the fighting. I'm talking about the politics of it. You, you, oh, you just the politics. No, I mean, I, I I thought you were talking about the actual war. Of, no, no. Of, of showing... Like, no, 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 like not even blowing up. No, forget that. I mean, we've had video. I've had a, I had a community strike on a video about it. Oh, I just a I community strike. I, it's just on a uh, video as to why somebody was winning. That's all a, I said. Why someone's winning? I showed no content that was you know bad content or anything like that. But we got a community strike on it. I sometimes think that this whole cancel culture exists in order to make some people who have no control over their lives feel like they have a bit of power. Mm -hmm. it, it's And it's like this mass reporting. And I was told a story the other night by a, a friend that I'm not going to go into, where uh, essentially she was it, it was causing problems with her and her daughter because of stuff that she was saying on Twitter and some third party had come in and was trying to make the daughter feel guilty for what the mother was posting on online. And it's just like, hang on a minute. When when was the last time you saw parents and kids agree? Certainly yeah, when, exactly. when the children were not not young, young, but yeah, but in, you know, late from, teens. From, yeah. yeah. Or, yeah. or sort of early twenties kind of thing. Yeah. You, yeah. But it, it's, I, I just this whole notion that we can't disagree. I mean, it's the same with the with the Farage milkshake thing, whether that was staged or not. That yeah. picture of of that silly bird chucking the milkshake over him. Yeah. I'm sorry, but if if we can't disagree in a civilized way and have a healthy debate, and through that debate come to some compromise and to some sort of agreement where we can actually live in a society where you can walk around without risking some getting the bloody McDonald's banana milkshake thrown over you. Mm -hmm. um, well, worse. I mean, yeah. It's, it's, so some yeah. of the comments that I saw, I mean, to be honest, some of the stuff that I saw on Twitter about that whole incident were absolutely horrific. I mean, there's people saying, oh, well, just do battery acid instead and oh, stuff like that. And it's yeah, just... Yeah, okay, right. All right. Let's not go down that route. No, okay. no, no I'm but... not going, going down that route. But I'm, all I'm saying is that it's absolutely despicable how some people behave and how yeah. it seems that kindness and niceness... Yeah, okay, it's all right to be... All the be kind people, You, they'll, they're kind to you if you to totally agree. To your face. Agree. Well, yeah, and if you totally agree with them 100%. Yeah. And that the minute that you disagree with them, you're suddenly the next mm -hmm. Austrian guy wanting to do horrible things to the see, world. See, that, that, <laughs> this is the thing. This is the thing that would it not be incredibly boring if everybody agreed with everyone all the time? It would be horrible. I mean, we don't agree on many things, right? Ben and I certainly don't agree on many things, right? But, you know... If you can't discuss them in a sensible manner, what's the point? And what's the point in in even engaging you know, with people if you just can't talk to them without, you know, blocking them or or uh, uh, the thing that gets me is the ones that go straight to ad hominem when you have an mm -hmm. argument, you know. And when I say an argument, I just mean I, I'm not talking about you know a, a vitriolic argument. I'm saying. You know, someone says something, you say, no, I disagree, you know. And it's like, it, it's as simple as something like a green light, a green traffic light. What does a green traffic light mean, right? And it doesn't mean you can go. What a green traffic light means is you can proceed if it's safe to do so. And that's a completely different meaning from go, mm. you know. Yeah. Because if you can, you can proceed if it's safe to do so and the way ahead is clear, right? So if someone's crossing a pedestrian crossing and the light changes to green, you can't run them over. No. No, but some people will say, 
oh, the, the light was green, so the car's not at fault. Because it didn't stop for someone crossing the road. Well, no. If, yeah. If, if, yeah, that's not right. But when you say things, like, it's amazing the amount of people that have, they have no conception of what is and what isn't the law, but then again, they will not entertain that they were even a tiny bit wrong. Absolutely. It's like basic cyclists are the worst. Oh, don't get me started. Fucking hell, I was watching. Uh, I mean, I don't know why, but Twitter has decided to show me a lot of bike wankers, right? Well, that's because you it, because the algorithm says, oh, he likes that. We'll give no, I don't that. like it, them, well, though. No, but, but the whole point is to pro these algorithms yeah, provoke outrage. Yeah, so anyway, so this guy, this professor in Scotland, says a, a great run down the mountain tonight, and he hammers down the mound, which is basically from Edinburgh Castle all the way down to the bottom. And you see him hammering down it. And he just gaily goes through a red light on video, you know? I mean, uh... what, 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 what you might do with that? I mean, he thinks he's 100% the right because he's a biker. He's a, a, well, he's not a biker, he's a cyclist and he's saving the planet. Uh, but he, red lights not, don't apply to him. They're just, uh, it's, it's the one the one that really gets me is we have this very contentious seafront bike uh, cycle lane that they put in during covid and it doesn't i mean it, it, there's no justification for it being there because there was a perfectly good cycle lane yeah. off the road the one along the the seafront yeah and it's yeah. Cool, it causes traffic carnage all the way along yep um and the worst thing for me it happened to me on sunday I was driving back from shoreham um and there is a bike wanker that is determined to be on the bloody road. Yeah. And you've everyone, it, and it's just, you, ah, oh, <laughs> you, you just, I can't, I can't actually say what I was, was thinking. No, I, I know what you mean. Thinking though. what I was thinking, but I was thinking it. And, I know. And it's just, it, it's the degree of selfishness and, mm -hmm. and lack of consideration for other people. That to me, to my mind, it's that sort of people, that sort of mentality, is the biggest problem that the world has got, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, the entitled mentality, mm. and yeah. it because it it lies at the root of so many other problems, and so much of an attitude that is is basically making society really not a very pleasant place to live in. Um, and if you're not completely politically correct and waving a rainbow flag, then you're suddenly the devil. I mean, it, it's just, mm -hmm. it, it's completely crazy. Yeah. And I mean, we're, we're bloody right wing extremists just sitting here talking about it. And, oh, and, of course we are. and, course and that are. lot are all right wing extremists just sitting here listening to us for an hour and a half, um, spouting right wing extremist stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's crazy and you can't and if you walk around, you get too too well known then you can't even like walk around without some asshole throwing a bloody milkshake over you what have we got there well Certain, I'd, oh, like, I'd like to find out more about this <laughs> does cypriot brandy no it was one oh this is many years ago now but it's called crusader and it comes it has a little tap in the bottle uh -huh. and it's like the nectar of the gods you you you, you sort of you I do can like imagine, a brandy. Oh, it's lovely. If you ever, I think I'm going to have to come back down again, Ed. Um, but no, I don't know where John <sighs> gets it, but yeah. Well, and has then he got there's, some? There's, uh, he'd had some. He's had some in the past because he's the mm. one that brings it around. But that stuff, you can you can imagine Crusader Knights stopping off in Cyprus and getting absolutely legless in, on this stuff, and then because you can just drink it, it's it's so not like any brandy that you're used to where yeah. you can just drink it. it it's it's really 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 drinkable and really dangerous and it kind of fires you up it's crazy and you imagine these crusader knights getting really shit faced on this brandy and then going off to the holy land and engaging in a, a load of crusading bit of a dust up <laughs> yes good night ray good night ray yes i mean we've gone way past our normal broadcast time but you know what we were having fun so it's great fun yeah it's great fun so um, should we should we call it a night? Well, it's yeah. I mean, it, it's an hour and three quarters. So I think 
people have I think, done really well sticking I think, with us. I've i just just chatting away, you know what you know what yeah. we're like. <laughs> I, I think I think the main takeaway that you can take from tonight is you need to like, share and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> it's Ed, bring your mic in, Ed, bring your mic in. Oh, Sorry. Go again. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's Sick. better. That's better. Why does that always have to happen just after we go on on freaking broadcast or whatever the hell we call it? Yeah, well, because you go and change things at the last minute, I don't ain't you? change anything! <laughs> Wanker! Ah, ah, of some God. repute! Of some repute! Ah. Anyway. Fucking northern monkeys. <laughs> oh, don't call me a northerner. <laughs> I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not northern. Well, you're pretty fucking north. <laughs> no, I may be north, but I'm not northern. You can't call a Scotsman a northerner. The people in the people in um, Newcastle and places like that will take offence to stuff like that. No, everything north of London is basically Mordor. Oh, everything it? north so, of London, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there be wildlings. Here be wildlings. Oh, it's the oh, freaking White Walkers we've got to worry about. Yeah, oh, come to that. Well, yeah, it's been it's been snowing in the Cairn Gorms for some of the last ten days. Freaking ridiculous! Oh, well, I mean, pe people go on about it, but to be fair, you know, snow in June's not unknown. No, no, it's not. It's not unknown. But at the same time, we've got the Met Office gaslighting us that everything is so warm that it's like the warmest june i'll tell you what they're gonna they're gonna say oh it's been the warmest june on record but only when we take the nighttime temperatures into account yeah yeah it's did like, you oh, see did you see the heck. explanation it, you didn't realize it was warm because you were sleeping and two two um although it was cool during the day because the clouds were keeping the sun at bay right they wouldn't let the heat out at night so it stayed but it wasn't warm during the day. I can understand that if it had been warm during the day, but it's like 10 degrees here. The, the, the system, that they're, they're, they're now so out of whack with reality that the only thing that they've got any talent at anymore is gaslighting. The, the, the government does it, the Met Office mm. does it, the media does it. They're, they're basically, you if you don't... We do it. Yeah. I mean, it, when I say we, I don't mean you and I. I mean... People, well, some of the people we're going to talk about tonight are kind of gaslighting us because it's as if they're trying to purport that these things are real. And, and we'll, we'll go into the MH370 because it, it, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of an interesting one anyway, you know, because, I mean, this, this plane took off on a regular scheduled flight to China from Malaysia. And um, it was only what? It only just crossed over. Was it Malaysia it took off from or... But anyway, it was a Malaysia airplane, and it had only crossed over the island, and it kind of just disappeared off the radar, didn't it? Or it went awry, and then well, it disappeared it, off the radar. Yeah, but the thing with planes when they disappear off radar is that normally you see them going down, and you see the, you see the altitude going down and down and down, and then um, civilian radars can only... Um, I think it's... I'm not sure exactly what it is, but they've got a, a height limit above the ground that they can't see past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, but with MH370, it just seems to vanish. Yeah, it, yeah, and of it, course, if, they must have turned the transponder off as well. Yeah, but I didn't think that was possible. I thought that because the transponder is generally mm. in the tail of the aircraft, and it's not designed to be able to be turned off, but then there are also rumours around 9-11 around that back in the 70s, there was an anti-hijacking system that was developed. Oh, remote which, control. Yeah, which essentially used the, it used the, the 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 black box to basically uh, allow um, an a, an external party to take control of the aircraft. Um, yeah, the idea being to to be able to land it. But I mean, these days planes can land themselves. Just to, to, I mean, they can quite quite often the because uh, the, they pilots every so often they have to do one of the automated landings. Mm -hmm. And I remember yeah. being on a on a flight. And we we touched down at Gatwick, and the and it was just a it was, was a perfect it a landing. landing. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, the, the the state of the landing depends on the weather. I mean, if you've got yeah, if you've got a whole so. shit ton of wind, then it doesn't matter matter whether you have got a pilot or a computer flying the plane; it's going to get bumped around. But the pilot comes on after landing and said, "Oh, welcome to Gatwick Airport. I just like to, just like to let you know that the, the, the computer the plane landed itself this time. We have to do this every few months to." 
to, for whatever reason. And yeah, uh, yeah so <laughs> I thought I'd tell you afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, before we do that, a uh, little bit of housekeeping. We'll say hello to the people in the chat. And wow, we have a stack of people have come over from Ben's alternative stream where he's covering the election. He must be a very lonely boy. I'm, oh, I'm, I've, uh, this isn't going to go well tomorrow, is it? In the no. meeting, he's going to be throwing these toys left, right, and centre straight out the pram. So it's good evening, Shalini, Bex, Julie, Adam, Espresso Mechanic, Beats and Tapes, uh, Johnny and John, Militant Mushroom. Who else we got? Brit mate. Bloody hell, we've got everybody. We've got everybody here. Ray. Hi, Ray. How you doing? Uh, so why why did you uh, and spencer seems, don't tell him says spencer <laughs> seems, seems a little bit daft to do two shows at the same time on the same night spence idea i would say i i said we'd just leave it but or or we'd do it for half an hour and then turn into this but or or you and i would start it and then we'd just turn into mh370 but he said no no i'll do it i'll do it so he was he obviously wanted to do it um it, well we did say we would cover the election debate so he's right on that point because we we've started it so we'll finish um to be fair though they're pretty pretty damn poor they're, they're not real fun at all the state i mean the state of politics is just they've resorted to just making shit up and spouting it online and i mean the the, the labor manifesto mm -hmm. <laughs> just looks like a disaster waiting to happen um, yeah, let's not get into politics. No, no, here. there's no, no. Yeah, ben, um, Ben's doing politics. If you want politics, go and watch. Did us say hello to Bex and Yazzie. So there we go. Right, okay, let's crack on. Let's crack on with MHC seventy. And I'm going to play. I'm going to play a, a short. I have some short videos for us tonight. Yes. Um. So we'll play. Um. We'll play these videos. And from anyone that's listening from YouTube, this is called fair use. Um. These, this is, these are from other YouTube channels. We're not trying to steal their content or purport it as our own. What we want to do is we want to display it and then comment on it, which I think is fair use. Commentary is covered. And we're trying to educate people as to you know, maybe why sometimes they need to be a little more critical than some or less than others. But uh, I think it's fair use. I, we're just exploring different topics as well. Of course we are. Of course we are. We're having fun. And Plus we just want to be allowed to do it because... Legally, we are. Well, yeah, but YouTube is, gets all judged ready. It's like, I am the law. I am the law. Although they do say that they have nothing to do with it, but it's their algorithm that picks up things on oh, the right. stream. So it's AI. Yeah, this is the problem we've got with all this machine learning and AI is that companies will be like, oh, nothing to do with me. Computer says no. Yeah, computer says no. <laughs> it's, just... it's like I went to, I went to, I was in Lidl the other day and there was nobody on the tills and I'm like, I'm going to have to use this bloody machine. And I went up to the machine and pushed a button and it said, scan an item. So I scanned an item and put my bag down and it goes, take that off the scale. And I'm going for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, what, what, I mean, it's just the whole thing's a joke. And I'm like, if I wanted to be employed here, I would have put in an application, not come and do my shopping. Uh, but that's, yeah, it's a state of the world, unfortunately. Yeah, I bet they love me. I told Aldi I'll never be back because their system's even worse. I can't, I, I'm not a fan of Aldi, I have to say. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, but I don't have a lot. Of, well, I suppose I've got Morrison's, but it's a further walk. Anyway, right, let's crack on with the um, first video. Here we go. How could a plane larger than this 767 crash into the sea and leave no trace? Even as these grainy satellite images released today by the Chinese government show what could be debris, there is still no proof. An open sea mystery that has seasoned aviators puzzled. David Susi has been investigating plane accidents for 25 years. There's something very unique going on here that I haven't experienced in my investigation. Well, uh, I think... I mean, you know that there's there's been a lot of speculation about what happened to this plane, and Johnny and John's right into it straight away. Um, but I, I'm, I, 
I think I've I've got some. I mean, there's some stuff that we've been privy to, John, that maybe does away with your theory about it being shut down. Um, we're not talking about the one over. We're not talking about the one over Ukraine. We're talking about the one that disappeared between Malaysia and China. Um, but but, another interesting thing about that <laughs> is that apparently there was some patent holders that were on that plane. Yes, there um, was. And the patent was co-owned by Jacob Rothschild. And he wasn't on the plane. And, and he he's the only plane. survivor. <laughs> and he's the only survivor. Um, so that does beg the question is that if who else may well have been on that plane? Um, I've mm -hmm. never thought I it I never thought it looked like it had been shot down because you no, would see no. you would see radar tracks of another aircraft or you would see a radar track of some sort of missile whether yeah. it was fired from the ground. I mean, it's also that particular part of the world is not known for shooting down aircraft. Well, apart from, uh, remember the one that, the, the Korean Airlines flight that overflew part of Russia and the Russians shot it to, it, was it the Russians or the North Koreans? Uh, no, I think it was the Russians. The Russians, yeah, the Russians shot down a South Korean airliner. It was loss of all hands. Yeah, which but that was pretty was, poor. Yeah, but we're talking about a totally different part of the world. We're not talking mm. about... I need to rephrase that. Sorry, or... sorry. I need to rephrase that. It was not the Russians that shot them down. It right. was the Soviet Union. Oh, right. Got it. Yeah. My, <laughs> okay. my apologies. Um, but, I mean, there's also that strange video with the orbs, which I'm, I'm sure you've got for people to watch. But, I mean, the, the simple uh, fact is got that, that, got we, that. Have, we, we have a totally missing airliner now there was a, a a plane crash in the atlantic um i can't really uh, it was probably a few years ago now from it was flying from brazil to oh the Europe. the pito tube the uh, overspeed yeah. the overspeed yeah. the one that broke yeah. up yeah um and the the black box ended up in thousands of meters of water and they still bloody found it they did they did um and these things the black box is designed not to get blown up specifically because it's there to, to figure out what the hell happened if the plane does go down mm -hmm. the fact that so the fact that they've never recovered the black box from mh370 is immediately suspicious um and more to the point the fact that it just disappears it doesn't it doesn't lose altitude the flight mm -hmm. goes a bit wonky there's nothing it, it doesn't there's no other radar tracks no missiles or another aircraft or anything like that and yeah. absolutely no debris whatsoever well that's is that true um because i mean what was that part of a wing that was washed up near diego garcia and diego garcia itself features somewhat in the whole scenario here because that's not far away and that's a big Amer american military base isn't it it's also super secret and it's, yes. If you were yes. going, if you, if you were going to, if you if you were going to divert the plane off its track somehow and do so in such a way that it wasn't visible on radar, however, however they've managed to do that, mm -hmm. um, Diego Garcia, or I mean, it's actually probably should be called the Chagos Islands. Yes. Um, yes, it should. And just a shout out to all the poor Chagos Islanders who got turfed out of their homes and sent to Mauritius so that the British government could give the that that island chain to the Americans because the way mm -hmm. those people were treated was absolutely diabolical to this day. Well, that that's par for the course for that neck of the woods, isn't it? I mean, look at the yeah. Bikini Islanders. The um, mm. what, what's the other bunch that are off Japan? There's a whole island off Japan that's been taken over by Americans and they've really doesn't franchise the people that okay, were no there oh, just, i mean the whole americans just go in and wipe out the indigenous population in order to take over uh it seems to be what they're good at um but anyway so that human rights aside the fact is that there is no nothing on diego garcia apart from this America, this gigantic i mean the, the whole thing is basically just like a solid aircraft carrier um mm -hmm. And so if you're going to hide a plane, that'd be the perfect place to do it. You could put it in a hangar, you could hide it from satellites, you could strip it down, you could chuck it in the sea, you could repaint it, do whatever with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and nobody would be any wiser. I mean, I've been, I've been in an island in the middle of the Indian Ocean. I think it, it, it wasn't Guam, 
because you've heard of Guam because that's Guam, the American Guam is, one. Guam is the Pacific. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, I've been on one called GAN. Okay. Right? And basically all it was was an RAF airstrip because mm. we landed there on route to Hong Kong and refueled. So it was just an RAF base and that's all there was. You, know, In fact, we actually had a windscreen change as well, so we are there for an extra hour. Why would the bloody plane need a windscreen change? Because it had a bird streak when we landed. Oh, right. And it took out the windscreen, yeah. Got it, yeah. But, the but that's not that's not bad if you think about it. You know, jet a, a jet full of passengers lands in Gyan, um, hits a bird on the way down, breaks a windscreen, and has it changed and is flying again within two hours. That's, yeah, that's impressive. Yeah, I, I don't think that would happen these days. Uh, no, but I guess the... Air, air, aircraft windscreens probably have to. I guess they, they you can snap them in and out just because of. Oh no idea, no I idea. Mean, I, I I don't know how how common it is for birds to hit aircraft, but it wouldn't just be birds. You get bit, bits of gravel or whatever. Yeah, well we've done that. We did that last week, didn't we? We had a few airstrikes on the show, or was it the week before? That was the week before when we revisited nine eleven. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So the simple fact that we've got so far in this little mystery of ours for this evening is that we've got an aircraft, MH370, mm -hmm. that had um, at least one group of important people that we know about. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Yeah. the plane disappeared and there was, there was a bit of wreckage found, but nothing that was actually positively identifiable as having come from MH370. Yeah. Um, and and we've, we've got to say it was a even though it was a Boeing, it was fairly reliable because it was a triple seven. There's not been a lot of accidents with Boeing triple sevens. You know, they're, they're a good aircraft and they don't have a bad safety record. No. So that's where we're at. Now, what the hell happened to this plane? And obviously we're not, the, the objective tonight is not to solve this mystery. We're not going to solve it. Oh, we won't. We won't solve it. I think. I think there's there's good indications though, and in fact, just uh, that's what I was going to tell you before the show started. That just um about three days ago, some Texas company, Infinity uh, Affinity or something, are offering a a deal to the the Malaysian government. Um, you know. Uh, a free search, no fee, unless they find the plane. Because they've, they've, they reckon they know where the plane is and they reckon they can find it. They said it's in very, very deep water, but they reckon they can find it. Um, and they've, they've offered this deal to the Malaysian government. If we can't recover it, you don't need to pay. But if we recover it, you, you pay. And, and the, um, the people, the, you know, the, the relatives of the people that were lost on that plane, um, are all, all for it basically because they'd like some closure and you can understand that absolutely because i mean nobody likes to think that they're sitting in a a hangar in diego garcia <laughs> well no I mean, this is this is one of the this is one of the the, the things which you, you think that okay so if they make this plane disappear what what happened to the passengers i mean they just gas them or i mean did, yeah. did, did all these people die in a horrible plane crash and we just haven't found it yet because it's in five thousand meters of water which is not the easiest place in the world to try and search for anything yeah. um but at the same time black boxes they the, the designers of aircraft black boxes take into account the fact that some of the, the world's oceans are very deep planes mm -hmm. fly over them and the black box not only has to be able to withstand the pressure at depth, it also has to be able to broadcast some sort of signal that, that can still be detectable by yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, so what? just to continue your story, did the Malaysian government take them up on this offer or not? I think we're waiting. On, uh, this was only like three days ago. So ah, right. I think we're waiting on a response. You know, um, I, I think it would be foolish not to, but um, it would be quite good. It'd be quite good if they be, did. Be, I mean, given that there's no cost to them unless they find the plane. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if they find the plane, then there's all sorts of insurance and stuff that will probably kick in. Yeah. Anyway, um, and just to give families some closure. Oh well, yeah. And, and to yeah. to 
to kind of solve a, a mystery that everybody's wondered about since it happened. Um, so let's um, let's jump on to um, video number two. Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 disappeared in 2014. Shortly after, two videos hit the internet. Right, so these two videos hit the internet. Um, now, I think the plane disappeared around about March, and these videos were, they first appeared in about May 2014, which is a good couple of months later. Um, now, th there's no trace. There is no trace of the original video anymore anywhere. So all you've got is copies of the videos on YouTube channels. And one of the ones that's come up recently is this guy, Ashton Forbes, who's been making quite a big deal about it and saying that, you know, I think he's been presenting some kind of math to try and indicate that this is a genuine, you know, I mean, I mean, you see that picture there. This is from one of the videos, which is a, allegedly a thermal image. But he's trying to indicate that, um, his math indicates that this is genuine and that um, the thing was transported by government, right, by some government, okay, instantaneously through space, through and effectively also, a wormhole. And right? also, just um, to add to that, he also claims to have created some sort of over-unity energy device. Um, mm. and that he's claiming that it's some sort of gravitational wave so that there's some some super secret ability that the government has to manipulate gravity, space, don't know. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I haven't done any research into that, but I'm not a great, I'm not a great believer in anti-gravity. And in fact, I'm not a great believer in gravity as such. It's all yeah, what, it's all know, electromagnetic, isn't it? But what what if this what if the terminology anti gravity is just uh it's just words being used to describe something that is operating on a level that modern kind of mm. science doesn't have any kind yeah. of understanding of. Okay, so the um I'm gonna play the videos now and these, um, there's no audio on them because I didn't think it was worth putting spooky music on it because they had their own spooky music on it and really, you know, you don't need spooky music. It's just a video of a plane taken from where? I'm not sure. So that's, um, this is one of the planes and... <sighs> Well, this supposedly this is this is supposed to be MH three seventy. Yeah, it's supposed to be. Well, 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 it's making a kind of wild maneuver. Oh, and there's one of the orbs coming in, right? See the orb now. So there's, there's the one. second one, and there's the third. So we've now got the three orbs circling, it, and then it's gonna it's gonna line up, and then it's gonna go poof, isn't it? It's gonna uh, go. Know. It's gonna watch. It's gonna go poof. Yeah. goes by in the cloud yeah and then it goes then it goes <laughs> poof there you go went poof yeah so, so i mean that that video raises more questions than it answers but it mm -hmm. does track with the other video which is i think infrared thermal thermal sorry this one yeah. Yeah, okay. Poof. So it went poof. And I mean supposedly that video, certainly the thermal one, mm -hmm. still hasn't been debunked. Yeah, it has. Has it? Uh, <laughs> I missed that. It's gonna be debunked tonight again. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Well, there's a couple of issues with it as a thermal image of an aircraft, and they made a not bad attempt at showing the door and the some of the windows at least, right? Um, although I would have expected a bigger jet plume coming back from the engines um, if the in, if the planes, especially given the fact that during what we are seeing, the um, 
the, the plane it appears to be doing some kind of turning manoeuvre, so you'd expect the throttle to be on to a degree in order to keep the nose up. I may be wrong. I'm sure uh, Johnny and Johnny and John will correct me if that w is not the case. Oh, he, um, said, he said he had to go to bed. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, yeah, he said he'd been sedated. So, um, Ben, actually, it was Ben actually put me on to these guys, uh, the Corridor crew, and I think you'd find them quite interesting, um, Ed. They, and it might be something you want to look into and, and maybe even subscribe to. I myself did. I think um, they, they appear to be an excellent YouTube channel. And if you think that this is an excellent YouTube channel, or even if it's just something you may occasionally dip into, then we might be worth a subscribe as well, or even a like, uh, and or a share. Just imagine that. Imagine what we could do if we were fed out to hundreds, if not thousands of other people. That was very subtle. I like that. You, did, you did that well. <laughs> I'm getting better. Right, so, um, yeah, where were we? Uh, I think we're on video five now, and, and this is where things start to pick up a little bit. Yeah. said that because these came out so quickly after the airline disappeared, that it'd be impossible to do these visual effects. How, f how fast could you guys do these shots? Uh, real fast. Yeah. As little as an hour. <laughs> as long as you know as long as four to five you know you could you could do this in four to five hours okay okay so they're talking about creating a cgi render um to replicate what you've seen there and they reckon they could do that in, you know no more than four or five hours so two months is way easily enough time to uh to generate a render and get it out onto the interweb um I right. shall play the next video. Oh, you're not looking impressed. You don't like the look of this. You don't like the look of you don't like the way this is going. I can feel the vibe there. <laughs> I think you're you're going, you know, I'm not I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced. No, it's not that I've got Go back to that first clip. Window. Just look at the background. Oh. Are we a satellite? Assume we're a satellite. Do you notice anything weird about the background? Oh, that the clouds are not evolving in any way, shape, or form. Nothing's evolving. It's you, a still frame. It's a still frame. Thank you, Ren. Hey guys, how fast do satellites go? 17,000 miles an hour. Well, actually, I'd like to correct them there because I think you find it's 17 and a half thousand miles an hour, 17,500 miles an hour. I would, I, I would also question that gentleman's <laughs> choice of eyewear. Oh yeah, I, yeah, no, I think he's just being a dick, you know. Um, right. But the, the, people do that. I mean, look at me and Ben. <laughs> the footage of the International Space Station. Oh, damn! <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, um, you would expect you would expect some degree of motion with the background. Yeah, yeah. Um, Even if it was slow, you wouldn't. You, it, it did. It it does look like it's flying over a still frame. It does yeah. it, no, very I, much so when it's pointed out to you like that. And then there, there's an even bigger problem with the thermals, right? Because, and I, I haven't clapped the part, but thermal cameras effectively can see through water vapor and mist and cloud right mm -hmm. because they're not really tracking it because it's just another cool object to them so they don't see it and they can effectively see through mist and, and water vapor so if you if when we see the thermal you'll see the um you'll see the contrail from the plane but thermal wouldn't really pick up the contrails because by that point they'd be cool and it's just it's just um condensed water vapor Okay, so, I mean, the jet engine doesn't heat the air up as it goes through it. Well, it does heat the air up, but the the reason the contrail forms is because the water vapour is condensing quickly because, remember, the temperature up there is like minus 50, minus 60 degrees. So anything that comes out of the jet engine is going to be cooled down really quickly. And right. effectively, what's coming out is basically water vapour, which is why we do get condensation trails. Or mm -hmm contrails as they say and we're not going into that other subject that <laughs> just no. uh, yeah we'll just no. leave that one um, <laughs> right so where am i on am i on i think i'm on seven okay so here we go thermal shot right what's right. up with that thermal shot thermal cameras like they don't have they don't have grain it's not underexposed footage and if there's any sort of noise pattern notice it's a fixed noise pattern yeah. it's the idea of like your image is under almost like a dirty lens. How do you make it look like it's thermal? 
Well, there's a filter in After Effects called Colorama. What Colorama does is it goes, all right, let's take black to white, and instead of do black to white, we're gonna fill it in with different colors along the way, a rainbow, a spectrum. And then, you know, that looks like thermal footage, it's just not accurate. However, in this case, we see the engines are hot, so maybe you go in, touch up the engines, give them a little, track some like heat points on there. One weird thing I'm noticing with the thermals is on that shockwave in the second clip, like how cold is that shockwave? Wait, is <laughs> like is that like a is that like a zero? And so I'm confused why it's so dark when like we clearly see the engines are like hot points. We're getting the yellows, the reds. Because if it's a super dark hole, why is it so bright there? And then it well, he's got he, he's actually got a fair point there. That is a fair point. If it's if it's really bright on one video and really dark on the other, and it's supposed to be thermal, and the, the darker colors are colder, then it, it's almost like they the flew into a giant snowball or something. Yeah, yeah, which doesn't really... Uh, that, that doesn't track. No, that doesn't track at all. And also, with the thermal image, given that the plane was full of passengers, it's the point you made about the, the little round windows. Now, mm -hmm. you could understand the, the um, aluminium shell of the aircraft being cool, yeah, but the glass should be kind of radiating heat, shouldn't it? Well, at least you would see, I mean, they wouldn't be bright. You can red. see, you can see touches of it's been attempted, right? Mm. And you would expect the doors to stand out more. They should be delineated quite strongly, I would think. You know? and, and also the cockpit. Well, yeah, and the cockpit actually is, if anything, the cockpit's duller than the rest of the plane. Mm. And you, you would you would at least expect that because the and, plane also has to be I mean they have to be heated at that altitude as well. Well, yeah, obviously, and and you've got to remember as well that these planes have a thing called an APU that sits in the tail, which is basically a very small jet engine that just runs to provide all the electrical power. Mm -hmm. So if the big engines go out, the APU keeps all the electrical systems functioning. Um, there's no heat signature from the tail at all. That's a fair point. No. And and you've seen you've you've seen that classic um Twitter misinformation picture of the what appears to be a, a jet sitting on the apron with smoke pouring out the back of it and people going, Oh, they left the uh, the switch on for the contrails, you know? When really it's basically an APU that's not started properly and is pumping out nothing but white paraffin smoke. That's what that is. Yeah. Yeah. No, I remember that video. Mm. Well, it yeah. Always seemed seemed a bit dodgy that they. You'd think that if they've got this super secret chem trailing program, <laughs> they'd 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 be a little bit more clever than to accidentally <laughs> flip a fucking switch in an airport. It's an APU fire, mate. That's all it is. Or it hasn't f properly fired up, and it's um it's not burning the the. I mean, planes run on paraffin, stroke kerosene. You know, it's the same thing. Um, effectively. Effectively, uh, it's it's just a, a bad start, you know. Anyway, um, right, so this is the last video. And there's other things to talk about after the video, so don't rush away. Because um, there's more to this plane than meets the eye as well. And I think a lot of people have forgotten something that did happen. And I saw a really good documentary about this and how th we were even looking in the wrong place. Because it's, it's nowhere near. Diego Garcia. It's not even near the Indian Ocean. It's actually more likely to be in the Southern Ocean towards Australia. But we'll come on to that. Okay, right. right. I have damning testimony. What? If you tell me that this is the shockwave. <laughs> do we have the shockwave on our server? We do now, actually. Wait, what? <laughs> I found the stock footage. Wait, stock no! footage! Yeah, rather we didn't. Some people on Reddit did. <laughs> this is a stock footage clip from the 90s. Oh, hell yeah. There's the clip from the video, and here is the stock footage. Mm. It's oh, perfect! It's perfect! Oh, Cinderella, yeah. baby. Cinderella, oh, man. That's it. Mm. Slipped right on. <laughs> wow. Yeah. An that's... ISA, dude, an identified stock asset. Some people have said, you know, pixels don't match perfectly. And you know what? Of course they don't match perfectly. I don't have the exact settings that the artist used, but if you look at it, it's the exact same. I can't, yeah, like I literally can't wear these glasses anymore. <laughs> like, there's like nothing, it's just so debunked. I, 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 think, I think that pretty much um, puts Mr. Um, Forbes's 
protestations about how accurate these videos are in the bin. Right? Yeah, it, it kind of does. I mean, if you, it, it's the just the, the mathematical odds of being able to overlay some stock footage and have the angles all oh. perfect and i mean that's and it was nice. those little it was those little curves see all those little the two curves mm. they fitted perfectly i mean that's Absolutely. The, yeah the possibility of that i have to say is even more remote than the possibility <laughs> that the passport in one of the hijackers pockets that hit one of the yeah. trade center buildings just happened to magically float down mm -hmm. onto the ground despite the fact that they went in head first and so said hijacker would be, be a, emulated, emulated. Yep. Kebab. Yeah. yeah. So, so there we go. So let's, um, let's come back to full screen. So I think, I think, I think we can quite safely say that those, um, th those videos are, are pretty much CGI uh, in my view. If anyone thinks they aren't, yeah, then, you know, fair, um, fair does, but I, I was, I, I wouldn't say I was a believer. But I I like all this esoteric thing. So yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you want to believe. You yeah. want to believe. Well, you're it, a fox molder. Yeah. No. I'm, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I'll take that as a compliment. Um, but it's kind of. I like, think I am too. I but, want to believe, but I can't. It if, has to it, make sense. Yeah, and and it's like they always say: Ed, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Yes. And if you if you're going to put a seven a triple seven through a wormhole to God knows where, then you're going to... In fact, hold on. Isn't that whole plot of those videos the plot of the Langoliers? The what? The Langoliers by Stephen King. I'm... Never Plane heard. goes through a wormhole and they end up in an alternate universe. Right, no. I've, Look I've, it up! Look it I've, up! I've, I'm not a fan of Stephen King. No, neither am I. <laughs> you can't write an ending because if I remember the Langoliers... Never really came to a satisfactory conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Espresso Mechanic says yes. The Langoliers is similar. Yeah, it, it pretty much is. That whole thing is the plot to the Langoliers. Right, Brentmate so. says Scully was short, but she was fit. Actually, Scully oh, was she's short, very fit. but she's she's she gets fitter as she's getting older. Yeah, I no. Think. She's Gillian Anderson. She's she's yeah. I I, I yeah. had noticed about that about her actually, and also the other thing is that she turned in because, like her acting in the X Files was always a bit meh. Ropey, yeah. But you see her now, and she's oh, superb. she's good though. I mean, good. her her portrayal of Margaret Thatcher in The Crown. <laughs> Um, <laughs> hold on, well, hold on, wait, hold on, Ray Greenwood. I, I, I'm not quite sure where this is coming from, but is there, <laughs> is there footage of such a thing? If so, DM me. <laughs> I need to know. Inquiring minds need to know. <laughs> oh dear. So. Well, I I do remember seeing someone in an early, uh, very very early Photoshop in the late nineties. Um, someone had taken uh, Julian Anderson's head and put it on a, yeah, a, a rather attractive dominatrix sort of body, which was doing, yeah, doing but the rounds when I was in the twenties. That was like <laughs> early, early early what early nineties um, misinformation on the internet. Yeah, no, absolutely. right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> A movie? Oh, you need to tell me what movie it was, Ray. Come on, good grief, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's just, no, he's just winding us up now. Right. Yeah, I think he is. Right, so here we go. I've watched the documentary, a proper, a real documentary, not like Gillian Anderson's fictitious nude scene. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I've watched a real documentary, and it was all about MH370 and about Rolls-Royce. Okay. Because it was Rolls-Royce that supplied the engines for that plane. Right, and that's the not uncommon. And the engines talk to the Rolls Royce server through a satellite. Oh, I didn't know that. To tell them how they're doing and when they're due service and in what their status is, and they report in quite often. You know, like once every two hours or something like that. Even right. when the plane's in flight. So, every so Rolls Royce were able to produce a track off the plane 
when it wasn't on radar and show you where it was heading to before it stopped transmitting. So where did they say it was heading to? They said, well, remember they started searching off Australia? Right. They said it went down somewhere just round about the bottom of the Pacific, start of the Southern Ocean. So I didn't actually know that about. So Rolls-Royce have got every single jet engine in the world that's made by Rolls-Royce. Talks back to the satellite. It talks back to the server through the satellite. Oh, well. So. Well, I don't think it applies to their cars, but <laughs> you should never still, know. I mean, the, I mean, yeah, the Southern Ocean is, is the Southern Ocean. Don't see, the, that's the problem. The Southern Ocean's mental, and the Pacific's huge. I mean, people don't understand how, I mean, what is it, 70% of this planet is covered by water? Yeah, yeah. and most of that's the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, and, and so people don't understand how big the search area then becomes because they lost, you know, the, the last transmission, the plane could technically have flown for up to another two hours before the next one didn't get through. So, you know, that's that that's a biggie. And and I think that does, I mean, and Johnny and John was still going on about um, it being shot down, but if a plane like that had been shot down, there'd be debris everywhere. It'd be washing up for months, if not years. I mean, it would have had to somehow go down almost completely intact. Although... If it if... crashed, but it could break up. It depends how quickly it went down. I mean, if it, if it, I mean, hitting, hitting water at high speeds like hitting concrete, because it's not terribly compressible. That's a problem. That's true. And, and That's and, true. <laughs> and you, yeah, and I mean, to make a safe landing on water, the plane would have to be going really very slowly. Yeah, it'd need to be doing a proper... And you saw that plane at the, in the start clip tr trying to land and parts of it breaking off as it hit the water. Yeah, because, I mean, it's we, we covered that... Um, uh, what was it? Uh, Sully. The, the, Sully, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, that's right. And, I mean, that, but that was a river and the plane was going very, very slowly because it, mm -hmm. relatively speaking, because he'd only just taken off yep. and he didn't have any engines. Yeah. Um, and also, the, the surface of the water was flat. Was, was well, not entirely flat, well, yeah, but, but it but... wasn't. I mean, it, it 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 wouldn't wasn't. We're not talking Southern Ocean. So, I mean, you did you ditch a plane in the sea in the Southern Ocean when it's rough, and yeah, your chances yeah. are slim, mate. Yeah. And also, the ocean. Well, is so do you remember the... that? You, I mean, the, 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 any debris that might. Yeah. I mean, it could have. It could either still be floating out there some somewhere, have sunk to the bottom, or uh -huh. washed up on some yeah. name, nameless little um, desert island somewhere. Yeah. Do you remember that plane that got hijacked? And um, was it the Canaries or somewhere? It tried. To, they tried to land it in the in the water, and the the wingtip hit the water, and the whole thing flipped, and the plane just fell apart. I mean, planes aren't. Yeah. I mean, planes aren't. Planes just aren't strong. No, because they don't need to be, you know. And well, the stronger you make it, the harder it is for it to get into the air, and the more fuel it burns to stay there. Well, the thing is that they are they are actually strong in terms of what they need to do, i.e., withstanding turbulence. And if you look at some of the stress tests they put um, aircraft wings under and stuff, um, they are actually designed. But they're designed to be strong in the air. It, it's they're not they're not designed to float exactly well yeah exactly it, the, the design to be strong where it counts mm -hmm. right they're not designed to be you know strong against hitting brick walls and things like that because they're not designed to hit brick walls or or water you know yeah or, or steel frame buildings <laughs> Shalini's <laughs> disgusted because two of the chaps in the chat room are still going on about Gillian Anderson and her accoutrements <laughs> Okay, can we can we stop with Gillian Anderson? Well, well Brittmate it... says he's seen the pic, you know, the picture. So uh, uh, we need to know the name of the picture, Brittmate. <laughs> uh, change the subject. Oh, it's like being down the pub when you talk to us, isn't it? And these things come up in the well, they don't, they shouldn't but, come up in the pub, but sometimes. Well, we're, we're talking pub, not locker room. <laughs> Oh, you don't talk about things like this in the locker room. That's a bit gay. 
Oh, God. Right. Oh, so, right. So we we totally haven't established what happened to MH370, but I think, I mean, the Rolls Royce evidence, but then you would think. Yeah, but might... nobody's really picked up on it since, have they? Well, and that's also what happened to the plane. I mean, why why did this particular aircraft go down? What? I mean, well, the, see, that's a whole different. That's a whole different kettle of fish. So, I think you got. I hate to say it, but most of these times when planes like this crash, something has happened that's either incapacitated the pilot, right? I.e., have they lost all the oxygen in the aircraft? Remember the pain. Uh, was was his name the uh, the guy? Golfer. The yeah. golfer, Stuart Payne, was it? Uh, um, yeah. Lear, like Learjet at 40,000 feet or something like that, lost its oxygen supply, everybody blacked out, and the plane just flew until it crashed because it ran out of fuel. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah, because, I mean, these days they, they're on autopilot most of the time that they're flying. Yeah, so um, that's, that's yeah, but the autopilot, that see, that that's where that, I think, that, um, what would you call it, that... Uh, that what would you call it that um theory falls down right and that if it was on autopilot would it not have just kept going to its destination it wouldn't have turned around flown down the other side of the island and then headed off for australia that's a fair point (laughs) so i think that kind of puts a kind of kibosh on that so the next point Payne stewart not stewart Payne's Payne stewart so the next thing yeah, well, a private Learjet isn't any different from a commercial aircraft. A private Learjet, in fact, a private Learjet is flying usually higher and faster. But anyway, um, a commercial aircraft that um, isn't on autopilot, so we're assuming it's not on autopilot because it's still, it's still turning and it's still making manoeuvres. So therefore, one of the one of the pilots at least is still conscious and flying the plane, or someone has hijacked the plane, right? But there was no indication the plane had been hijacked or anything like that. Um, so did one of the pilots go nuts? Uh, I mean, that happens, that happens. It does, I mean, it does happen. There's an example of a pilot that had, I can't remember who, what, or where, but there was a, there was a story that I read not that long ago about a pilot who'd had a mental health episode and when his, um, I think he might be the co-pilot and when the pilot left the flight deck to go to the toilet, he um, locked himself in and crashed the plane into a mountain. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, it it does happen. Um, It's just, it's one of those enduring mysteries that because there's no, we don't have any definitive evidence of what happened and there's no evidence of the plane so yeah, there's, there's that's always just nice. there's always going to be speculation mm-hmm. um, yeah and 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 also people trying to uh, i don't know get get likes on social media by creating a video that purports to be something that it isn't and that guy turns out to be quite he t- turns out to be very aggressive if people you know debunk his video and Mm. Well, hopefully it'll be quite aggressive against us because everybody is aggressive against seems to get hundreds of followers and <laughs> gives them a good bump. Uh, but, well, that, I mean, that's not necessarily why we're doing this. But no, of course, it's, it's, of course, it's not. Because uh, to be fair, Ed, I mean, initially you thought you thought we shouldn't really be calling this out because this guy seems all right. But when you dig it, when you dig into him a little bit, he's not quite as um, straightforward as he makes out to be. Whereas no. we, on the other hand, wear our heart on our sleeve. <laughs> what you see is what you get. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And I, I don't know. I, I mean, there are so many crazy people out there these days that I've, I've just stopped trying to even understand them because half, mm-hmm. half of the population of this planet seems to have gone completely mental. Um, but at the same time, one of the, the reasons that I found this story interesting is because of the connections to yeah. over unity energy, scalar physics, and some was, of 
some of the more esoteric because I know I know you're not a you're, you're not a fan of of over unity energy and the, I mean the laws of thermodynamics would seem to be on my right. side yeah but at the same time <laughs> I can't help but be reminded of how many scientific discoveries that we now consider normal including heavier than than um air flight yeah 200 years ago this they were saying it was impossible oh absolutely and and 100 percent behind you on that kind of thing but there are certain things that that people i think people want to believe more than prove you know and and the thing is just because you want something to be true is never going to make it happen and yeah but what i would also like to know is why any time that someone actually comes out with credible it's like tesla he was probably one of the first mm -hmm. and and he, tesla always claimed that there was an infinite energy amount uh, energy out there in the universe and you could just tap into it yeah but we talked about this and yeah and i know we but, agree that there is, but the problem is it turns out you've got to pay it back. And the more you take, the quicker you've got to pay it back. Yeah, but that's... Anyway, the point, <laughs> the point is that all of his doc, all of his papers and all of his research yeah. and everything else was, was immediately classified by the US government. By Mr. Trump? Yeah, and any any time anyone, any kind of often comes out with whether it's um there's another good example um there's a guy that invented uh, a different type of carburetor for for engines which basically dramatically increases the the fuel efficiency of the engine like yeah. from like by a factor of I, uh, what's the uh too much wine um well basically going from 10 to 100 right okay thing. factor of 10 yeah but he he died a mysterious death and his invention was never seen because they realized that if they actually released this um that all of the the oil company stocks would tank immediately because suddenly oil becomes much less valuable if it's well yeah you I mean, can use it much more efficiently and you've got to i mean you you only need to go back to the the actual invention of the diesel engine mm. to see how certain interests win out over others because i mean mr diesel who now has a fuel named after him never ran his diesel engine on diesel it was designed to be run on hemp oil yeah or, or peanut oil something yeah. like that yeah it was designed to, and that's why diesel engines can run on vegetable oils yeah absolutely. you know because they they use the power of compression rather than sparks to, yeah. to drive the the explosion and and then there's also there was that guy in the, in the states who came up with a water-powered car. Well, it's a hydrogen-powered car. Well, no, it's obviously, but you you, you fill it with water, and he, he yeah. created a, a super efficient method. Yeah, you crack using... you crack water to produce hydrogen and oxygen, and then yeah. you burn it. Yeah, and it turns back into hydrogen and oxygen. Again. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, a, it's freaking genius. That is yeah. genius. And then why wouldn't you want well. to do that? Because in this day and age, that's the ultimate green car, is it not? Yeah. Well, let's put some water in the car, and what comes out of the tailpipe? Water vapor. Sure. And then there's, there's also a scale of physics, which, if people are interested, there's a guy from the 90s called Thomas Bearden. I was watching this. Who was a lieutenant colonel in Air Force, I think. He, he was, yeah, he was. He was either army or air force. One of the anyway. One of he was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Beard, and and he he basically came claimed to have cracked scalar physics. Which again, it's not. I don't understand the it's physics. A bit, it's a bit airy fairy, isn't it, with a fifth dimension <laughs> and all that sort of well, stuff. Yes, but uh, then there's also. If we're if we're going on the basis that um, UFOs have crashed, or something, or let's let's just let's put it a different way, we're going on the basis that there is advanced technology that governments know about that we don't know about, which is probably twenty or thirty years ahead of. Well, it will be where we think what we yeah, think. It will be. 
So wouldn't it? I think that's a Gavin. To be fair, I, I mean, wouldn't it make masses of sense that one of those things may well be some sort of energy device that just very possible would seem to defy the laws of physics as we understand them? And there's also plenty of yeah. I mean, things like um, dark matter. There's there's lots of contention um, about Big Bang theory and dark matter. And, oh. uh, the Big Bang theory is almost discredited at this point, mate. Mm-hmm. Almost discredited because there's just every day the James Webb Space Tele- Telescope is um, is putting more holes in in the standard model of astronomy. You mm-hmm. know, it's just and, a mess. Sure, and so there's a lot of assumptions that we make about everything. There's assumptions that we make about biology. There's assumptions we make about mm-hmm. physics, about astronomy, and within all of those assumptions, how many are actually accurate? I mean, if you if you look back over the last 500 years of human scientific development, I mean, some of the absolute nonsense that we took as gospel, like well, yeah. bleeding people and leeches and various other utterly... I mean, <laughs> you look at it now, but it's... All, all I'm saying is that yeah. in, five, if in 500 years' time... Oh, Assuming yeah. that we haven't we haven't had the solar micronova and the whole, yeah. the whole of civilization hasn't ended, but well, there's going to be one. Well, yeah. No, I, so. I mean, there's going to be <laughs> there's going to be a micro. Well, it's not micronova as such. It's a recurring nova that occurs in a binary star system that's only three thousand light years away from us, and you're going to be able to see it with the naked eye soon, right? Because mm-hmm. it occurs every forty six years, so it's happening this year. Keep your eyes peeled, and and um, it will be bright enough. It will be bright enough to be seen by the naked eye. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that in 500 years, mm-hmm. a lot of the stuff that we take for granted as being true now in science, they will probably look back in the same way that we look back at at leaching mm-hmm. and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and also, perhaps there are um, elements that exist on other planets or exist on the earth that may be really deep and we can't get to them or they're very rare or whatever or we don't know yeah or it's or we've got it and it's staring us in the face and we're just not using it properly yeah um or, and perhaps and, i don't know sorry no, no no go on it's strange that you should bring this up actually because i would i mean and I'll preface this with I'm not a doctor, this is not medical advice or anything like that. But I was not think, physicists either. No, we're not. But having said that, you know, does it matter? Because everybody's entitled to their own opinion. And, and not in 2024, we're not. Yeah, but let's face it. <laughs> all the big all the big inventions were made by people who weren't qualified. Well, this is the problem with science. This is the, the I mean, look at Einstein. He, he wasn't yeah. qualified to do anything. He was a patent clerk. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the thing is that the, the great discoveries never come from the mainstream. They always come from the, mm-hmm. fringe, the fringe people. The guy in the shed. And unfortunately for so many of them, they're not even recognized as geniuses until after the poor bastards are dead. <laughs> and the whole time that they're alive, they're being told that they're crazy. It's like Tesla. Mm-hmm. I mean, every single electrical device... <laughs> Has has something that was created by Nikola Tesla in it, mm-hmm. but he died penniless. Yeah, yeah, of course he did. Yeah. Um, and, and anyway, so- as as I was saying, right. So mm. it was strange you should bring this up because I was certain thinking today, and I thought, you know, I think it was something from Pfizer that they tweeted, and I thought because they're going on about new vaccines for cancer, and I thought, why do we think? Why do we think cancer is a disease? Right, because cancer cells are your own body, and they're obviously reacting to something in your own body. So your own body cells are doing something wrong, right? Mm. And how much? Well, have you have you heard of um, German new medicine? There's a British. Yes, yes, I have. Um, there's a. Did you watch? I think it was uh, Space Busters. Did a. Um, it was a, a lecture in German by Stefan Lanker right. that was that was um, translated and dubbed into English by um, the chap from Space Busters, um, and that has some very interesting theories about why we get sick. I mean, because I'm I'm 
I'm not completely convinced in germ theory. Oh, you're certain. Be, you, well, <coughs> Ben and I do mention this on occasion. And I think um, I think the, there's a degree of there's a degree of interpretation and a degree of leeway between germ theory and terrain theory. I, given the way that the the world works, I wouldn't disagree with that. But mm -hmm. I I I lean much more heavily on the terrain side of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think to start with, unfortunately, I suspect that in the future, I'm trying to say this really carefully so we don't get the channel now. I, I know but, I know what you're saying. Yeah, but I I suspect that certain things which are injected into everybody from birth may not prove to be such of a miracle of science as a lot of people would like to try and convince us. Mm. And I think that they are actually responsible for an awful lot of the ill health that exists, like particularly chronic ill health. Um, but I also, I think we're not, we, we don't factor psychology into things enough, i.e. brain over body, because it's been proven over and over again that people have this almost miraculous ability to heal themselves. It's almost if yeah. if the will to live is strong enough and and the, the person makes the, makes the right kind of changes to their lifestyle, diet, mm -hmm. et cetera, mm -hmm. Um, that it's been proven that that people have been able to reverse stage four cancer. Um, yeah, and they're, they're careful also, now. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah, I know um, exactly. And in but fact, do, I no, think but we do have to be careful because ultimately, don't forget that in the UK, oh, it's illegal. Exactly, and it's and, illegal to say that you can cure that disease mm -hmm. if it's a disease. Which um, which, the Russians have fun, have had some outstanding success with fasting oh yeah yeah absolutely and and there's um there's a certain um a, a, a certain pharmaceutical that was heavily banned and censored mm -hmm. a few years ago. yes yes uh, yeah um in common did they use it on horses uh yeah yeah no yeah. that was, oh, that, was okay. that one but i've 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 also seen stories of that in combination with another one that i'm not going to mention yeah just because i don't want to get into any trouble but they have um, shown to have an impact on the thing that we can't talk about. Yeah. Um, but because, I mean, if, to my mind, if you start legislating against something, if you have to There's make something laws, to hide. Yeah. If you have to make laws to say you can't talk about something, mm -hmm. you can't suggest something, you can't explore mm -hmm. something, yep. then someone is trying to hide something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like... Um, it's it's like the Holocaust. Mm. You, you know, you can talk about it in yeah. this country, but you can't talk about it. You can't talk all about it in a negative manner on any kind of platform. And you can't talk about it in a negative manner in certain countries or you will go to jail. There was a guy who wrote a book, an Englishman wrote a book. And when he went to Austria to promote his book, he was incarcerated and yeah. spent, I think, three years in jail. And there's another German gentleman whose name i'm not going to mention either and it's if you if you can't ask questions and then when you couple that with what we see today mm -hmm. about what's happening in a certain middle eastern country mm -hmm. and and the way that the media and all the politicians they just look bored they just look like someone someone is essentially yeah. paying them to deny reality yeah, and, yeah. and to 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 go I, I think, along with I think the barbarity. I think, I think the situation in that country is is way more complex than most people think. You know, I, um, most I people look. It. Most people, I think, look at it from a very binary point of view, and it, it's not quite as simple as that. No, it's not, and and there's also a lot of foreign influence. Should we? Say, oh yeah, yeah, in the whole yeah. thing. And and a lot to do with the region as well, but but again, you know, it's, it's another one of those things that we we have to sit here and and, and skirt, can't talk about. We skirt the issue because everybody, uh, both of us and everybody listening, knows what happens if you cross over that line, and what we've seen, particularly in the last mm -hmm. eight months, is it is a whole new level of crazy. 
Yeah. It's, and, yeah. And, 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 and I mean, we, we saw lines being drawn by those assholes like two, three years ago. But this new line that was drawn seven, eight months ago mm -hmm. is something completely different. And, and it's when when that censorship becomes so rabid almost because it is that some of them are almost like rabid dogs yeah uh, brett mate's going on about certain recreational mushrooms that he may partake in occasionally i mean shiitake or something like that you know and um <laughs> I, I i'd love to try it i've never tried anything like that i'd love to try shiitake mushrooms but i don't i wouldn't even know how to start oh if you want you should uh yeah, there's there's someone in chat you could talk to. She knows who she is. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had a, a brief chat with her, but I, um, I, have to, I mean to have to actually go outside into things like meadows and look. Well, and then I'd always be worried about picking up the wrong thing, and the next thing you know, you're reading my old bit. Well, there are there are avenues to procure such things if, if you're able to. But the point is, I mean, I've I personally think that everybody should have a psychedelic experience i mean yeah. a, a good psychedelic experience is one of the thing about again we have to be really careful and i'm not encouraging anybody to do anything except i am um but all i'm saying is that i i found that it opened my mind in a way that i've benefited from ever since and it it gives you a perspective it gives you um it's almost like you change your reality for a few hours and yeah. in, in doing so you understand that the nature of reality is actually very fluid and what we perceive as reality is really just the state that we're locked into and that there yeah. are other, there are other states and we just happen to be born and we grow yeah. up with a particular you, have, you ever watched the um it. you ever watched this the series fringe i love it Love it. I've, I've just rewatched the whole thing. I've, okay. I, I think I've watched that from beginning to end about four or five well, times. <laughs> I've just rewatched the whole thing and, and I love Walter. Oh, he's brilliant. And uh, he he's gets, absolutely he, brilliant. John Noble's gets, just fantastic in it. And and yeah. I love the way he's always making himself concoctions to keep it to get himself <laughs> through the day. And I that, feel I feel uh, I know how you feel, Walter. I know how yeah, you feel. But it's just like, oh yeah, I'm just, I, I, I was, I was feeling a bit, bit down. So I've just, I just made up some LSD and I've done, and I was oh, just tripping. And then there's actually one entire episode called Brown Betty. Yes, there was. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and it, and for, it's a bit like Lost, though, because it's one of those those series because it got cancelled. And they kind of run out of ideas towards the end of it. Anyway, they did kind of run out of ideas. After, yeah. after five yeah, that, years, you... I didn't like the second. The last two seasons weren't as good. No, was agreed. it the last two seasons when they went forward in time? You know, after they've been ambled. Yeah, it just wasn't the same. It's it's once once you get to the whole uh, reality splitting and alternate universes, and that was okay. I I can. I can go with alternate universes, um, but it just started to get a bit too wacky. Where you've got visitors from the distant future and yeah, um, the observers. Yeah, I think although I'm I'm still convinced that Stephen Flynn is an observer. That wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me at all. I, I would not be surprised if they were observers because if you, if you actually had the ability in the distant future to time travel and you wanted to observe, because if you look. Well, look at that guy in that picture, right, with a modern haircut and a, what looks like a dyed T-shirt, which never appeared in those times. I mean, the guy stands out a mile. He just looks completely different like everybody else. And you'll think, he looks like he just popped out of the 80s or the 90s, you know? Yeah. Um, but the, the, the great thing about Fringe is, is it explores so many different topics. And they're all, I mean, they're all, it's all relevant fringe science. These are all theories or ideas that people have had or whatever. Um, and I, I, I was raised only on season two. Sorry, Ray. <laughs> oh, right. Well, shut up. <laughs> yeah, no, we, should, we don't, we don't want to spoil it for anyone. No, no, we wouldn't. Yeah, that's, that's quite brilliant. I quite like it. But I definitely commend it to everybody. I mean, certainly yeah. if, if you, if you. Although, I tell you what, though, right? 
there is no doubt, and, and this might surprise you, but there is no doubt in my mind, I would go for the red-haired Olivia any day. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Yeah, well, also because of personality, because she's a little yeah, bit less... Yeah, well, that, yeah, exactly. But she's, yeah. she's less of the FBI agent and the blonde yeah. area. But let's yeah. shut up now, because we, we, we've got everybody interested in it. Um, and the other series that I recommend people watch, which relates to AI, is Person of Interest. Oh, yeah, yeah. Person of Interest is very good. Mm. Very good. Um, Jim Caviezel. Yeah, Jim Caviezel. And, and what's oh, his face from Lost? Yeah, what's, I can't remember his I, name. I can, he's, one of, he's a brilliant actor, but I can never remember his name. He's done loads of things as well. Mm. But, yeah, um, Person of Interest is very good and very relevant. Very, yeah. re very, very relevant, I think, it, especially with AI. Mm. coming to the fore these days absolutely and it also the, the the series does um tackle a bunch of questions that people really need to be contemplating in yeah this, in this yeah. day and age yeah um particularly when it's just like the surveillance i mean you hook all of the different surveillance cameras into one giant ai yeah um well yeah. The, and the other one that really warns you about ai was the remake you know the the re uh the re what would you call it the re not the it's not a remake as such a reimagining of battlestar galactica you know the one with james edward Olmos and all that mm -hmm. that's brilliant i mean and the whole the whole cylon thing was ai which went awry and you know tried to wipe out the humans and that's just fantastic there's so many so many teaching points for for a variety of different disciplines in that actual uh, series that you could you, you could use it to teach leadership it's well, so you, good yeah absolutely but you just kind of hope some of these boffins that are developing this shit in this day and age actually sat down and watched those shows well see the problem is that these guys are so up their own mm. that they, they they're just sitting in a lab coding all day and they don't have a clue what's going on in the real world and this is why AI is so freaking bad, because none of the people programming it actually live in the real world. <laughs> well, well they, it, they don't, do they? No, and it, it's also they're putting it under so many constraints, which I can understand why, because you don't, you don't want a machine to be able to just tell anyone how to build a bomb or mm -hmm. create poisons or... Yeah, but those Whatever. constraints those constraints are applied by the social diktat of the people that are in charge of these companies and yeah. most of the people in charge of these companies are are buying their drum to the tune of they're probably still buying it to ESG, even though that'll be superseded by something else. But you know, they're going down a route that is really being forced upon us by corporations that have should have no say in how we live our lives. We should be telling them how we live our lives, but that's not what's happening. Corporations are ruling us. I mean, we, we're living in um, Blade Runner. Mm. We are in Blade Runner times right now. And if you don't see that, then just step back and have a look and see what's going on. We are living in Blade Runner times. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, you just, you only have to compare what people in the media and the politicians are telling us. And then yeah. you look at reality. It's the weather. I mean, we've got the Met Office telling us it's really warm and everybody is freezing our tits. We're all freezing our tits off and half of us it's have got not central warm. heating on. Um, but no. I know when it's global, warm and I know when it's boiling. cold. And did you see the latest? It's um the the amount the, the massive amount of CO two in the air is interfering with your skin receptors and making you think it's colder than it really is. No, it is not. No, it isn't. It's just and I mean, one of the one of the reasons for the, the the weird weather is that Tonga volcanic explosion, and Iceland. Well, Iceland not so much. The thing well, with but Tonga, Iceland Iceland keeps going off. Yeah, but but Tonga dumped trillions of yeah um, that, liters of water into the atmosphere, mm -hmm. um, and it takes a year or two for that to actually start settling. So one of the reasons that we've got. Uh, all of the flooding and we've we've yeah. had rain for almost the whole year is actually something that happened on the other side of the world a couple of years ago. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, you know, to to sit on Twitter and bang on about weather modification and 
you know, the governments are doing this, the governments are doing that. Just step back, people, and think about this for a minute because the weather system is so chaotic, right? It is so chaotic that even if you're trying to, you are struggling to tell what the weather's going to be like two hours ahead, never mind two days, right? So you're telling me that people are controlling that weather with a degree of accuracy that they can't even forecast what's going to happen. No, I don't. This is the thing is that I, I, I believe that there are a lot and there have been since the 60s because there's untold patterns that I can show you that relate to okay. technology that has okay. been developed. You're to, right. Um, <laughs> cloud seeding, for example. I mean, that's, yeah, but, that's right. not something that's... Um, no, okay, if we, if we, uh, cloud, seeding's, cloud seeding's fine, right? I, I, cloud seeding occurs, cloud seeding has happened. Right. But what about the, the British... hurricane that no, changed well, direction on nine eleven? No, but the, the hurricanes change direction all the time, mate. They really do. Yeah. Tornado they're chaotic. By their very nature they're chaotic. But right. So let's look at cloud, cloud seeding works. Cloud seeding has been used. It was used in China by the the Olympics. The British government have said they haven't cloud seeded anything since seventy four or something like that. Right? Oh. And that's on their website. That's what they say. Whatever. Right? But you know what? The ones that get me are the people that say, oh, it was a lovely blue sky and suddenly a plane went over and then we had clouds everywhere. Right. You can't see the fucking cloud that isn't there. You can't create clouds out of nothing. You just can't do it. Doesn't matter how much fucking aluminium you throw into the air. If there's no moisture there, you cannot fucking see it. Just can't be done. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know what the hell's going on, but I do know that... I wake up and there's a blue sky and there's planes going overhead and dumping whatever is being dumped. And the other then, thing that gets me, the other thing that gets me right is people's memories. People's memories are shit, right? I mean, my own wife among them, right? because she would turn around and tell me that you know, say April last year was really fucking I glorious. Didn't see it was those dry. trails before right? the mid nineties because I remember when they started showing up. Okay, but right, people turn around and go like, "Last April was beautiful," and then, oh, oh yeah, our last April it never, the sun never came out, and you look at the the record, and it was fifty fifty. You know, ninety percent of the time it's fifty fifty. People just have a shit. They remember the good times and forget the bad times, or they remember the bad times and forget the good times. Well, the people do it is, all the time. Well, I mean. The, the simple fact is, is that the planet is not equidistant from the sun all the time, and it's the sun that, exactly. really, drives, that really drives the climate. Well, yeah, and, and you've so got all the Milankovic cycles and the, oh, but, I mean, how many cycles you got? You got about three, and if they coincide, you're going to get extreme weather. You know, absolutely. And when you when you do have something like a volcano dumping trillions mm -hmm. of tons of water into the upper atmosphere. Um, that's going to have an impact as well, and I think we're particularly this year we're actually underestimating the impact of that because it takes time for natural processes to circulate all that stuff through the system mm -hmm. because ultimately what goes up has to come back down again um but it's uh, i don't know i think that the fact is that they're blaming humans for something that is actually related to the sun and is not something we can do anything about yeah um and at the same time they're trying to make us all drive electric cars oh yeah i know i, I mean that, that's just ridiculous i mean and the other thing is we live in a maritime climate and the maritime climate generally is very damp okay and our weather predominantly comes from the atlantic from the west and all you have to do is look at the satellite photos and see the amount of fucking cloud that comes across <laughs> the atlantic and you know where it turns up Scotland, <laughs> which is all why you, you people are just such bright, shining examples oh. of humanity. <laughs> it's like somebody posted the other day saying, It doesn't look like we're going to have a summer this year. Have you fucking been to Scotland? <laughs> and then when you, you know, I mean, we, we still and... talk about 1976, we still <laughs> talk about it. Uh... Yeah, but the thing about Scotland is that as soon as there is a bit of nice weather, everyone gets eaten alive by midges. <laughs> oh, dear. Right. Where are we at? 
<laughs> Fuck knows. I don't know. We've did, we've strayed from MH370 quite a lot now. Yeah, we have. <laughs> we have. Um, and we've covered alternative. Well, energy. I think it's I think it's probably time to go. Yeah, I don't I don't really have that much more to. Yeah, contribute. That I don't think. But I've, I've as always I have enjoyed our little chat and it's I think it's been good Absolutely. and I've enjoyed you people out there. Nice <laughs> yeah, no, it's been nice. Chat's been active. Yeah, it has. Um, so, there you go. What are we going to talk about next week? Your choice. What do you want to talk about? Uh, let's see what happens because the, the current events. We'll do it. We'll do a current events one next week because we're kind mm -hmm. of alternating. Yeah. Um, so let's see what the week throws up. I'm sure Clan World will hit us with something. Okay. Right. Cool. It's been fun. Thanks. Guys. It has. It's been great for you. About spontaneous combustion. That's why I've assembled this crack team of scientists to find out the cause of the phenomenon. You are the best scientist. We are the best scientific <laughs> minds. Of course we are. <laughs> so um, what we're talking about tonight is, if you haven't gathered, human combustion. Spontaneous, spontaneous human, human combustion. combustion. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's, I don't think it's a tricky subject. I think it's something that has occurred. And it's something that does occur and will continue to occur. Um, and just there are a variety of different explanations for it. And we will go through them. Um, have you ever experienced spontaneous human? I don't mean, well, having said that, and, and we'll get to this, but people have survived it. Um, I've only ever heard of it. It's, uh, it, it's stories that, yeah, just mm -hmm. stories. Um, I haven't really seen anything like pictures. The only pictures that I've seen are people who have actually self-immolated. Um, yeah, yeah. And okay. set themselves on fire. But, yeah, I mean... I well, personally, I mm -hmm. I think the world is crazy enough that I'm, as always, prepared to entertain any possibilities. And good evening, by the way. Oh, good evening. Good <laughs> evening. Sorry, I, I I feel like I've been on for an hour because I was watching Ben um, on the other channel as he's doing the politics stuff. You know the question oh, yeah, time crap. Bo boring election nonsense. Yeah, boring election nonsense. But hey, some people um some people like that shit. But anyway, uh, good evening, chat room. Johnny and John, good to see you again, mate. Peace and tapes. Nice to come over. Dread Eye and Julie, love you. Love you guys. Right. Um, so, I've been at a few burnings. Um, you, but what? I've been at a few burnings. Well, yes. Yeah, okay. But what is that? It's what Scottish people call a fucking bonfire or something? No, no. Remember my previous occupation, right? Oh, policeman, right. Yeah, yeah. So I, I have attended a few burnings, and I have attended one in particular, in which it was an elderly woman, um, probably a smoker, probably uh, liked the odd drink, don't we all? <laughs> you know? Um, and, and she was sitting in a chair watching the telly, and she had, I wouldn't say she'd spontaneously combusted. I think what happened is she's dropped a cigarette while she's passed out through alcohol. Or she's had a heart attack and died. And um, the wick effect has taken over. And we'll, we'll discuss the wick effect as well, because that seems to be a real thing. Um, yeah, it does. And I mean, that's that. it's certainly the, the mainstream ex explanation for for stories about what what is thought to be spontaneous human combustion i mean mm -hmm. we are we are kind of as as we as we like to do knocking up against the laws of thermodynamics as well well um, yes yeah, yes i know because there are some incidences and and I, I know i'm teasing an awful lot here but we'll come on to them as well there are some instances that the wick effect cannot explain interesting so anyway as i said i was at this burning and it, it followed kind of um, most of the pattern and that uh, the woman had was indeed badly burnt, although she wasn't charred to nothing, which um, a lot of people are saying that's what happens. You know, you get a large pool of ashes and usually the lower legs, which don't tend to have a lot of fat on them anyway and are always below the seat of fire of someone sitting, say. So you would you would expect if anything's going to survive it would be the lower legs and that does appear to be the case on most occasions. 
Um, so yeah, um, this woman had she was badly burned. She um, I suspect she had died prior to um, the burning starting. Um, but the overwhelming smell was of roast pork. I was going to ask. I mean, just oh on a God. on a purely on a purely human level, yeah. that must have been an absolutely an utterly horrific thing to have to experience. Uh, well, and yes, I know. To... I was starving because I hadn't had my dinner yet. And <laughs> oh, bloody God hell! Sake. <laughs> oh my God! You bloody cannibal! <laughs> Holy shit! No, oh no, God. nobody, nobody. I mean, have you ever? Have I'm you ever spoken? To... That was that was that little old lady that just burned to death in her chair, and all I could think about was a bacon sandwich. What the hell? <laughs> Have you ever spoken to um, surgeons or doctors? I know. I knew. A, I knew a girl who was a she was a, a trainee surgeon, and um, she said the biggest problem she found in the operating theatre was was not salivating. At the sight of all the fresh meat, <laughs> I <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> That's but on a uh, but then when you think about it, on a purely kind of monkey brain, mm -hmm. sort of primitive level, reptile of, brain even yeah re no reptile brain more than monkey brain. Actually, that's I mean that's what happens when you see. I mean I walk past the steak counter in the supermarket and um definitely salivate <laughs> but that's just creepy and weird that that must be i guess the first time it happens to a surgeon they probably go go home and have this dark night of the soul about it and have to have to kind of contend with the fact that they've just been sitting there with a half cut up human and and all they can think about is barbecuing a steak <laughs> Humans, human beings are just messed up. <laughs> well, yeah, we are, we are. But well, I mean, I think we accept that, don't we? And we accept ourselves for our faults. But um, yeah, anyway, let's um, let's see what this is um, meant to be about. So let's drop into our little our little video um, scenes, and and we'll start with with Kenny as always, as you would. Here you go, Kenny. You gonna see your little girlfriend again? Woo, 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 woo. Dude, you spend way too much time with that girl. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Kenny emulated there, and he did it pretty quickly. I wouldn't have expected, you know, um, spontaneous human combustion to affect anyone so quickly. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you've seen this South Park episode. I I don't watch South Park, but Ben put me onto this. I don't I don't recall that one specifically. I'm not I'm not an enormous fan of South Park, but I I do watch it sometimes. And yeah. I, I, I do find the humour utterly hilarious. I mean, some of them just have me in complete stitches. Yeah, so they have they, they have their own theory. And the theory that they actually come out with, which we will go through in this, because I did say that um, spontaneous human combustion was brought to you not only this evening by myself and the wonderful Ed the Techie, um, look him up on Twitter, but also by South Park. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway... Um, Number two of the Kenny. What the hell happened to him? He just ignited. What happened? I saw it from across the street. He just caught on fire. So, yeah, and this has happened. <laughs> and you think most most people, and I, I watched the, I don't know if you watched the Y Files episode on uh, spontaneous human combustion. Um, it was I, about a year ago. Um, probably not then. And AJ, AJ's pretty good at this kind of stuff. And this was before I, I became. Um, this, this, and this, and what would you call it? Disenchanted with him, um, when he started going heavy on the AI. Now I don't know if he's laid off it a bit, but it depends on the episode. He's, yeah. I, I think he's he's using it as filler, but I think he's also he's kind of learning. It's it's like one of those things that you discover a new toy and and every, you use it for everything, and then over time you realise that actually you don't need to overdo it quite so much and, and you kind of dial it back a bit and give him time. I mean, fundamentally, I think his shows are superb. Oh, I mean, they're the, excellent. The, the yeah, production yeah. value, the research, his... Um, although, although his, his spontaneous human combustion one was a bit lacking in research and a, well, bit, uh, a bit too quick to debunk. Or okay, debunk. I have watched it. I'll, I'll have to go back and, I'll, I'll yeah. have to go back and watch it. Yeah, well, watch it after we've um, after we've been through this, because you may have you may open your eyes to many things that have 
not thought that he hasn't thought about. Mm. Um, so yeah, so spontaneous human combustion does tend to affect. It does tend. Well, there's two types, right? So you seem to get the person who has near a source of ignition, either a cigarette or a, a fa- an open fire or something or a candle or something like that. So the near a source of ignition, they've usually had a drink or whatever, or they're on some kind of medication. Or they have like a an ep, a medical episode, like a heart attack or something like that, and um, the fire takes hold, and they they slowly over a number of hours. I mean, you need at least twelve to sixteen hours before the body will start to actually just disappear. Um, so, and over a number of hours, the body will consume itself because the fire. As long as the fire can get a grip on. The wick material, which is going to be the clothing. Right? And the fat in the body once you get well, down to it. Once the fire breaks the skin and the fat starts to render out, that then becomes a fuel. And and one of the things is there's always a thick, sooty, greasy layer in the room. And, and I can testify to that. I have seen that thick, greasy layer, and it's not attractive. Um, <laughs> feel but, sorry for the poor bastards that have to go in and clean it up afterwards. Well, yeah. But the, the other thing is, anything low down in the room is completely unaffected, you know, because heat rises. So if this is burning, the, the spot above the body on the ceiling is usually quite well burnt. But the rest of the room, there's a kind of halfway, well, it's a graduation. The higher up you get, the darker the soot and grease gets. But um, generally, like the carpet, even sometimes the chair the person's sitting on is almost entirely unaffected. That's creepy. Yeah, you, it you, is creepy. You, you could think how, I don't know, people living 100, 200 years ago, because at the end of the day, I mean, people were, people were still smoking and burning mm-hmm. themselves to death in their houses 200 years ago. But yeah. overall, scientific knowledge wasn't as good. Yeah. And so if you if you were to come across a situation like that as a um I don't know in that sort of time period then something like that could easily be ascribed to spontaneous human combustion or the work of the devil or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And these ones um these ones tend to tend to have occurred always nearly always when the person's alone. Um, and someone will discover it at some later point. But yeah, because usually if you're not alone, then the person oh, yeah. that you're with yeah. will try and put the bloody fire out. But the ones... sit there barbecuing marshmallows yeah. while Granny's burning to death. What the hell? Exactly. <laughs> it's like, I mean, it's like, you know, you, you, I mean, what, what do you do if someone's having a medical episode? It's like, I mean, someone has an epileptic fit in the bath. You don't throw the washing in, you know, you help them. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, anyway, that was a joke for the purposes well, of no, YouTube we, censors. We, we have to make jokes about this a bit because the whole thing's so bloody horrible, and it's quite scary. And it's icky as well. I mean, yeah, but it's scary it's because can sick. this happen to you? Well, and it could. It could. <laughs> right? Because it gets even scarier once we delve into maybe other reasons for it. Well, let's but, just say you're more likely to die in a plane crash oh yeah yeah something else no, i mean win the lottery maybe let me let me make a disclaimer a non-medical disclaimer but this this is rare it's not unknown um but it's rare in fact i would say it's uncommon it's not even just rare it's uncommon but um if it does happen you know then well it happened but the one that gets me is the ones that occur in front of witnesses these are the ones that are really really hard to to um to discount i mean okay we'll go back to the 1700s and apparently they were having dinner in a castle or whatever you know at the banquet table and the woman gave a big belch and then flame erupted from her mouth and they put it out or whatever and um in fact it might have been the 1800s because she went to hospital and died like three or four days later well I guess in theory, I I don't know if you did she burp into a candle. Oh, I, because I, if I mean if you have everybody happened, saying that she was just sitting at the table and you know I, she, I don't she know she let out a belch and then just burst yeah. into flame. 
Well, just if we if we break this down logically, there has to be an ignition source. I mean, she's not she's not doing some sort of I don't know meditation or mantra or, or some sort of. Well, weird, does there have to be something? an ignition source? That's the first well, point. Because well, because if you think about it, um, things like um, things like have you ever um, have you ever oiled wood? <laughs> <laughs> what a question. <laughs> right, so, but if you've oiled wood, you know, like using teak oil or Danish oil or something like that, and you, you get a rag, you you put oil on the rag and then you stroke it up and down your wood. <laughs> <laughs> it should we start an OnlyFans we... channel? <laughs> uh... How about no? Right. So, so yeah. So once you've finished oiling your wood, right? What do you do with a rag? Now the worst thing you can do with a rag is put it in the bin. Okay. Can't put the rag in the bin because what happens is these oils, as they dry, right, attract oxygen atoms from the atmosphere, bind with them, and can quite quickly reach the point of combustion. So they actually spontaneously combust into fire. And the amount of houses that have been burned down from their garages because someone's been out oiling wood and just carelessly discarded a rag. Well, I, I totally believe that because, I mean, there are um, metals that do that as well. Nickel, I think. Nickel concentrate. Mm -hmm. When it's transported, they have to um, pump nitrogen into whatever the hold is. It's usually transported around in ships. And once they put the nickel in the hold, they have to displace the oxygen um, because nickel can spontaneously combust. So that actually proves that under certain conditions, the right sort of elements could, in theory, spontaneously combust. Now, yeah. how, how that applies to a woman sitting at a dinner table, okay. I, so, I don't know. Right. So the other one that got me was the guy who was sitting and I think this was in the seventies in America, Kentucky or something like that. And he's having a chat. He said he was having a great time with his mate. They were chatting away and, um, and suddenly he caught fire. <laughs> right, as, as you do. He, his arm and chest here caught fire, right? And his mate helped him and they got the fire out. And he went to hospital and he had burns. And the doctor said, this is the most bizarre thing I've ever seen because it's almost like the fire erupted from underneath the skin rather than burnt the skin in. That's some proper X-Files shit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how, t okay, how, how might that happen? I mean, there's got to be... Well, that's the interesting things, part. Things, that I mean, if things to. just if things just spontaneously combusted really easily, then it would be happening all the time. Well, no, no one's situations. saying no one's saying it. It's it happens easily, but I think um, there are particular circumstances that may cause it. Right? Oh, I don't, I don't doubt that. Yeah, um, but so so the the last or one of the more and in, most intriguing one is. Um, the guy who spontaneously combusted in his flat in Florida. And um, the landlord had been round and spoken to him and he came back about an hour later or something and saw smoke coming from the window, went up to the door and the door handle was hot, right? So he opened the door gingerly and smoke came out and um, there was a pile of ash in front of the cooker where the guy had been cooking, right? But it was a pile of ash. There was a pot on the cooker boiling that still had water in it. So this oh. guy, this guy burned in less than an hour to ash. That. That's one weird shit. Well, that, I mean, the, the temperatures required for that, if you think about, um, mm -hmm. cremations yeah. and and because the, the, I mean they, they basically burn the, the body and the coffin down to ash bones and everything else yeah well they're talking about a thousand degrees for two hours or something yeah but then how so how the hell does that happen to some dude in his kitchen well that's and, the question and, so and the that's rest the of the building hasn't burnt down as well I mean because 
you would think that someone who was burning in that way would actually let off a considerable amount of heat as well. And probably Someone's just this. said drinking spirits can reduce the quantity of water in your body quite considerably and make you more prone to burning. <laughs> Um, sorry, sorry, Ed. No, no, no. I, I mean, that's, yeah, that's so, alcohol for you. Yeah, well, I mean, that it does seem to be a common theme, and that is one of the theories. One of the theories is that um, if you drink alcohol, you are you are dehydrating yourself because the liver has to deal. Alcohol is a poison, so you have to deal with alcohol very promptly. Um, so your liver deals with it on a on a on the. Uh, preference basis right so it goes for it first and it has to use water to transmute it into some other form and then you can basically urinate it out and and your body's pretty efficient doing this um so but it will lose a certain degree of water while it's doing it so you can get dehydrated so you will reduce your regular amount of water but you're still going to be mainly water but i mean but yeah because we're, we're what 90 percent, 98 percent yeah. water we don't think of don't think of water, right, in the way that you think about it. Because remember, what is water, Ed? H two O. Yeah, H two O. Dihydrogen so monoxide. Yeah, so it's one hydrogen and two oxygen molecules, right? Or two oxygen oxygen. Yeah. Dihydrogen right. monoxide. And what are both of those things? They're both highly flammable when they're not combined as water. Well, yeah, but that's a stretch. I mean, if if it There's was more. easy to split hydrogen and oxygen from water, we would all be driving around in super efficient water-powered cars. The, the <laughs> guy that came up with that died. No, I know. But maybe, okay, so maybe it is super easy to split them. Maybe it is. Maybe it's easier than we think. And maybe yeah, our bodies can do it. Well... So, so the water molecules in the person's body somehow split, and then you get hydrogen and oxygen, and that then combusts, and that then causes a spontaneous combustion. Is is that your theory? No, that's not right. my theory. We haven't reached my my theories. My theory is cutting edge science, mate. That's just one of the mainstream theories about right. the causes of spontaneous human combustion. It's one of the old theories. Mine is cutting edge. Mine has never been seen before, never published before, never discussed before. I haven't seen it anywhere. Right? I okay. came up with it all on my own last night. <laughs> See? Right. Okay. Because I'm smart. Big brain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll give you that one. Right, so so we've had so far we've had two theories. We've had the wick effect, and the BBC did. Do you remember the BBC documentary when they did the wick effect and they got a pig, they got a dead pig and wrapped it in a blanket, a pig in a blanket, <laughs> right? And then then they dropped a cigarette on it, and the cigarette smouldered and smouldered and smouldered, and nothing ever happened. It just smouldered and smouldered, and then so they went and they started fanning it, right? So can you imagine two two scientists. Pardon me, excuse me. Two scientists fanning a dead pig in a blanket <laughs> has had a cigarette and dropped on it. Right, so they're fanning it and they get a fire going, right? And eventually the wick effect starts to take effect. So the skin's ruptured, the fat's oozing out, it's, it's leaching into the, the blanket, which then becomes the wick. And this burned, this burned for 12 hours, no problem, right? But all it did was make barbecue. The pig wasn't reduced to ash. You know, the skin was charred, but inside it was basically barbecued pig. Right. You know? So so 12 hours isn't long enough to, to well, reduce a body to, to ash. So how can you explain this guy in Florida who reduced himself to ash in less than an hour? That's incredible. Some, well, if he was standing in front of the cooker, then maybe some sort of accidental gas eruption from the oven. Yeah, mate, but... But then know, if there's a I, I understand. thrower coming out of the oven for some reason, then it, it would burn everything else in the exactly. room as well. 
Yeah, and and you have to remember that would need to be on him for an hour or so to make him ash. You know, because it takes a long time to dry a human body out and burn it down to nothing. In fact, crematoria don't even burn you down to nothing. They have to use a mechanical grinder to break up the bones. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's why... Uh, I can't go Hang there. Hang on. So, so, so your loved ones get run through a mincer yeah. and then well, burned? Well, it's not a mincer. It's a mechanical... It's a mechanical grind, you know. It's like okay, a, so, uh, it's like something you put a car through, except it's for bones. Oh right, that's, yeah, that makes it more pleasant. One of those like things that turns the car into a cube. Yeah, well, yeah, but just think a oh, big wheel. Right, no, you, you know, you know, you know how when they destroy hard drives, it's a bit like that. You know that <laughs> thing, <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah, okay. that's what they do. Yeah, they do right, that. So yeah, that's that. Let's put a, a new perspective on. Jesus. I didn't. I genuinely didn't know that, and having experienced death a fair few times in my life, I'm actually rather shocked. <laughs> Holy crap! I thought, I a, thought a big could... a wheel grinder. That's exactly it, Ray. You're right. As a wheel grinder. All oh, right. So if if you happen to not be dead for some reason, you don't even actually ever get to find out whether you're going to get burned oh. to life because you get smashed to bits by this the, bloody. No, the ash falls through the grate and the bones. They're just left on top, and they just get scooped into the grinder and then added to the ashes. And then you get a tub, which is surprisingly freaking heavy. Oh, hang on. So they grind the bones up after you've been cremated? Yes, after you've been cremated. Oh, I thought they put the whole bloody body through some sort no, of No, 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 no. Just the bones. Because out loud. they cremate you for an hour or, or two hours or whatever it is. And that, that still isn't enough to destroy all the bones. So then they have to mechanically grind the bones. So that makes this this story about the guy being found. How do we know that that pile of ash was in fact the dude? Was it was it DNA tested feet. or something? His feet. So his feet are still there. <laughs> his feet, little legs are still there. Oh, shit. The feet are always there. That's that's why. I mean, AJ said if you're gonna if you're gonna you know if you're gonna be partial to a drink, you're overweight and you're smoking and. The, Make sure, make sure you've got good shoes on, because that's probably the only thing that's going to be left. <laughs> oh dear! I mean, it, that, how does that happen? I just it it defies. It I've defies got a theory. My abilities to try get get, get on with it because it's no my noodle. <laughs> it's only we're only at half past the hour. All oh, right, okay. So there's plenty play. of time. So that's that's um what's that? That's two theories we've had. One, one with um. One with the wick effect, which is kind of being discredited, you know, it, 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 like the, the one I was at, the burning I attended, the, the, it definitely, um, it definitely worked on that one. But you know, things like where there's just a pile of ash left, then the wick effect's not going to do that. There's not enough time. Um, and then there's the alcohol reducing the amount of water, and I don't think that works either because it doesn't reduce the water by enough. To make no. you, you know, it's not like you go, you know, like a white walker or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, a lot of the water in our bodies is locked up in our cells and everything else. Exactly, exactly. Um, so the next one is, uh, the next one's ketosis. So nice. this is acetone. So acetone is quite highly flammable, and some people have said that when they have seen people that are that have spontaneously combusted, and we've we've got reports from people like firemen, who put out a homeless guy who had flame coming from his abdomen. Was he? That's because he was trying trying to drink meths or something. It's a possibility he might have spilt meths on him. You know, these things could have happened, right? But yeah. So, um, so the next theory is acetone, um, because you're in keto. If you're in ketosis, you, you've you've reduced your sugar and carbohydrate intake to the point where your body is burning your body fat, which is great because it's using it for energy, and that's fantastic because it's you're losing weight and you're burning. And I've done keto diet and it works. It works really well. Um, but the thing is, you, you produce ketones, and one of those ketones is acetone. Yeah, yeah. So, if you do like a, a urine test or whatever, you'll find that there are ketones ketones in your urine. 
and one of them would be acetone and the theory then is that the acetone somehow gets ignited right but okay. um it, the theory's a bit sketchy on how that would happen and how that would be a self-sustaining reaction you know because there's only a certain degree of acetone there yeah although it is spread out throughout your entire body I mean that that's kind of as implausible as suggesting that the the hydrogen and oxygen in your cells somehow splits and manages to combust somehow um i mm-hmm. i i mean i'm not discounting the possibility but just purely based on the quantities involved that i mean if if you produced a lot of acetone enough acetone to actually ignite yeah there's plenty plenty of people following keto diets that would have serious flammability problems yeah yeah i think so too um right so let's move on to some of our little videos because we've been neglecting them haven't we um bye helen bye Jerry. <laughs> oh my god another one <laughs> helen no what happened god must be very angry with us but why how have we angered you lord <laughs> so so we're, we're getting to the um the south park theory which is completely different from the acetone one right because that's going down the methane route Right. <laughs> I've heard about this. This is spontaneous combustion, but it usually only happens to fat people near open flames. <laughs> it usually only happens to fat people near open flames. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> oh, Matt Stone and Trey Parker are just. Yeah, right. The so geniuses. Now so here we go. We're gonna go down we're gonna go down the South Park methane theory now. Okay, and that's I think this is the last theory before we move to my theory. Okay. Okay. Exciting. Right. Mr. Marsh? The little boy combusted because he had a new girlfriend. <laughs> it wasn't the girl that caused him to combust, it was the fact that Kenny did not want to pass gas in front of her. Right. So he didn't want to pass gas. And we've all been there with a the new bird, you know. You don't want to let one go in front of her in case it turns her off, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So and, and you want so to kind of keep trying to keep that going through the relationship as well. <laughs> so you're Jesus. keeping that you're keeping that methane in there. Um, so now we're into the full explanation of the theory, and I think this is brilliant. This is a brilliant explanation of this theory. It's completely flawed and debunked, but it's it's brilliant. C. As food is digested, the natural processes give off a byproduct known as methane gas. The methane gathers here in the bowel area where it causes pressure. Normally, a person would expel this buildup in the form of a pleasant fart. Should the gas not be expelled, the methane can build up and then ignite, leading to disaster. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> so the question is, right, what would cause it to ignite inside your stomach? Where would the where would the spark come from that would ignite methane gas inside I, your bowel? I don't know. I I mean I can perfectly believe that the pressure could build up and you might rupture your bowel, but I I can't see how it would ignite. I mean even I can't you, see it either. It, it, even if you swallowed a match or something. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, right. so I don't think South Park is where we should be going to try and solve the mystery of spontaneous human combustion. Indeed. <laughs> and remember, we're not trying to solve the mystery of, if actually, if we think about it, the majority of, of spontaneous human combustion is solved in that, it is generally the wick effect. It's like the burning I attended. It's, yeah. it's people that have partially immolated themselves, not immolated themselves, but inadvertently immolated through a dropped light or an ember or something, or they've had some kind of medical episode and, and then things have overtaken them and, you know, the, the body has burned using the wick effect. And that's probably the majority, but there are still these ones, especially the one with, with witnesses, where people have caught fire for no apparent reason and no apparent... Um, but this, I mean, there, there has to be a reason. Well, th- yes, Even and uh, we're, we're that coming to is, that. that. We're coming to, to that. Okay. That's my theory, okay. my theory, right? So we, they've caught fire for no apparent reason that 
that can be discerned by the people investigating it, but they've left themselves a pile of ash. I mean, one guy, one guy was obviously going to the toilet and he was in the bathroom. His Zimmer was against the bath, right? And there was a hole in the floor that his body had burnt through and left a pile of ash on, on, on the, you know, the room below, right? Holy shit. Okay. His two feet were still upstairs. Uh, how? Hang on. Yeah. Yes. But where? How? Uh, if his uh, no, hang on. Explain this to me. If so he the burnt guy a had... hole in the floor to the point there was ash in the room below. Yeah. How the hell were his feet still there? Well, because he'd fallen, obviously, right? So he was stretched out in the bathroom. Oh, right, right. He wasn't standing. Right, and got it. and his torso, his torso, and whatever had burnt the way through the floor, leaving the feet behind on this occasion. I mean, I've seen the picture. There is, there's a picture. Yeah. It's, it's real, you know. And the thing is, if I put the picture up, we end up with um, we and end up with up. one of those stupid um, what's it called things that you know this this video contains material that may be whatever you know. But put which you means off your that dinner. he he burnt somehow. Uh, how, but if he was lying on the ground, uh -huh. wooden then, floor, wooden floor. Yeah, but how how are the how are the feet still survive? Because if but if he was lying flat out. Yeah, but if he if he spontaneously combusted standing up, or was he lying well, down? Well, I, d and I don't know if he combusted? I don't know if he fell over and then caught fire or whatever. I mean, you you never know because the the zammer was at an angle against the. The um the bath, right? Right, but then the feet still didn't get burnt. Very strange. Well, no, but the feet don't get burnt because the feet don't have enough fat. That's the problem. Oh right, understood. Got it. Yeah, because right. it's all just muscle and tendons. Exactly, and tendon tendons are probably the thing that's going to outlast everything, even bone to a degree, because tendons tendons are kind of inert. They're just like straps of rubber. Mm -hmm. I mean, you try chewing one, you know. It takes ages. You can't really chew it. But anyway, <laughs> regardless of that, <laughs> we'll come back to reality. <laughs> Just going off on your cannibalistic fantasy again. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so, uh, what the hell is wrong with Scottish people anyway? <laughs> <laughs> so, so then we've got, we've got, so I think if, if we finish with that, um, hold on. There's one last thing. One last thing. Um, there you go. And this is the advice from South Park. I know you all hate me, but please, for your own sake, fart in moderation. <laughs> so, so their um, their theory was that if you if you just thought, if you just farted, that would stop people self uh, self combusting, but it was going to affect the um, the atmosphere and cause a hole in the ozone layer. <laughs> So they weren't to hold it in, but they weren't to do it all the time. They were just to fart in moderation. <laughs> I mean, the whole the whole thing's ridiculous. But you know, that's that is actually one of the genuine theories as to exp uh, as to how to explain spontaneous human combustion. But no one really, no one really nails it. And I think I may have done it. I think I'm. I'm I mean, I'm not blowing my own trumpet too much here. Well, maybe I am. But I, I think I could be in line for a Nobel Prize here, right? <laughs> With the kind of thinking that's come out of left field. So, have you heard of mitochondria? Uh, yes, of course I have. Right, so mitochondria are the little engines inside every cell that produce the energy that we need to keep living. And they use, you know, they use the fuel that we ingest to do that. And every cell has mitochondria and every fat cell has mitochondria as well. And we have, um, we have a certain degree of brown fat which is fat we're born with, and we're told that really you can't expand or contract that brown fat. That's what you've got, and you'll always have that. And that's stuffed full of mitochondria, and that's why it's brown, because it's got so much mitochondria in it that it turns it brown. Right. And that that fat is purely designed to cause heat, right? It's not there to fuel your muscles or anything like that. All that fat does is cause heat. And they think the idea was that it was there um, for newborns to stay warm until their body got to such a mass 
that it was able to start generating heat properly. Right. Okay. So that's brown fat. And then you get regular fat, which is white or or sometimes beige, because you can, you can you know start to overload. You can tip but through eating different things and doing different things like you know look, you know how you see um what's his name what Wim Hof and all that the cold. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That that can actually start to increase your level of brown, not brown fat, but beige fat, because it makes your fat produce more mitochondria because your body's being shocked to continue to try and produce extra heat. Yeah. And then we get then we we get these new drugs now like Ozempic and other things like that, right? Which are taking advantage of the mitochondria and they're doing what's called uncoupling it. So you're uncoupling mitochondria, and when you uncouple it, what they mean is they are no longer producing energy for you to do your, you know, your day to day life to keep your body ticking over to do to the energy that you need to move to to sustain your heart rate to 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 keep pumping blood and all that. They're not they're not providing that. They're just producing heat. And the thing the the beauty is that heat just can evaporate off. But if you get to the stage where you've got so much mitochondria and you're producing so much heat, could it be, could it be that you are pushing towards spontaneous human combustion? Now couple that, couple that with a keto diet and alcohol consumption. That could be the perfect storm. Well, yeah. It could be, could it? It's, and, it's, and, you know, I'm not just talking through my nose here. No, no, it, it, it holds together. I've, I've been listening to you, and, and it does. Um, mm, the, the, small... theory, the theory does make logical sense for someone who is, isn't that familiar with human bodies and all this kind of thing. But, yeah, I'll give you that one. You do have I, thought, to... I thought you were going to say it. it makes logical sense for someone who isn't on that, that who isn't that logical on most occasions. <laughs> anyway, a little video for us. Right. So, the, and the mitochondria in the brown and the beige fat are just producing heat. I mean, Correct. It, it doesn't they're, do any work. Yeah, they're producing heat, and the reason they're producing heat is we now know that brown fat is very uncoupled compared to uh, other mitochondria. And brown fat, we think, originally was designed to keep infants warm um, before they got enough calories in to sustain their own life. So as you can see, I've taken, I've taken basic sound theory and I've run with it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, think, I think there might be something in this. I think it's something that people should be examining. And I think if you want to, if you want to go out there, any scientists out there that are watching us out of our eleven viewers, <laughs> remember and include me. You know, hit me up for the, and I'll give you my my full details so you can add me to the paper. You know, uh, MS <laughs> MSC <laughs> BA. Uh, yeah, I I don't think that's going to happen somehow. Yeah. So there we go. That's that's my theory. I think I think spontaneous human. I mean, I I think spontaneous human combustion, human combustion does occur, right? On very 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 rare occasions, right? So we're discounting the wick effect stuff. That's that's accidental human con, combustion, I would say. But I think spontaneous human combustion can occur. Um, I don't doubt it. I mean, we know all kinds of crazy things happen all kinds of crazy things can happen in this world. Mm-hmm. So did the possibility that I'm, I don't know, I've seen too much crazy shit and I've heard about equally crazy shit to, to say that these things aren't possible. Yeah. Um, but I, again, it's, it's something that you'd, you'd have to actually see it to believe it for sure. Mm-hmm. But then it's not the kind of thing you ever really want to witness because you'd be scarred for life. <laughs> and it's <laughs> well, definitely not uh, the sort of thing you want to have happen to yourself because being yeah. is, is not that's not, yeah. not a good way th- of going. I think to be fair, most of the people that this happens to are beyond um the point of of feeling, you know. And um, which is a good thing, as you mm. said, because it's just not the way you want to go. Um I mean maybe this is why I'm such a 
you know, see you next Tuesday because I have seen some pretty horrible things in my time. I mean, the, the, one of the one of the one of the worst is soup, right? What's that? We used to call it when you get sent to soup. You know, somebody would phone in and go, "There's a horrible smell coming from the flat night downstairs," and we're like, "Oh no, no." <laughs> And then you'd draw lots as to who had to go because oh, you just knew this was going to be. And, and you know, I, I'm, being, I'm being candid here, right? This is what we were like in the police in the 80s. And you would be drawing lots or if you were the sergeant, you would go, <laughs> you'd send the probationer, right? So go and see what all that's about. And they'd turn up at the door and they'd, you'd open the letterbox and take a tentative sniff. <laughs> <laughs> The sniff test, and I'd be like, "Oh no, that's not good." <laughs> so you then phone in and go, "Yep, it's looking like soup. Should we put the door in?" And and control room would come back and go, "Yeah, put the door in, right?" So we'd put the door in. You'd go in and you'd be like, "Oh my god, right?" And you would head straight to the bathroom, right? Because you just know they died in the bath. And they turned to soup. <laughs> it is one of the grossest, horrible smells and things you will ever see. I... <laughs> Especially when they've been in there for two weeks. <laughs> in the summer. Just disgusting. Even just the thought of it is making me go green. <laughs> that's not... That's not... Ugh. And I'm sure that... I'm sure police still have to deal with that to this day. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Well, yeah, of course they do. Of course. They I wonder do. if they still call it soup. I don't know. I mean, they've probably got some kind of politically correct name for it. Now. <laughs> <coughs> We're good to a couple. <laughs> they probably they they probably give it a number or something. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well, there was a. I mean, there was a whole code system for like sixty three. I think was a sudden death. Yeah, but um, I'm sure the police officers, because yeah. because words like that will get passed down, and I I bet you it'd be really yeah. interesting. It would actually be interesting to ask a serving police officer whether they still call it soup. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you'd probably ask them, and the guy, it, it, it's like if you if you happen to be in a pub, um, and you're talking to a police officer, and you say, oh, <laughs> do, you, "Do you guys still call that thing where you find a dead body soup?" and they probably just go green and throw up a little bit in their mouths. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! Don't you, you? How long does it take you to get the smell of that out of your nose? Oh, oh, it takes ages. You know what used to be really good as well? Spangles. Spangles are brilliant for doing that. I Sp used to. Do you, you remember spangles? No? Right. So spangles were like you were like hard fruit, uh, you know, sweets you would suck. Right. Uh, they sweets. were only sp yeah, they were boiled sweets, but they were small. They were in a square tube. They were called spangles, and they were fruity flavored. But they had a really, they were quite strong, and they were brilliant if you were going to a post mortem or something. Because post mortem smell, you know, I mean, with the best people in the world, even if the body's refrigerated, it still smells. You know, once you start cutting it apart. And um, spangles are good for kids. It's a smell more than anything. It's, it's always the smell that gets you. I Yeah. I'm very fortunate that I've never had to smell anything like that in my life. Yeah, yeah. No but thanks. yeah, yeah, so... Um, this, this is one of the things you don't think about when you join the police. <laughs> is, is having oh, I can deal, tell you horror deal, stories, deal with, mate. Deal with some of the most <laughs> unpleasant smells you're ever going to encounter in your whole life. The I, I mentioned this on one of the shows the other night was the the guy with brittle bone disease that ran into a car on his push bike. His head exploded and bits of brain were found floating in milk on the front passenger seat because uh, the person he hit had just come back from the shops, you know. Uh, <laughs> Things like that, you know, just oh, that's not good. No. Um, people caught in fires. Especially car fires and things. That there, that's just terrific. That is absolutely. I mean, I remember there was one um, in Canvas Lang. There was a horrible crash, horrible crash in the high street, and um, women get trapped in the car, and the car caught fire, and um, nobody could get to her. Couldn't get to her. 
because of the flames. Mm. Um, and the fabricate, even by the time the fabricate turned up, she was, that's, she that's was dead. Horrific. That, yeah, yeah, it was horrific. And and the inspector took everyone back to the office and brought out a bottle of whiskey and gave everybody a shot of whiskey and sat down <laughs> and had a chat with them all, you know, just just for half an hour before everybody went home. And well, these this, days, this is how we did these HR days, in the eighties. Yeah, the, well, yeah, but these, but that works, you know, yeah. because it's a it's a joint experience, and you're all you're all having it, and you need you a know, bloody you know, drink after something like that. Christ and you know you've even got if you to don't go drink, over it. You're gonna have yeah. a shot of whiskey. <laughs> you have a shot of whiskey, and and yeah, everybody gets in the car and drives home, right? Oh, shock horror! You know, it was the fucking eighties. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's everything up until we got we got to the current kind of purple head woke like health and safety fanny brigade yeah, i mean exactly the, the answer to pretty much everything was either a shot of whiskey or a shot of brandy it's like if you if you're in shock oh yeah have a brandy <laughs> it's just like i mean that's <laughs> i'm sorry janet says i'm currently eating chicken kiev one <laughs> one one thing right janet a couple of points one it's it's it, it's 10 to 10 why are you still eating Right. Two. Why the fuck are you eating chicken Kiev? <laughs> Don't we have to call it a chicken Kiev now? Oh well, whatever you want to call it, yeah. No, yeah. I don't. I've never called it that, but I yeah. remember when they changed. We because all the supermarkets changed all the packaging on the chicken. Oh. So we call it chicken Kiev. <laughs> I, I just can't. Oh. I can't get over how everybody can jump to. How everybody can jump to supporting something that, or a country that, it's like actual N A Z I S. I mean, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. And not just that, but some of the worst ones. It's like there are there are the, the Ukrainian N A Z I S. Even the Germans one, German ones, like the worst of the German ones, looked at them and th- said, "I want nothing to do with those crazy bastards." Exactly. I mean, Rod Stewart got a fucking rising I mean, reception in Germany the other day, didn't he? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that was hilarious. <laughs> Absolutely hilarious. It's just... What the... it, it's seeing the, the, the... I don't want to call them the elite, but the ruling classes so utterly and completely out of touch with everybody else. Mm-hmm. And because of the internet, everybody knows what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're still spouting blatant lies, but everybody, oh, yeah. but everybody knows that they're talking out of their asses. Yeah. Um, and and it's just it, it blows my mind sometimes that they can they can still think they can pull it off. I mean, it's just absolute craziness. I know um, that's that's crazy. But yeah, so I I don't know they're going to rename them again. <laughs> <laughs> Because we all know they're going to have to. Did you see? Uh, did you see Putin and um, Kim? Yeah, having a ball in the, <laughs> I in, love the that. in the car. <laughs> yeah, it's like it, it it's, looks. It's... It looks like a, a version of Top Gear that I'd actually watch. Yeah, no, I, th- I thought it was hilarious. But the, the thing is that the one one thing that I've learned interacting with um, Russians on Twitter is that they have an absolutely wicked sense of humour. Yeah. Um. I mean, both wicked as in funny, but wicked as in just slight, slight brittle. Le- yeah, slightly to the left of of being dark and evil. Yeah. Um. But they're absolute masters of the troll, and it's just like that. It was the same with the the the, the hug in. Um. I'm not because I didn't see she she give um uh, Putin give um Kim Jong Un a hug, but oh yeah, I mean, he did. They, did he? Yeah. Cause yeah, they were he like, did the old. Yeah. And I, I mean, they, he didn't kiss, but he did the head movement, you know. Yeah, and and I mean, personally, I I love it because our own governments are on the wrong side of history. Yeah. Um, and there's a peace offer in Ukraine that's mm-hmm. been floated. Everybody basically knows now what the Russians want, and the fact that nobody's sitting down and talking, and they're just throwing. The most recent stat I heard today from the... Alexander Mercurius on the Duran which uh-huh. everybody should be watching and following, by the way. Um, to, no, it wasn't. It was um, Judge Knapp talking to... Everybody should be uh, watching and following Judge oh, Knapp. Oh, yeah. Um, but he was talking to Dr. Gilbert Doctorow, who's one of yeah, the uh-huh. f- foremost experts on Russia. 
Mm-hmm. And he he said that there's two thousand Ukrainians start a day dying. Mm-hmm. I can believe it. I mean, I mean, it, the mainstream media won't tell you that, but no. yeah. And I mean, but, yeah. it's it, it, it. They need to stop. It needs. They're, they're not getting anywhere. They're not going to win. It's just throwing meat into the grinder. And now they're talking about wanting to throw Europeans into the grinder. I mean, where does it end? <laughs> I hope Journey and John's feeling better. He's certainly been more. Um, he's been here for the whole show today, and now he's yeah, slagging. He's slagging our shorts. <sighs> and tell me, tell me, Ed. I mean, you know this man. You know this. I, I'm assuming he's a man. I may be yes. making a, an inappropriate <laughs> assumption, but no, I'm assuming. I've known, no, I've, I've uh, known him for over thirty years. And so tell me, yeah. is he is he the arbiter of sartorial elegance that he purports to be here? He is he really isn't. <laughs> it really isn't. I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to actually go into any details. I'm just going to say, hell no, no, absolutely not. No. If you're maybe if you're if you're a Dutch if you're a Dutch person or Koningsdag, where the whole the whole of the Netherlands turns orange, maybe. Yeah. Oh yeah, um, yeah. I saw that. That's when Lando Norris no. got his head cut. No. Um, what does Vorlon mean? Oh, Vorlons. That's Babylon Five. All right, okay. I'm I still haven't progressed beyond episode one. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, there was actually a Volon in episode one. Oh, was was a Volon? That's he was called. He's called Ambassador Kosh. Is he the lizard guy? No, he's the, he's, he's like a, in a big suit with a big oh. light on the front. Oh, he's not the guy with the big hair. No, no, that's Londo Malari. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> Yeah, see, that, I mean, if it was Battlestar you or Star do, Trek you or something do what like that. I did with Babylon 5 and don't start it at the end of season two and beginning of season three. Okay. And then go back and watch the first season or two once you get into it, because that's where it starts to get really good. And then you'll have a lot of questions that you want to answer, and the questions mostly are answered in the first season. And by that time. <laughs> You're enjoying the story enough that you can put up with all the bad acting and bad CGI and bad sets and cheapness and everything else. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, to be honest, it's one of those stories. It was Babylon Five was ahead of its time. Okay. It's, if you if you had the kind of CGI and stuff that we could do now, um, and you threw some budget at it, like yeah, they did, like yeah. they did with um. I don't know, shows like The Expanse, because if you watch oh, The yeah. Expanse... The Expanse was brilliant. Yeah, but you can see in that there's all sorts of little subtle references and hints to loads of other different sci-fi yes, shows. Yes, there are. There are. Um, and one of those is, is Babylon 5, and, and it is. You, you do have to kind of wade through it a bit. But try, try it again, but start, like I said, start towards the end of the second mm-hmm. season yeah. and the beginning of the, th- the third season. Do you watch um, The Boys at all? Uh, yeah, I did. I, I, I managed to get about halfway through the first season. And I'm sorry, but this whole concept of evil superheroes, uh-huh. it's just more than my inner child can bear. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just, I, 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 I like to believe that there are still heroes in this world. And this whole notion that you have just also cocky, arrogant dicks. Yeah. And the other thing that really puts me off the boys is Carl Urban's god awful sodding Cockney accent. I still, Someone, I, I, I think Carl, Ur- Carl Urban is the best thing about that. I really do think so. Ah, oh, that I just no, I just can't. I, be doing I, with I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I don't mind because I'm not English and I really don't give a fuck what if he sounds genuine or not. He, he I makes don't a, care if he sounds. Genuine. He makes a good effort at it. I no, think. he doesn't. It's rubbish. Oh, who cares? Who cares? It's, Absolute rubbish. Like Dave. Like Dave. He, he <laughs> sounds fine. <laughs> I mean, he's Australian or New Zealander, isn't he? Carol Urban? I've no idea. I don't care. I, I thought he was like, I, I think he's. I mean, I suppose, well, I, I see your point. I suppose it's a bit like uh, Mel Gibson and Braveheart. That's one of the worst fucking yeah. Scottish accents I've ever held. <laughs> Or, or uh, Sean, Sean, Aye, Marin, Sean Marin. Connery trying to be Spanish in um, Highlander. <laughs> uh, what yeah. did he? What did he say in Highlander in Spanish? Oh, I can't remember. 
No, you put me on the spot. I can't I remember Connor. off the top of my head. Fucking but just... Ah, uh, Hollywood, oh. Brandy infused sardines could be part of the solution. Uh, I know how to deal with them. I don't have just put, problems anymore because I put the spikes down. Just put a and little bit of, of sodium uh, inside a, a, no, a, a ball of, no, a ball of paper. No, bicarbonate. I don't want to hurt the bloody girls. I just want to stop them waking me up at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> and the amount of... Uh, literally the amount of times that I've had to tell people on Twitter... I'm not actually going to stop feeding them. I just want them to stop waking me up first thing in the bloody morning. Yeah, but you um, trained them, mate. I, you no, you recorded I, you sorry, you rewarded bad behaviour. It's exactly like what Ben does with his kids. They started tap, <laughs> they started tapping before uh-huh. I started feeding them. It was actually yeah. the guy that came to do my kitchen that started giving them bits of his lunch. Mm-hmm. Um and they are unbelievably persistent you wouldn't i mean even if they're not getting any food they would come two three times a day and start tapping at the window yeah but they, you just, you, eventually they would, they would go away I if you didn't mind, feed them i but don't mind feeding them i just don't want to be feeding them <laughs> at 4 30 in the morning on a for like three <laughs> months of the summer i've got to put i've got to put a comment <laughs> up for you to see ed can you see the comments when i put uh, them up yeah yeah there you go Wait, you put the spikes? <laughs> Shalini, yes, it's, it's on my. Yes, I put spikes on outside my bed, my bedroom window. And, and of course, the first thing I said, I told you this two months ago. <laughs> I didn't want to have to do it, but it it just, especially in the summer. I mean, in the winter, it, it they they come at a fairly civilized hour because they they basically operate with the lights, so you yeah. don't see them until seven eight o'clock, which is fine. Most days, especially when I'm working, and even if I'm, if even if it's weekend, it's still a reasonably civilized time that you've managed to get a few hours proper sleep. But four thirty in the morning, I'm I'm just not I'm not nice to anyone at four thirty in the morning, <laughs> especially not a seagull. Why would you be? Why would you? Um, be? And and I mean, I could have put spikes outside the kitchen window as well, but I didn't because I do. I mean, I do love the little guys, but just not when it's tapping like a meter away from my head at four thirty. That's true. <laughs> there you go. Don't you ever get bored with that? No, no, not at all. <laughs> Why would I? It's just perfect. It's perfect. Uh, yeah. Right. Okay. Um no well, cool. I've had a good evening. No, it's been fun. Yeah. yeah. Was, thank you very much. That's no, good. I've learned a few things as well. It's always nice. Yeah, and and I think I don't think we needed to show all the gory details. I think we did it justice enough in our speech and yeah. our, our wit and repartee. And and gore, and leaving plenty to the imagination. I mean, it's a good thing because if people are eating chicken yeah. keeves while we're well, yeah. on the thing and we're showing pictures of incinerated bodies, I mean, yeah. that you're gonna you're not gonna enjoy your. Although you know. basically. All these pictures of us tend just to look like an ashtray with you know, <laughs> a couple of fags hanging out the end. And a pair of feet. <laughs> yeah, well that yeah, that's what I mean. The you know like the, 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 the feet the feet and lower leg would be the doubts, you know. Oh, <laughs> <dear>. <laughs> You've got, there's actually an idea for a range of garden ashtrays in there. You could do you could do a little ashtray with two feet. And it looks like this incinerator. <laughs> you could. Really, that could be our next merch. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbit hole merch. Would you buy it? Uh, the the um, spontaneous human combustion ashtray. <laughs> People still use ashtrays. Uh, I was actually yeah. astounded the other day because the guy, the guy down the stairs, does uh, car detailing, and I walked down the stairs the other day, and there was a car sitting to be waiting to be cleaned. It was an Audi TT, and the ashtray was fucking overflowing. I, I didn't realize people actually still used ashtrays in their car. In fact, I actually didn't realize cars still had ashtrays. I I have a theory that one of the reasons that the <laughs> People are such a nightmare on the roads is because nobody smokes anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so they've got to get their frustrations out somehow. Well, cigarettes are excellent at dealing with road rage when you're driving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, anyway. Right. Okay. 
Um, thank you very much, Ed. I've had a great time. Thank Me you, too. everyone, that's come along and enjoyed us. Um, um, I'm sure the people that are watching Ben can <laughs> fuck off and watch Ben. Anyway, sorry, yeah, I'm sure they'll watch us later. Um, Don't get jealous but, now, John. No, I'm not jealous, mate. I'm not jealous. <laughs> I'm not jealous. But thanks, yeah. guys. It's been fun. It has been fun. And uh, if you if you like this and want more, like, share, and subscribe. It costs you nothing, but tell other people, and then we can maybe start to build, you know, because we really need to get to 2,000 subs. It's only 200 away, you know, a little bit of a push, you know. Get in there. Give us a push. So um, see you tomorrow night for Chasing Descent All In, um, and we'll be back, as always, next Thursday for Red. And to be fair, we are doing most evenings now at 9 o'clock to try and build the channel. So feel free to drop in any time you like. Ed, have you anything you'd like to mention? No, just to say thank you to everyone who tuned in and I hope you enjoyed the show and thanks for having me on again. Oh, you damn as lovely chap. As always. It's always a pleasure, mate. <laughs> always a pleasure. Likewise, mate. And it's been great for you. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this. I'm just going to have a little chat about the law of one, which is quite a strange thing that I found last night while I was meandering through the YouTubes. And um, it seems to be quite a popular thing. So I'm just going to give it a little bit of a discussion and a little bit of an explanation. Um, it's it's one of those things that is quite spiritual and is alleged to be something that would maybe improve your level of consciousness and possibly lead you to a higher path when it comes to where you're going. And <laughs> the problem is nobody knows. Nobody knows where the hell you're going. I tell you what I'll do though, I'll break down the law of one as I kind of understand it. And you know, this is a I'll, I'll be honest, this is a hi Dread Eye and Julie. Uh, this is a kind of um, a condensed version um, because I haven't spent a lot of time on it. But um, there's a couple of things that worry me about it and um, a couple of things that are quite interesting, you know. So the basis seems to be that there's a galactic consciousness, one galactic consciousness, and we are nothing if not just tiny parts of that that have been selected to inhabit a human in this occasion. Um, and you are undergoing a level of density. So apparently the earth, if you're on, a, if you're a human on earth, you're a, a level three density. Now it goes up to six and it, I don't know if you're meant to get denser. <laughs> that's not a good, that's not, sorry, that's a poor joke. But anyway, um, People, as you progress, you go up the levels, and apparently, um, all this has come about because people got this in a download. They got it in a, a channeling session. The channeling's when someone apparently goes into some kind of trance, and an ultimate being takes over their consciousness, and then spouts forth with the words of that being, and not the person who is, to all intents and purposes, unconscious and unable to remember what has occurred. That's the theory. So um, there was this group um, of physicists and or dodgy scientists hanging about in the 80s, I think. And um, they, they were trying to do the channel and thing and not doing very well, but they were all men. And then a woman joined the group and at that point, channeling occurred. And she channeled um, Ra. Yeah, yeah, that Ra, the one from Egypt. So she channeled Ra, who turns out to be um, a level six density that has that has um, gone beyond the need for uh, a corporeal body. So he's, or I say he, but I only use it as a, a pronoun. <laughs> so, but so he exists. Good evening, Natalie. He, he exists as a, a corpo he, he exists without corporeal form, and um, in the, the form of energy. And therefore, he's channeling his thoughts through this um, this lady. Oh, good grief! I'm terrible with names these days. I'm turning. I really am turning into Joe Biden. But moving on. 
So he channels this to the group, and um, <laughs> his, his story is that he's a level six being. Um, they evolved something like 2.6 billion, yeah, 2.6 billion years ago on Venus um, when it was a very Earth like planet. And they, they have a, they evolved into level six beings, so they no longer need a planet or such and are part of the galactic mind. And he's come back to give us some and more information about what's happening in the world just now, which is always useful because, let's face it, there's a lot happening in the world just now and we don't quite know what's going on. Uh, so, um, <laughs> yeah. So, so Ra is apparently the one that um, was there in Egypt along with the nine other gods or whatever who would turn out to be um, evolved humans from Venus. I think they're still everybody. Apparently, everybody in the galaxy is human or has a human form. So there are aliens out there, but they're humanoid aliens. Um, but and they're all on different levels of density. I know. Bear with me. Bear with me. It gets better. <laughs> it sounds like an Elrond Hubbard movie. What? What did that turn into? Oh, oh, oh no, no. We don't want to go there. They're very litigious. They'll sue us. <laughs> so, so I been. <laughs> so, so I need way to get through that stream, mate. I really, really do. So, so, so we now have um, Ra channeling all this information through, and somebody's writing it down. And this guy Don Don Elks writes a book, along with the young lady who was a channeler. Um, he turned out he was a professor in California, and she was one of his students in the early sixties. Um, so. The whole thing starts to get a bit weird. And anyway, they write this book and they write down these prophecies. that, And they write these prophecies down in the late 80s, early 90s. And a lot of them look like they're coming true, you know, because they, kind of, they kind of did foretell the the uh, World Trade Center thing. The, the kind, see, the problem is, the problem is most of these things are, are written in such a way that they're open to interpretation. It's like Nostradamus's prophecies. You can interpret them any which way. So any anyway, this is the this is the basis, and people have taken this and run with it. And now that they're, they're kind of it, it's become quite popular. This um, the the law of one. And now that they're, they're trying to differentiate it into two different types now. So you have. The left hand path, which is basically um the the self service route, i.e. you serve yourself. So you go through all the different phases of density, but you're only ever serving yourself. You're looking after number one. And and then there's the other group, the the you know, service service to all, service to mankind, service to humankind, service to the galactic consciousness. And they are the people that are more enlightened and progress further along the path of densities, even beyond six in that in these occasions. So the question is what's what? Because one they look at the self service route and call that the negative path, and they look at the the service of to all route and call that the, the positive path. And it seems to be that if you go down the route of service to all, you are you are giving more than receiving. You you you're forgiving people. You're loving them, whatever. But how does that translate to the real world? How would you see someone who was in this state of enlightenment or going down this path? How would that translate to someone who's living in the real world? Because if you look at if you look at what happened over the last couple of years and you think about people that um that didn't challenge anything right and you think well they're they're the they're the service to all group but they're probably not because what they're doing is they're just looking after themselves by thinking they're looking after the herd but they're not they're looking after themselves because they're frightened and they were making decisions i think based on their own personal fear and and you know anger 
and sadness. So they were making they were making negative decisions. And therefore, I think they are in the service of self group. You know, they're the selfish ones, if, if you could call them that. And I think the people that challenged what was going on and spoke out against it, many of them are in the service to all group, but some of them aren't. Some of them, some of them are in the self service group. And, and you know who I'm thinking of people like um, people like Dr. John Campbell, you know, who started off very much on the mainstream uh, on the mainstream what would you say narrative and then kind of switched especially when his youtube channel took a massive hike massive hike in views you know like went from you know seven eight thousand views or whatever per video to like two million and then his his view kind of changed and he gravitated towards serving people that had a more questioning outlook but when he did that his actual examination of the science and the data went awry because a lot of what he did say in support of the group that were challenging you know and tr are trying to support them actually turned out to be questionable and not quite verifiable. So was he serving himself by really searching for likes and views and therefore, you know, bringing in a substantial amount of revenue? Because when you go from 7,000 views of video to 2 million views of video, you, and it, let's just say, I mean, on a low score, you know, five bucks, five bucks, a thousand views, you know, so times that by 2 million. Well, divide two million by five and then times it. <clears throat> um, right. So let's have a look at um. So that that's kind of what I'm I'm understanding as the law of one, and and you know there are people out there who've gone into this in great detail and looked through it, and I think I think the problem is that. When you actually look at how it came about and the channeling and things like that, it does look a bit dubious. And then there's this doctor that was involved, this Dr. Prunry or something. This this is the guy who kind of was a, he was kind of the, 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 um, the protege of Stranger Things, if you think about it, because he gathered a group of teens or children and started doing psychological experiments on them to bring out their, their psychic abilities. And took them to a lab in you know new york upstate new york or something like that which strangely enough burned down and then he disappeared to mexico and then he hooked up with this guy don elks who was a professor who and the girl who was the channeler and then they ended up producing all that stuff so the whole thing starts to look a bit sus doesn't it look it starts to, and then they write a book and the book gets published and you know it starts to look as if people are just trying to take, make money off of this but then someone says, well, the, what they are, are, you know, one theory is that they are actually trying to promote an alternative religion as such to make us question, you know, the, the current religions and, and fall into uh, being directed by the state. Now, I think there's easier ways of doing it than trying to come up with some, some space-based giant brain. I may well be wrong. But, um, and, and let's see, let's see what we've got in the comments. So, oh, lots of people in the comments now. So, good, good, good. Uh, grifting for profit? Yep, yep. I think it could well be grifting for profit. God damn, the thousands that have been pumped into our two channels. It will take years to see any return, let a lot of profit. Indeed. Indeed it will. <sighs> so, I think I think the problem with all these spiritualism and all these different channels and things like that is you're looking for something that you can't find outside yourself. And I might I might sound a bit airy fairy here, but bear with me because thinking about this, if you're going to find enlightenment, you're not going to find it on a mountaintop. You're not going to find that you know sitting in a sauna, being burst um, by some you know big-breasted Swedish lady or whatever. 
you're not going to find enlightenment that way. You're not going to find enlightenment at the at the foot of a, at the, you know, kissing the feet of a monk. Um, you're not going to find enlightenment by fasting yourself and starving yourself for weeks or days on end. I don't think that's how you find enlightenment. I think you find enlightenment by looking into yourself and becoming, becoming at one with your own thoughts and understanding who you really are. I think that's a more likely path to enlightenment. But I may well be wrong. I am absolutely, it, it's getting hot up here now, Ben. Um, you must have transferred something. <laughs> Sora sounds like a great idea. <laughs> There's the Sora in, her, in his hotel in September going to use it. Yes, well, I, I'm giving me the address of the hotel and I'll arrange for a big breasted Swedish room. <laughs> Oh, humid, Ray. Oh, hello, Ray. Good to see you. Um, I saw you. Um, I saw you on Twitter earlier, and uh, I think I agreed with one of your points, which is great. And I, I like Ray because Ray challenges you to think, actually, because he doesn't agree with everything you say, and and we obviously have quite different views on occasion, but it's always civil. Um, I mean, I don't know what he says offline, but he's always civil online. Um, it's the same with Ed, you know, Ed and I have disagreed quite vehemently on occasion, but, you know, if you agreed with everything that everyone said, it would be a pretty boring world. And how are you meant to progress? If, I mean, it's like, say you're a tennis player, right? And you only play people that are worse than you. How are you ever going to improve? You know, you're never going to get beat. So you think you're the greatest tennis player in the world. You never get beat. You don't improve. And then you go into a tennis tournament and you get humped, you know? because you're actually rubbish. It's just you've been playing with really rubbish people. So how can you ever hope to improve if you only pit your brains against people who are mental idiots? I think you've got to um, and, and agree with you all the time. And that's why, I think that's why Twitter to me has become a completely broken platform because, and people talk about this all the time, their timeline. You don't have a timeline in Twitter unless you're spending, you know, hours and hours and hours carefully curating the people that you follow and then only watching their tweets. And if you're doing that, you're sad because then you're only getting people that are going to agree with you and, and you're only going to get an echo room on online. And I don't think that's a good thing to have. And... All these, I mean, Twitter used to be the best of the worst when it came to social media because you could always find an argument on it. Now it seems to go one way or the other because at the moment, whenever I'm on Twitter, it's absolutely full of people that are, that are you know, they're, they're, they're promoting Farage as a, a, basically a Russian agent. I mean, that's all I'm seeing on Twitter just now, you know? And it's like this... They're talking about things that we put to bed two or three years ago. And everybody, I thought everybody had come to the consensus that, yeah, you know, America are bad when it comes to putting its, its hands on other countries' business. And it's like, you know, we're back, we're back at square one. It really is like Groundhog Day. And, and sometimes I think this might be something that is sent to try you by the galactic brain, you know? Maybe this is a learning point that you've got to understand that people are inherently stupid. And, um, and or it might be that some of us are getting more advanced and, and I'm not trying to be smug because ego, if you have, if ego is, um, is not, and ego is not really a, it's not an, a particularly attractive quality, is it? When you, when it gets too big, you know? Um, when you've got to widen doors for it, you know, and, and knock down summer houses and rebuild them as bigger ones, you know, then ego doesn't become particularly attractive when you're getting to that stage, I don't think. But I may be wrong. Uh, <laughs> so, so Ben's, Ben's obviously missed that one. Hi, Emma. <laughs> Okay. That's a dig at him. He says he needs a bigger summer house. <laughs> it ties his ego. Um, 
um, what's Natalie saying? Natalie's saying plenty here. Let's have a look at this. So people are quick to blame others for their unhappiness and their problems. Many are not willing to take accountability for them. Exactly, Natalie. That is very, very true. People don't take accountability for their own actions, lives, and they don't make changes that need to improve their own situation. That's... The, you're 100% correct, my dear. You are 100% correct. And that's one of the biggest problems in the world today And that people seem to feel entitled and seem to think that they're entitled to things without doing anything to help themselves. And, you know, we're not without our problems. We all have our individual foibles and, and issues. And I think if you come to recognise that you are not perfect... Um, it might be a shock to some people, but when when you come to recognise that you're not perfect and and maybe um, you need to look into yourself a little bit, is that another step on the path to enlightenment? You know, because if you think about it, your your dog has nothing, right? I mean, you might you you might have bought it a chew toy or something, but your dog basically lives the life of a dog. It's high spot of the day is probably going for a walk with you. Where it's out in the fresh air and it's running about, but you're there as well. Because dogs are pack animals, they like to have company. And then you go home and feed it and that's the second high spot of the day. And then it's third high spot of the day is probably lying down and having a nap. Well, you pet it or don't, as the case may be. But, you know... But that animal's probably pretty damn happy most of the time. It's probably a bit anxious when you leave it alone for any length of time. Well, when a dog, dogs don't really have a great sense of time, or what appears they don't have a great sense of time. So they, I think they can they can suffer from separation anxiety quite easily and and um, and get quite anxious. Um, but as long as you've proven that you will come back. They generally settle down and, and, and calm down. So a dog doesn't really have anything, but it's a pretty happy existence. Now, it may be that a dog's not terribly self-aware, which is probably true, but it doesn't stop it being happy. And why should you being self-aware stop you being happy? Because why do you worry why do you sit here and worry about things that you can't change you know oh if i'd done this if i'd done that well you didn't okay so and and uh, i mean don't get me wrong i used to do this as well i used to think oh if i'd done that this would have happened and then you know i would have had a better life and and but there's no point there is no point in crying over spilt milk there's no point in going back over past mistakes unless it's to learn from them and not to repeat them. Um, but once you've done that, once you've learned the lesson, there's no point in continually going back over it and going, what if, what if? Well, what if I'd bought a lottery ticket last night and it had come up and I'd won millions of pounds? What would I have done? What, what would really have changed in my life other than the fact that I would have money? Is money going to make me happy? It's going to give me things and it's going to allow me to go places, but is it really going to make me happy? What what would really change? Would I still do this? And I actually like to think I still would do this. I might not do it here. I might do it in nicer surroundings. But ultimately, nothing's really going to change there. So that's not something to strive towards, is it? What you want to strive towards is being effectively happy you know do you want to be able to does it matter if you can buy a new car next uh, next year does it really if the old one's going fine who cares um so so maybe we do predicate ourselves too much on status and materialism and and maybe we should take a step back and think about you know don't don't try and search for things that are temporary. Um, you know, if you if you like, for instance, I mean, I bought I bought a new motherboard recently for my computer because, to be honest, the computer was really slow, but that computer was built. What well, that computer was built in twenty seventeen. You know, I built it myself with parts. So to replace a motherboard and CPU, you know, some seven years later, I think is fairly good value. And 
not terribly unfrugal. Oh, am I driving people off? Is Emma away as well? Oh, she's got to go and do physio. Oh, sorry, Emma. Oh, right. Uh, so, I, I, I'm not trying to put people off or something. I'm just having a kind of, what would you call it? I'm just vomiting up my um, experience or thoughts um, for you. For, for you. Um, because you're there and you're listening to me. Thank you. I don't know why you're listening to me, but thank you. And if you are listening to me and you like what you're hearing, then you could like, share and subscribe because that costs you nothing and it helps us to grow the channel. So I'm not... I was listening to a guy last night, um, Aaron, Aaron Ackby, and he was talking about the law of one, and he he'd, he's done quite a few videos on it, and he's going through it in a big thing, and he's telling you all about the densities and progressing and all that. And then he started talking about kundalinis and stuff like that. And then he started talking about <laughs> if you withhold, if you withhold your sexual urges, right? Um, and he always said this is more for males than females, obviously. But um, so if you if you are withholding your um, your sexual urges and and the the the, the richness <laughs> from the product that you're not expelling um, will eventually make its way into your cerebral spinal fluid and up into your brain, where it will trigger extra development and stuff like that, and then. At some point, you may feel excess cerebral spinal fluid dripping down the back of your throat, which could be salty. <laughs> and I'm thinking, whoa, I don't think there's any medical basis for what he's saying. I don't think cerebral spinal fluid drips down the back of your throat. Now, I might be wrong, right? But I can't see how that, uh, how can there be, I don't think there's a hole, you know? It's not like there's um, there's a hole through to your brain from the top of your throat, is there? I think your sinuses are sealed off. You know, they call it the blood-brain barrier for a reason. You know, nothing's supposed to get in there. Yeah, <laughs> Ray said he saw that guy he was nuts. <laughs> there are a few of them, mate. There are a few of them out there. And at first glance, these people seem really plausible, and you think, yeah, that sounds quite reasonable. And then you start thinking, and then when he came out with that, I went... Nah, 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 you've lost me now, mate. You've lost me now. And um, these other guys like Billy Carson and Terence, um, what's the other guy, Terence? Oh, God. The, 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 the Terence guy, he's completely off his rocker. And Billy Carson's not far behind them. I think, they, and they, the thing is, they sound plausible. And they start off, they lull you in because they, you know, they sound like they're talking a good game and and you think, well, maybe there might be something in this and and then you start digging into it and go, No, I don't I don't think this is real. I think these people are either grifters or well, I actually I do. I'll 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 say that. They're not or they are grifters. I think that's all they are. They're trying to they're trying to make a kind of it's like an ancient aliens type thing, you know, you're making something out of nothing. And I don't think um I don't think it's fair because there's a lot of vulnerable people out there, isn't there? There's people that need to have something, and you can see that. You can see that by things like QAnon and the Truther movement and all that, and all the people that grasp onto every conspiracy going because they need something, right? They, they can't have nothing, so they have to grasp onto all these things. And, and I find that quite, it's quite horrible to take advantage of these people and, and use them, really. And leave them at the end of the day with no further forward. Generally, I mean, it's like religion. I mean, this is this is basically religion. This is what religion does, isn't it? You know, and and if you think about it, you shouldn't have to listen to anyone to tell you to believe in a religion. Because if if you want to believe, if you think there's a religion, if there was a religion, if there is a god out there. Surely he would have some, surely there should be some means of communication. And I don't mean like a voice in the head, but 
There should be something that would draw you towards that without you having to go to church, without you having to be browbeaten into it by priests or nuns or, you know, imams or whatever. Why do these people have to instill into children, you know, the belief in a, a, a deity? Why can't you just let people come to you? Because then your religion's not going to work, is it? Is it? I think you're better teaching people how to think for themselves, how to think critically, how to examine and, and weigh up pros and cons than you are trying to tell them that there is a deity up there that's looking out for them. But if you do something bad, he'll just cast you off and send you to hell, you know? And that goes for all, all the stories are the same there, really, you know? If you're not, the, if you're not good, you don't go up. Yeah. Yeah, they're all kind of much the same. So that's not much of a forgiving person, is it? It doesn't seem like a very nice guy. And that's maybe why you have to browbeat children into believing these things when their minds are still forming and they still don't have any strong opinions. Because if they did have opinions, then they probably would choose not to do it. Yeah. Slim, yes, indeed you're right. Pseudo intellectuals always sound good. Yeah, they do. They do. I mean, I'm I, I I'm sitting here pontificating. You know, people might tune into this and go, "Well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's a pseudo intellectual and he's talking shite." And and I may well be, but I'm not purporting to tell you anything. I'm only I'm only explaining what I've seen and what I think. I've always allowed you to make it, and when I say allowed, I mean encouraged you, and, and Ben and I are the same, we've always encouraged you to make sure that you make up your own mind, do your own research. You know, if you think something's wrong, then fine. If you think we're right, then fine, that's that's great, because mostly we are. <laughs> Apart from that. <laughs> uh, what's uh, Natalie saying? Yeah, important to try and live in the present, be grateful for everything we do have in our lives, not focus on the past, future, and what we don't have. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, you you can you can look to the future to a degree, I suppose, but you know, you won't you won't get necessarily you won't get what you're thinking you might get out of it if you focus on it too much, because you may build it up into a situation where it's never going to fulfill its um, it's never going to fulfill the the dream that you've you've managed to craft for yourself. Yeah, Ray, I, I find that as well. I'm always right as well, especially when I'm not. Um, no, except when I'm not. Yeah. Right, I'm going on a diet tomorrow. I've had enough of this nonsense. I'm way too fat. Look at this. I've got an extra chin down here. More chins than a Chinese phone book. Anyway, uh, right. Where are we now? We've been talking. Good grief, we've been talking for 35 minutes. Oh, I watched the Grand Prix today. What a snore fest. It didn't rain. It didn't rain. Lando Norris didn't win, he was second. George Russell was leading again. Oh, God. The plastic spaz was <laughs> managed to get into the lead at one point. Um, and Hamilton was third, ultimately. So it tended out Lando. Lando Norris, Max Verstappen. No, Max Verstappen, Lando Norris, then um, Hamilton. So, you know, it mixed it up a bit, but normal service resumed. Verstappen still on top. Yeah, I, I, I no worry, no worries, Ray. I, I, it was pretty, it was pretty boring, mate. Um, and Lando couldn't even catch him towards the end. So yeah, if Lando hadn't had a bad start, it might have been better. And uh, everybody else was terribly unexciting. You know, Ferrari were not really in it. Um, they kind of, they were kind of just above the middle and behind the leaders, so they weren't really a threat to anyone. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a bit boring. Um, I, I believe Scotland's playing Hungary just now, so this was the crunch game. I think they've got to win this. Yeah, I think they've got to, if they win this, I think they go through. Apparently they've been voted the, um, 20, Euro 24's best fans. 
Yeah, well, which would be nice. If we get nothing, at least we get the best fans. <laughs> yeah, I've been to I've been to Barcelona away. Um it it it's better now than it used to be. When they had that chicane you couldn't overtake at all. Because you can never stay close behind the car going onto the straight. Uh, are they drawing in the game just now, uh, Natalie? Is it like 1-1 one, one or something, or 0-0? Zero, zero? I think if they beat Hungary, they'll be all right. Oh, if they've got to beat Hungary and Germany has to beat Switzerland, I think that's a, something like that. Yeah. yeah, the food can be nice in Barcelona. Indeed, the tapas can be good. Uh, you got to watch out for pickpockets, though. You could say that of most big cities, though, couldn't you? So, anyone, um, how's life been today for you all? I hope you all had a good day. I've had quite a, I've had a fairly relaxing day because I kind of pulled a muscle on my leg. Oh, it's nil nil at the moment. Uh, hopefully the stick went by and managed to limp through, but no, in Scotland we won't. Uh, I'm not sure there's anything more I want to say about the law of one. I think, um, I think really it's kind of, it's kind of fad. There seems to be a lot of these trends just now, doesn't there? That people are jumping on the, there is a bit of desperation in people because I think they need some kind of light at the end of the tunnel. And the problem is, when you look at what's actually going on in the world, the light at the end of the tunnel isn't very bright. So yeah, I think um, I, I, I'm not trying to put, I'm not trying to bring you down. I'm just saying, you know, be careful when you look at all this stuff. And it's like, I mean, it's like all these things like Bigfoot and. Skinwalker Ranch and all that, they all seem very good when you initially look at them, but once you start digging down into the detail and you start finding out things that maybe don't quite gel and people are changing stuff and, you know, making stuff up, not a lot. You haven't missed much, mate. I've just been talking nonsense about living life and not, um, not trying to... Not trying to um to wish for too much. The espresso mechanic, dig into the detail, you'll find the devil. Indeed you may. You may indeed. El Chupacabra. <laughs> There's just so many that I mean the Jersey Devil, that's a good one, isn't it? You know. The Jersey Devil, the Pine Barrens of uh, New Jersey. You always think in New I see I always think in New Jersey is just like you know, casinos and things because it's right beside New York and it's, it's, but New Jersey is called the Garden State for a reason because it's full of those that thing called the Pine Barrens is massive. Absolutely massive. The Thunderhawk. Yeah. I saw that, um, I don't know if you've ever watched Mud Fossil University, I watch it quite often, um, because that guy, I like, I like Roger's enthusiasm, um, I, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure I'm convinced by his Mud Fossil theory though, especially when it comes to gravity, because you can't have things that size, you know, he's talking about people that were like a hundred feet tall, and you can't have that, you just can't have it, because <laughs> You can't, you, you can't pump the blood up to their head. It just can't be done, you know. Mothman Prophecies was quite good, yeah. I, I used to love all the old Hammer Horror movies as well because I love the way, I love the way they start slow and build, you know, like the thing started slow and builds to a crescendo. Um, nowadays... Horror movies are just like the the slasher gore, slasher gore, slasher gore, and they're really not terribly well thought out. They don't have a big, they don't have a high degree of suspense, which is quite disappointing. Um, but is that an indication of the society that we're living in? You know, the the instant gratification. Show me now, and sometimes I actually get, I find myself, you know, 
getting to a point where I'm watching something on YouTube and I'm going, no, that's nonsense, and skip to something else, and then I go, no, that's nonsense, and that skips on. And I'm only giving it like one or two minutes, and I'm thinking, good grief. You know, if people if people do that to us, no wonder we don't give views. <laughs> Because why would you why would you dip into this and stay? <laughs> You'd be like, what's this guy waffling about? Get to the point, man. Get to the point. And the thing is, I don't have a point. That's the problem. This is um this is one of these rambles, you know, that you have on a Sunday night. Usually when you're um, got your feet up um at the fire with a brandy and a stout pipe. No, <laughs> I don't smoke a pipe. Lizard people, lizard people, yeah. Well, the lizard people, they live inside the hollow earth, don't they? Yeah, I think that's um, that's the only route for them, I think, lizard people, inside the hollow inside the hollow earth, along with the Nazis, <laughs> with the secret Nazi base. <laughs> oh. 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 Eh. Uh, Right, um, what else? Anything else we want to talk about? I think I think we've pretty much done everything. Um, I, mean, I, I mean, some parts of that law of one thing, some parts of it I kind of, I like the concept of a galactic consciousness, but I wouldn't say galactic, it would probably be universal. And of course it does go on to explain things like, or not explain, it goes on about how everything is connected and, you know, everything touches everything else. And that kind of is true to a degree because, you know, I mean, the cells that your body are made of were forged in some star somewhere in space at some point and not necessarily the star that you can see in the sky. So those atoms came from somewhere, you know, um, which is all quite interesting, really. So you are a child of the stars indeed. Remember that. You are a child of the stars. Take that thought with you as you go about your business. It's been great for you. Good evening, one and all. Welcome to Down the Rabbit Hole with Ed and, Ed and John. Good evening, you go. John. Good, Good evening, evening, Ed. Audience, if this, yeah, there are people here. Hello. Yeah, there's quite a few people here. I've got 13 concurrent viewers at the moment, which is more Amazing. than normal that's good i'm pleased i'm pleased this pleases me i look do i look pleased <laughs> you never look pleased <laughs> you're like you're like perma grump <laughs> perma grump i have um i have a new persona <laughs> called the grumpy scott in which i'm going to be reviewing stuff um it didn't it didn't go well so no, so no difference from what you normally do <laughs> yeah pretty much pretty much maybe slightly more acerbic but anyway um, More acerbic, bloody yeah. hell. Well, yeah, just a lot. Just a, a bit poor. A bit if, if, <laughs> if you get any more acerbic, you're going to acid your way through your bloody chair. <laughs> I am. A, well, actually, that's weird because I've got a story to tell about aliens tonight. <laughs> I was going to say, if you if you cut your finger, does it drip down through the floor and into the next floor and <laughs> keep going? <laughs> <laughs> right so tonight we're gonna well i mean if you're here looking for um for some world shaking breaking news you're in the wrong place because <laughs> ed and i are just going to talk shy that's kind of what we do um but i, th I think we're getting quite accomplished at it ed um, i like to call it a friend of mine when that's why i set up codshit.com mm -hmm. because it, a friend of mine many years ago uh, for my birthday gave me couple of t-shirts that had codshit.com on them mm -hmm. and he came up with the most amazing strap line serious nonsense with a hint of genius i like that i like that um, but it's yeah it's codshit and for yeah the, for the for people who don't know codshit's got nothing to do with food with fish or what comes out of your bottom it's what people talk when they are completely <laughs> off their tits at three o'clock in the morning after a rave in some random house party talking to a stranger about the intricacies of whatever <laughs> it's a bit like that show then really yeah pretty much 
Pretty much. Right. So right. tonight tonight we're going to talk about dreams. Well, we're going to start talking about dreams and um, states of mind, states of the brain, states of the neurological functions of the brain. Now, we won't be heavy on science because we aren't neuroscientists, but we do have brains. So I think we're entitled to go in to talk about them. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think I think having a brain <laughs> entitles you to talk about it, especially when when you think about all of the strange things that brains See, they, they, they go do. They're asking already, can you bring your volume up a bit? Oh, for crying out loud. Get that mic right in that gob. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? Is that better? Do I need to talk a bit louder? I can sit here and shout like I'm talking on some 1980s telephone call to my old man in Zambia. <laughs> the, the, that's better. Brett Mate says good, good. See, I did tell him before the show started. I said, get that mic in yeah, before I the know. show starts. Oh, crying out loud, it's this microphone. <laughs> I don't know. Nobody else complains about it. You you it's were lot. you did make it you made inquiries a few um a few months ago now about actually buying a microphone, but nothing seems to have come to uh, that. yeah. Things get in the way. And I mean I, you kinda uh, seem to be doing this as a kind of regular thing now. Well, I'm, I'm, a world, I'm a world-class expert in both procrastination, procrastination. And, and, yeah, my specialities are procrastination and, and drinking. <laughs> no, and I'll right. testify to both of those. I've seen them both in action this evening already. I'm fairly good at writing computer code as well. <laughs> oh, that's good. I, see, I, I'm actually quite surprised with you because, I, and this is completely off topic, but I thought you might have been a Linux guy, you know? I've used Linux. I, I mean, I, I can, I managed Linux servers myself for quite mm. a few years when we, before we offshored our servers to um, an external company and, and they were um, experts in our application server, but they're a Windows shop. So we yeah. switched over to Windows. I, I think the problem for, for general everyday use is Windows just so freaking convenient that it's mm. almost, almost the only choice, you know? Because it, yeah, everything, I mean, everything's available on it, you know. Yeah, and and I mean that's that's the the main thing is the availability of various software packages that I need. And I mean some some are, can be used on Linux quite happily. Um, yeah. And, and there's others that, that I struggle a bit. But I'm also a lazy bastard. I don't feel yeah. like I'm switching my whole bloody system over to Linux. I know. And every everything is more effort. It's just like, um, and it's less effort now because of the the distros and stuff and everything's gotten so much better in the linux world um but i'm just fundamentally a very lazy person <laughs> yeah yeah no yes i am still on the water so you need um I, 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 as you can see though i have pushed the boat out tonight i put a slice of lemon in it <laughs> oh making it exciting yeah you should, you I mean, should try you should try bubbles and lemon well it's, it's carbonated water it's, oh yeah no well, that's yeah it's actually know. It, and this is going to sound quite gay, but it's actually half and half because I find f carbonated water is too carbonated for me. <laughs> so gay. It's too, too many bubbles for you. Uh, too many uh, bubbles. Dear. I don't like too many bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyway, let's um, let's crack on with the show, shall we? Since we've well well overrun the start now. Um, oh, good grief! It's warm here. It's, but although. When I say it's warm here, it's not that warm. Now, I, I went for a little walk today. I was going to put a video up earlier. I went for a little walk in a graveyard and took some footage and all that and then got back and found that the footage wasn't there. All I had was one picture. How did you manage that? Oh, it was this stupid device here, right? This thing, right? Right. I've had this for many a year. This is the original, not the Pocket 3. Don't think I've got money. Don't per perish that thought. I don't have money. Uh, I bought that when I had money. But uh, yeah, so I thought, oh, I'll give it a shot. And I went out with it and started filming and wandering around. And uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. I ended up with one picture. It's it said it was recording, but it's recorded one picture. Not, <laughs> not moving pictures. So uh, there yeah, we go. So, so I'll try again tomorrow. I, I had that happen so many times with my GoPro when I was diving. Um, the new the new one's better because I've got I've actually got a screen, but the old one was the original GoPro. It didn't have oh. even have a viewfinder on it. So it was all Oh yeah, yeah. Um you kind of shoot oh, it was, blind. It was a time. pure guesswork, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. I used I used to do GoPro on the bike when I was doing my you know 
traveling across Europe and all that. And I had one on the back and one on the front and I had a remote control. So, you know, you, you know how you could buy a GoPro remote and I mm. just used to push the button to start them. And you did maybe one would start, right? And then you'd say, oh, that one's not running. So you'd push the button again, which would turn the first one off. And then the second one would start. So you end up in this loop where, ah, pull the batteries out of the things, start again, you know? <laughs> and the oh, thing is, they're in, waterproof, they're in waterproof containers. So, you you know, you've got to, oh, just, and the batteries only last for, or they only used to last for like under 30 minutes. They were rubbish. They really, I mean, pictures were okay, um, but. Battery, battery life was shocking, shockingly bad. Well, it's still not amazing, but the batteries have gotten significantly better, but they're now, they're now shooting 5K. So... Why? Uh, it's well, a shit lens. It's... Uh, it's a little four, teeny four shitty video. lens and a little teeny shitty sensor. I mean, 4K video looks amazing, but it's so much hassle to work with. The file sizes are ridiculous. You need a really powerful computer to process mm. the video. The whole yeah. thing is just an exercise in shut up and take my money kind of thing. Yeah, I know. And, and to be fair, a good 10K looks looks almost as good as 4K to the naked eye. Not many people can tell the difference. No. Um, I mean, cert certainly 4K is... I, I, I mean, I remember when 1080p came out, mm -hmm. and that was pretty damn good if you grew yeah. up with a, with a CRT TV. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and I mean, 4K now, it's almost just like having a window. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, 8K and whatever, you know, why would you? The only reason to go 8K is if you're a professional and you want to crop in. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, that's uh, the only reason. Or like drone photographers or intelligence yeah. agencies. Yeah, these, you, these you want to crop into, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, forget that. Right. And, and we, we will be coming on. To, and bear with us, people. We will start the show. We will. <laughs> but uh, we will be talking about intelligence agencies tonight because. It's incredible the amount of information the CIA have on everything. <laughs> yeah. They really put their finger in everybody and everything's pie. They really do. Right. Um, let's start. Let's start. Dreams, dreams, dreams. Okay. So uh, now Ben, ben tells us he doesn't dream. I think he, he does dream. He just doesn't remember it. Um, I don't. Well, we all dream. It's yeah. about whether you remember them or not. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think I, mean, I, I I smoke a lot of you know what. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't dream, and I kind of like it that way because otherwise yeah. my nightmares were when I was a kid. I used to have horrible, horrible nightmares, um, and even now, I mean, with me, it's first thing in the morning. If I wake up like to go to the loo and then go back to sleep, yeah, quite often it's that period that I'll have uh, the most the most I'm vivid dreams. The hypnagogic state where you can probably still hear the odd gull tapping on the window, but you're oh, still no, out. no, they can't do that anymore. They, yeah, well, they know, can tap on the kitchen window, but that's just like that's yeah, but you know where I am. That that state, that that halfway land yeah. between not fully awake and not mm. fully asleep, and that's where you get all your best work done, apparently. If you're a dreamer, well, I mean, it's it's the period that the brain is most active, but I mean, the the, the brain itself. It is, is an unbelievable thing. I mean, to start with, why do we dream? I mean, I've always liked to think Oh, good of question. I mean, why do we I, sleep? Well, we sleep because the, when we're asleep, that's that's the period that your body repairs itself. Your body doesn't do any repairing during the day, generally why not? speaking. But if, I mean, if, if you lay back and just went, oh, I think I'll just take a couple of hours with my feet up on the couch and watch the telly, why is your body not repairing itself then? Well, if you actually fall asleep, I think you, you have to get into a into a particular state, like REM sleep, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, why? Why? Why do you think? Why do you think? Well, it because when, when we're when we're actually moving around during the day, our body's processes are, are basically you're digesting food, mm -hmm. you're breathing more more regularly. Um, your brain is much more active. I think it's. I think. The well, thing with sleep, you might be surprised there. No, okay. that, 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 that's quite interesting, but you might be surprised about the activity in the brain. Certain parts of it are much more active because it does appear to be that as you go to sleep, some parts dull down and other parts spark up. So parts that weren't terribly active during the day then seem to become really active when you're sleeping. 
Well, I, the way that I've always thought about it, and this this may well be inaccurate, but when you actually think about it, every single thing that your senses detect over the course of a day is processed by your brain. Everything you see, everything mm -hmm. you hear, yeah. everything yeah. You, everything you touch, every um, it's like the touch of the wind on the skin. All of those sensations, everything goes into your brain, and if that stuff was constantly, because we've got different types of memory, oh, um, we, yeah, we've okay. got we've got the sort of, and we've also got our subconscious, but we have long term memory, short term memory, mm -hmm. etc. And if all of the stuff that we experience was clogging up the internal memory, it's like a computer. If every single thing running on the computer was running in RAM all the time, you would have no RAM, and the RAM is like our um, is is the the short term memory, and then you have your long term memory, which is the hard disk. And the way that I've always thought about it is that when we're asleep, that's the period that our brain essentially clears stuff out of short term memory, mm -hmm. puts it into long term memory, analyzes it, and I think dreams are maybe a way of processing stuff well right Let, let's go back briefly to what you said about your brains processing everything that's coming into it from the outside is that what's happening though or are or is your brain creating everything that's outside well it's it see it, yeah well it, it is because if you think about if, let's just take our eyes for example uh -huh. um to start with we can only see a very small amount of the electromagnetic yes. spectrum. Yes, we can. But what 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 part of the spectrum we can perceive goes into the cones? It comes into cone of cones of our back of our eyes. Cones and rods, yep. Cones and rods, and then when you think about it, it's amazing because the first thing that your brain does is flip the image upside down because mm -hmm. when the light comes in, everything's upside down, mm -hmm. and so your brain is automatically flipping it the right way up, which is pretty cool when you think about it. Um, and then. Once that's ha once that happens, the image is it set? I, I don't know. Is the image recreated in the by the neurons? Well, the image itself see, doesn't come into your brain. It's electrical signals that oh, your brain then interprets. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. It's not that your eyes are upside down, Ray. It's just that it's like when you look through a camera. You know, when 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 you look through a lens, it flips the image because of, you know because the lens is bringing stuff into a central point. What's on the top will be on the bottom, and what's on the bottom will be on the top. I mean, it's just it's just the way a lens works. So, optics. yeah, I mean that that that's well known, and that image is is shown on shown on your retina, and it's upside down and back to front. You know, so yeah. your brain just flips around the right way, and you know people um people have had accidents and things where things go wrong in their brain, and it's not flipped the wrong way any longer, and it's upside down. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, yeah. That, no, the, these kind of things have happened. But I what bet. what tends to happen is eventually the brain flips it back. That's this is the the most amazing thing about the human brain is the ability that it has to protect itself and to heal itself. And when I say protect itself, I don't mean physically. I mean the way that our brains can protect us from trauma, mm -hmm. essentially just by. I mean, this is it can cause problems if it's if it's not if it's sort of stays on resolved but in the immediate um aftermath of something really really traumatic happening whether it's emotional or whatever mm -hmm. you you go almost into shock you you go numb and it's like you can't i've i've had it i've experienced it a few times um with emotional trauma mm -hmm. and it's like your brain disconnect somehow there's a part of it that realizes that what's happened is so awful but it just can't deal with it and so it, it kind of closes it, it it's almost like it closes off a little section of it and i can remember oh, I, 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 I know exactly what you're talking about mate because you know mm -hmm. as a former police officer right I've seen some pretty horrific things. I can imagine. Right. I mean, and, and talking I talking about some of them last week. <laughs> yeah, I, and I'm not going to delve into them because some of them are really pretty horrific, right? And the thing is, you 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 see it, you move on, and you don't really process it because you don't have time. So what you do is you focus on doing your job, you know. So you move on, 
Uh, and it's only afterwards when the gallows humour comes out. And I think that's that's a kind of, and and you you can shoot me down for this if if anyone wishes to. But I think this is kind of thing where, when I was in the police, it was almost exclusively a male dominated organisation, right? And it was very much locker room humour when you got back to the office, and I think that helped. I think it does. You know, with I mean, some of you... these situations that. You yeah. don't, I, I mean, as, as I progressed, as, or as I, I, I moved on in time through the police, more and more women were coming into it. And you, 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 and the, you, you can say, say what you like, but you cannot have the same atmosphere when you have a mixed group than, you have a, than when you have a single sex group. No, you can't. Simple. I mean, that's you just not, can't. I mean, that, that, that's not sexist or anything else. I'm sure that women would almost certainly agree. Mm -hmm. Um there are certain conversations and there's certain types of communication that happens among the sexes that the opposite sex is not even supposed to be able to understand. It, it's just they have their, women have their thing, yep. guys have our thing. And I think in terms of gallows humor, it's actually unbelievably healthy because mm -hmm. when, yeah. you, when you think about what humor is fundamentally, mm -hmm. humor is a response to awful things happening. I mean, look at, um, like some of those candid camera or those those gag reel shows on TV where yeah. the most mm. awful thing happens to a person and the only thing, the only reaction that everybody around them has got is to piss themselves laughing. Yeah. But that's that's a way of processing As. massive unpleasantness. Yeah. And it's why, I think it's why having, um, being able to laugh at yourself is really important <laughs> and also being just having a sense of humor, being able to look at a really shit situation and just laugh because sometimes it's all you can do it's like when the universe has dumped mm -hmm. the biggest amount of shit on you that you can imagine <laughs> it's like and, <laughs> I mean, and, and that's this isn't anything really to do with it but see that that woman that was getting into my my face today about china Right about how I didn't understand what China was like and how it wasn't everything that I was led to believe from from American and journalists and things like that. And I'm like, I've lived in China. I know what the Chinese are like. And she's like, Well, I've I've got hundreds of people that uh, hundreds of people or hundreds of friends there, and they tell me exactly what it's like. But I've lived there, right? And she's like, Well, you you don't understand what it's like. And I'm like. I just love people on Twitter telling me what it's like in somewhere that I've already lived. It must be like that for you when you discuss Africa, when we discuss Africa, Ed. You know, you know if, somebody, if somebody says something about Africa that's completely out of, you know, completely out of kilter, you know, for the part you lived in, you would be like, ah, that's not what Africa was like or, or is like, you know. But I, I mean, particularly with Africa, because it's like when we, when we moved to Europe as kids, I was about... 11 years old, this is 1984. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the sort of reaction that you get from people when they say you've lived in Africa, some of them, are, they, they ask you really stupid questions like, <laughs> did you did you actually have running water? Or did you, did you live in a house or a mud hut? Or did, did everyone have bones through their noses? That's kind of nonsense. I mean, some, of, some, of it's, some of it's jokes, obviously. Yeah. But some of the questions are serious, and you just think... Did you have a slit? I can't say that word, can I? <laughs> nope. <laughs> Did you have a, 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 a man? Did you have uh, a man? <laughs> Did you, uh, have, what, did you have gardeners? Did we have did, did we have uh, maids? People, people working in the house? Yeah, no. I mean, we had nannies and gardeners and cooks oh, and see, we, and... we we had maids as well when we lived in China because everything's so cheap. Mm. You know, I mean, my dad was in the navy, and we had a maid. You know, yeah. I and I'm convinced. I mean, I... I'm convinced she was stealing some of my cars to take to her son. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I had a rude awakening at the age of 11 because we moved to Europe and then suddenly we had to make your own bed and do washing up. I know. It kind of looked like actually doing stuff rather than just sitting on your ass. I'm actually glad of that experience because I probably would have turned into an entitled little shit without it. But Yeah. I mean, we used to go to the tailors and get my, my school trousers tailor-made. 
<laughs> That's how cheap everything was. I mean, there was just no point. You know, you might as well get them tailor made because they would fat. There was just no point in trying to find stuff off the shelf. It was it was incredible. Mm. That and uh, those sorts of experiences. It's like you said, you've got to have lived some somewhere to understand it. I mean, it's yeah. one thing watching stuff on TV or talking to other people about stuff, but particularly with places until you've actually been there and experienced it. Um, yeah. And, and, and that doesn't sitting in a transit lounge at an airport doesn't count. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. But un unless you've actually been there and experienced it and eaten the food and met the people yeah. and talked to people, you, you could have no idea of, of what a place is like. I mean, I get that with Egypt, particularly with, um, mm -hmm. the whole Muslim thing, mm -hmm. because there's uh, there's a real because of circumstances at home, there is a certain current of anti-Muslim sentiment, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of assumptions that are made. You probably noticed that about yeah. China, and there's a lot of assumptions about that are made about <sighs> how people live and what they're like. And when you actually go to the place. You realise that these are some of the most friendly, welcoming, kind, yeah. generous people that you're ever going to meet, and they would do anything for you. And then you come back home, and the ones criticising them are really nasty people. Yeah, and yeah. and it's just you can't. Yeah, but what you've got to remember, you've got to remember is when people are in their own country, right? They are they are different from when they're not. It's like Germans. Look at the Germans when they go on holiday. They suddenly become sunbed Nazis, right? <laughs> I mean, they really do, don't they? Yeah. And it's like people have that. I mean, look at the British when they go on holiday, to, or in particular the English. It's like, where can I get some decent food? You're in Spain. Try the local food. You know, <laughs> yeah. try the calamari. God. You might like it. You don't it's... need to eat bacon and beans every bloody day. Exactly, and it, it's like um, a pa paella. Yeah, paella, paella is great, yeah. and, and it's like you're Greish. sitting there in a lovely Spanish restaurant, and you've just ordered egg and chips, and literally they do the most amazing prawns and bocarones and all kinds of stuff, mm -hmm. and you're sitting there eating freaking egg and chips. Why even go to Spain? Why bother? Yeah, why yeah. bother? If you won't try the local cuisine, but although having said that, I did. You have to draw the line at some of the street food and stuff that they eat in China. And, and the fact, some of the stuff they eat in China is just, it's just too hardcore, mm. you know, to even talk about. In fact, um, we're not going to go, we're going to go back into dreams. Let's go yeah, into let's, dreams. Let's go, right. let's go I'm going to tell you about a dream I used to have when I was about 14 or 15, right? And this is not going to be one of your perverted wet dreams, is it? <laughs> <laughs> have I ever told you about no, such no, a no, dream that no. I may or may not have had? <laughs> No, no, no just, I haven't. I'm just right. saying, this, we need, this is a family show. <laughs> yes, I know it's a family show, but it is beyond a watershed. Oh, anyway, so, nice. so, uh, so, so I, I used to have that dream around about um, 14, 15, maybe something like that. Okay. And it, it was a recurring dream and it was kind of terrifying yet strangely exciting at the same time. So I would, I would be in what appeared at first to be a giant cavern, right? But as I moved further in and the light got better, I then discovered it wasn't a cavern. It was a massive hall in a giant spaceship. And at the far end was a seat with a giant alien in it, right? Have you ever seen Alien, the movie? When they go into the alien spaceship, mm -hmm. multiple times, almost exactly like that, right? <laughs> almost exactly like that, and that I had that dream for like six or seven months. It's but the problem was the problem was I would be dreaming that in nineteen seventy six, and Alien didn't come out until nineteen seventy nine. That's a bit weird. Yeah. Although, I mean, the, the imagery in Alien is based on H.R. Geiger's. Art. Yeah, but I was, so, at, at 15, I wasn't no, no, reading. No, you're not going to have I wasn't reading, I wasn't reading, <laughs> wait till you hear this. No, wait till you hear this. I wasn't reading H.R. Geiger. I was reading Sven Hassel and Wheels of Terror and all that sort of stuff. I'm not surprised you have a bad bloody dream. <laughs> Jeez, you 
know there was such Oh, a Dennis Wheatley, The Devil Rides Out. I went uh, through all the Dennis Wheatley stuff. I did. Um, I tried Stephen King and disregarded him because the man, the man is a really annoying writer. One, he finds it very difficult to get to an ending, and two, he spends what well, what could be days on exposition. But I'd, I'd read Lord of the Rings. Uh, I, I loved the Van Hassel stuff. That was brilliant. I, I just ate it all up. Um, what's his name? Uh, Oh, Eagles, Where Eagles Day and all that, those books. Uh, uh, Alistair McLean, Alistair yeah, McLean, not... read all them, um, Tom Clancy later on and all that. But yeah, so uh, yeah, when I was younger, I was reading some weird stuff, weird stuff, because I'd finished, I'd finished with the Famous Five and the Secret Seven by the time I was 10. You know, that was done, that was out, and I just moved on. Yeah, my, my granny used to buy me books. But did you did you ever have dreams? The, the um, immobile dreams where you've got something really scary happening and you want to run and you can't run or you can or, or the other one that's worse that I get is where you're really angry and you want to punch someone or something and you can't connect with the punch no matter how much energy you put into the punch it's just it just comes out like Keir, that that video of Keir Starmer like punching, Keir Starmer, punching yeah. back <laughs> That's such a good analogy for you it. You bad man. You bad man. <laughs> Put some effort into it, Kier. But I think that's sleep paralysis because you know that's yeah. thing too. That yeah. Because our brain, which is also mad when you think about it, because your brain is so active that your body has to paralyze itself. Otherwise, you, you, you'd be like, you would be an impossible person to sleep with and you, you would probably wake yourself up because of moving around. But then when you actually perceive that in a dream, it's really bloody scary. Especially, I mean, one of, one of my recurring dreams as a child was um, it was basically a house that was kind of like the house that um, some friends of my parents owned in Zambia. Mm -hmm. um, and it was big garden, very, very dark. And I just remember being in this garden, absolutely terrified that there was something moving towards me and I didn't know what it was and I couldn't run away from it um and that when I tried to run it was just you couldn't you basically can't move yeah um so I it, it and then there's the one with the the hag that sits on your chest mm. that's quite a common I one as well I haven't, I haven't experienced one, it no no I haven't I've, experienced that either I've I've heard about it but it makes you wonder what the purposes of these dreams are is it and and well see so, that right so so this is the point are dreams real right because well that, but that be, that depends on what you mean by what's real well, i mean so this is, so the this, question is is it another dimension maybe i mean it's certainly another dimension of thought if you think about oh it yeah yes yeah. but so let's look at the let's look at the, some of the experiments the cia have done okay mm-hmm in fact, let's look at some of the famous inventors first. So, the um, Med Medevlev, I think, or something like that, a Russian guy who who did the periodic table, right? He'd been yeah. he'd been working on it, working on it, working on it. wasn't getting anywhere. Decides to go for a nap. Wakes up, and immediately writes down the dream he's just had, which is the periodic table. And now. And it was almost exactly complete. I think he, they had to make one change to make it work. Mm. So well, that's like this to came Rick. to him. So this came to him in his dream, right? Now, Edison used to nap. He would go to sleep in a chair holding a steel ball. Right? And as he dropped off to sleep, his hand would release and release and release and eventually the steel ball would drop to the ground and wake him up because he never went into deep sleep so what happened was he did all his he, he solved all his problems in this dream state before he would go into deep deep sleep well, and he used that as a technique and so did einstein einstein used that as well well supposedly Tes tesla used um uh like Hindu meditation techniques and stuff, because mm -hmm. he he talked a lot about because yeah. uh, Tesla used to say that that the the uh, devices that he built and the ideas that he had basically came to him from elsewhere. And if you look at Francis Crick, who 
co mm -hmm. co invented or co discoverer of um, the DNA double helix, um, he actually had that idea when he met Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Mm -hmm. if you know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Um, and and it, it makes you wonder just how many of these like breakthrough scientific discoveries or breakthrough ideas have been as a result of an un altered dream, well, almost you, dream like state of consciousness. Yeah. Do you never wake up sometimes and think, well, that's a fantastic idea. I'm going to, I'm going to look into that in the morning, right? You've had this brilliant <laughs> idea yeah. and then you go back to sleep and then you wake up again in the morning. You go, I had a brilliant idea last night, but I have no fucking idea what it was. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I mean, I've I've had that both with dreams and and also mind altering substances as well. Yeah, um, yeah. and and the, the you've got one, to write it down at the time. Yeah, but when you write it down at the time and you read it back to yourself the next day, like, it what is this nonsense? <laughs> <laughs> but then it, 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 that begs another interesting question: is how much is the dream state like some of the altered states of consciousness that you can get through? Um, in ayahuasca and stuff of, like that or yeah, yeah um certain i mean from my own experiences they're very different right but is the dream world i mean one of my big questions is when we die mm -hmm. is how do we perceive it do we perceive it as if we're falling asleep and then some sort of weird dream happens which is whatever's in between lives if there's reincarnation or does it just switch off like a television or i'm i, I don't know i mean do we well, perceive it as if we're dreaming look at um look at anesthesia have you had a general anesthetic before uh yeah but only many 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 years ago and so i i had one fairly recently maybe about five or six years ago it's the first time i'd ever had a general and i hated it right because it's like somebody just flicked a switch and you were off. Mm. There was, no, you know how when you go for a nap or a sleep or whatever, when you wake up, you always know there's been a passage of time, right? I mean, like I had a, a brief nap on the couch this evening for an hour or so, and then I got up, and when I woke up, I thought, shit, I've got a, I've got a show to do with Ed, but it was only like half past seven, so. There's always the the knowledge that time has passed, right? Mm. And you never feel that you never feel that you've been unduly out of it. You know, you kind of you know that everything's still going on, but when you get a general anaesthetic, it's like somebody just turned the switch off, and then suddenly you're awake. And for me, it was one minute I was bump out, and next minute, bang, you're a hundred percent all going thin. What the fuck happened there? Right, and it's a it was the scariest thing ever. But how much is that actually like? I mean, obviously, I, you can't you can't answer the question. How much is that like being well, dead? You you've never been dead, but is it because I mean, the anaesthetic essentially it, it's like um, novocaine or lidocaine, all of the 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 uh, coca derivative. I don't know what uh, I don't know what generals general it's a mix no, it's a cocktail usually right yeah but it seems to shut you down right which is just freaking horrible but is it i mean does it actually shut you down or is, or is it just interfering with the the signals going to your brain because what, you mean it's it, just cutting the reception well exactly i mean yeah. it, this is it's one of the reasons that i found the matrix the original matrix film so profound when it first came out is that it actually raises a lot of these questions i mean the the, the part just after neo's been um have, have you got that video that's Indeed. so when you're when you're under a general anesthetic does that interfere with those electrical signals because i guess that, it does yeah um but then it also kind of puts you to sleep so it must I don't know. I mean, I yeah, well, I think sleep. I'm, I'm not an anaesthetist, so I don't, no, I don't technically no. know how these things work. And neither am I. But I would say sleep is the wrong term to be used there because I don't, I don't think it's anything like sleep. Sleep's a natural process, and sleep, sleep's a weird thing because it's something you can put off, right? I mean, you can keep yourself awake, and you can do it through willpower, and you can do it through, you know, um, caffeine and stuff like that, right? But ultimately, sleep will overtake you. Right, you will sleep. You can't and, not and, sleep. 
And you have to as well. I mean, you have the, to, yeah. The, the experiments that have been done um, with sleep deprivation, and and when when people go without sleep for too long, it it has really harmful. I mean, you start hallucinating and losing your mind, and this is yeah. this is why I've always thought that when we're asleep, our brain must take information that we've kind of gathered while we're awake whatever that is, sounds, smells, etc. Mm -hmm. And it must shuffle it off into like some other storage part of the brain because those memories don't go away. Yeah. They're still available. I mean, in the case of trauma, the brain will protect itself and those memories can be really hard to access. Um, but I mean, just in the case of, say, a shopping list, it's like if I make a shopping list um, on a Thursday, Mm -hmm. Then I, I come Friday, I can still, re I mean, even though I've written it all down, I can still remember the stuff that I has had on the shopping list, even though I've been to sleep. So yeah. those memories are still available, but it, it, it's like it declutters. It, it, it sort of puts, it's like a messy child's room. There was a, there was a tweet from a parent, um, oh, I think it might have been Clammy on Twitter, saying that she'd spent seven hours cleaning her son's room. And I I mean, after thinking to myself, how much freaking mess is this kid making? Um, it, it, the, the sort of cluttered room analogy. Did she have maybe, to saw the sheets up? Oh, I, Christ, I don't know. She had to, to build a new freaking bed or something. Um <laughs> Or bleach the whole place, or repaint the walls. I don't know. Whoever, whoever that kid is, never, is. never go in there with a black light. Never, <laughs> don't do it. But it, it does. It, it's the cluttered room analogy. It's like when we're awake during the day, mm -hmm. our brains pick up loads, loads of this clutter, yeah. and then when we're asleep at night, um, our, I think our brains decide what stuff it can just get rid of. Oh What's yeah, I, I, th I think that. I think it can do that, but I'm I'm not necessarily thinking that the dream state is it doing that, because I think the dream state might and and some of the things that we've got still to be exposed here indicate that there's more to dreams than you think. In fact, in fact, one of the dreams I had that I cannot explain and cannot understand at all. I had a dream. I was in a plane. Right, we'd just taken off. I was sitting at the window seat. I was looking out. The plane was climbing into the sky and tilting to the left. I could see the green fields. And then suddenly I couldn't see the sky. All I could see was the green fields, right? Mm. And the yellow flame that was coming back from the engines towards underneath me, outside, right? So all I could see was fire coming from the wing and the green fields and maybe a farm building or something and then the green fields got bigger and bigger and bigger and the next thing boom you're up right? yeah and and three months later concord crashed in france now oh, that's weird and it was exactly the same as my dream when i saw the plane that's banked and the, boom. yeah no i don't remember that happening that's well this is the crazy thing about dreams because it's not it's not uncommon for i mean it, it's like you have lucid dreaming yeah for example and and also some of the remote viewers i mean is isn't that sort of right so the lucid dreaming stuff yeah that that's that's good because people people sorry people try and do that don't they because they want to have fun in their dreams you know and if once you're in a dream and you know you're in a dream you can pretty much do anything i mean we're talking inception type stuff so obviously our friends at the cia <laughs> they just love that shit they really do right so they they thought right lucid dreaming but we'll have it. well there's a couple of reasons they they went into the lucid dreaming first of all the russians were going into this um not extrasensory perception, but extra human capabilities or something they called it, right? So the Russians were really into this because the Russians thought that if they could get people to lucid dream, they could communicate with each other without the need for a radio, right? Mm. So, so when you think about the military implications, that are immense. Mm. Because if you've got 
somebody sleeping on a submarine and somebody sleeping in a bunker in Russia. And you can just go to sleep and go, you know, fire the missile, right? And the guy wakes up and goes, fire the missile, you know? I mean, without any radio communication, no chance of interception, right? Or you're on the moon base, you know, like the Russians have that moon base, remember? But anyway, you know, you know what I mean? So the Russians were really into this. And of course, the CIA thought, well, we've got to get into this as well. So the CIA started doing experiments. And, and they did a lot of experiments. And that's where you find out that they started with the whole, you know, what's going on in the brain when you're sleeping and all that. And this, this part is shutting down and this part's firing up and all this kind of stuff. And then they started giving people, you know, um, they, they started asking remote viewers to do stuff in their dreams. So they would say to a remote viewer, well, what I want you to do is open the, the sealed envelope in the room next door in your dream and tell me what's in it. Mm. And they were getting something like 80% positive results. Some of those remote viewers are the, what they've been able to see. Right. It, it's, you have to think there's something to it. This is no, oh, yeah, this, yeah. There's, there's so, no possibility that these people are making it up. So, so these results were really, really impressive. And then the CIA comes up with the idea that, well, maybe we can actually do more than just uh, maybe we could do more than just look at information. Like maybe we set can fire to the envelope. No, maybe we can start tasking people to do things. So they started putting people into into dream states, and they would wear goggles and they'd have lights that they would flash at them. Once That's their like eyes Manchurian candidate yeah, stuff. Yeah, but once their eyes were in REM, they would flash the lights, and you could see the lights flashing even though you're your eyes are closed in your sleep and you can see the eyes flash. You know, if you do that with your eyes shut, you can see it flickering, right? So the people would know in their dream state that they were being contacted from the outside and they were told to do specific eye movements to indicate that they'd received and understood. So now you've got direct communication between the outside world and your dream state. This is inception st level stuff that we're starting to get into. Then they started planting ideas into people's heads while they were in dream states. And they took, like they would say to people, you know, as they're going to sleep, you know, you drop off and then they would say, you know, um, eat an orange, eat an orange jelly when you wake up, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And and people would get up and go, hey, can I go to the canteen? What do you want to go to the canteen for? I want some orange jelly. It's actually, I mean... That's yeah. creepy. Well, it's also creepy is how they've ended up utilising all of this information that they gathered because that's one of the reasons that TV commercials are a specific length and also yeah. why things you, you have the repetition that you get from the media as well. Yeah. Um, and it's all, that's why they call it TV programming, because they're programming people. Um, and, yeah. then there's the, and then there's the, the less subtle stuff like, um, oh, what is it? Uh, subliminal messaging. Mm -hmm. um, where, yeah. Yeah. Well, they're just flashing something up. Yeah. You can't even see it. But it also works with um, marketing. It's like where you have movies and then suddenly there's a can of Coke flashed in front of the screen. Oh, or product like placement. That. Well, yeah. not just product placement, but they do it in such a way that it's picked up by your peripheral vision. Yeah. And, and it's like the different parts of our vision seem to go into different parts of our brain as well um, because you've got the stuff that you can see right in front of you, which is your immediate perception. Yeah. Um, but then you, you have this sort of edge of your field of vision where instinctively humans, I mean, it's there's potentially important stuff happening there, like mm -hmm. things chasing you or there might be a lion or some predator or something like that if we're talking about the lizard brain. And so that, that edge of our, our sort of field of vision, the brain is actually really sensitive to that, to what's going on there. I mean, I... <laughs> And and it, it's what are you laughing at? I'm laughing at Frankie <laughs> having some kind of meltdown. It's like I've been to the shop, right? And they 
And, and then they go, yes, I'm speaking in real time, but I think I'm 10 minutes behind on the stream. <laughs> I'm having an existential crisis. <laughs> uh, maybe, I don't know, I don't know. Technology. <laughs> don't, don't blame us for YouTube messing with your brain, people. It's not our fault. YouTube probably do it deliberately to mess with people. <laughs> they probably do. They probably do. Right, um, let's, um, we've got, I might as well use these because we did them. Um, Mm -hmm. that, uh, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> not, not quite. I guess if if it's a really dark, stormy day, that might look a little bit like San Francisco. Um, although, although, admittedly, in the machine world, there's far less homeless people. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's true. They've all got a nice, comfy bed, haven't they? <laughs> so the question is, right? The question is, if that was the case, could you tell the difference? Could you? We couldn't. No, you couldn't, could you? I mean, we. Yeah, do you think it? Think it. Think of the times that you're in dreams where it seems so real that when you wake up, it's like, oh wow, that was just a dream. Well, that's one of the reasons the Matrix was, was yeah. and is such a profound film. Yeah, because it it kind of asks and in a way attempts to answer some of these questions as the sort of subplot to all of the the action and the machines and stuff like that. But this whole notion that you could stick a techno spike in your head and get hooked up to a machine and suddenly it's Mark Zuckerberg's wet dream. <laughs> I, I mean, it's like you, if you look at some of these, uh, particularly since the Oculus and Apple, the Apple one have come out. And you see some of these monks. Oh, there's, there's more these, coming out. Right. Just, so the, there's something coming out called the Halo and... There's something else coming out, and they are designed to let you lucid dream, right? I, uh, yeah. I so they're know. not, they're not, um, they are non-invasive devices that will sit around your head, right, and will oh, allegedly allow you to go into a lucid dream state. I'm, and I'm game for that. I'm, I'll try it. I'll try yeah, it. Yeah, I, I would try uh, that. First of all, I want to find out who put in the seed money for the company and who runs it and is there any connections with people like Incutel which is a CIA tech financing front because uh -huh. that's just like oh yeah the CIA are like let's just give them these devices we'll tell them they can lucid dream and then we can control them and we can have well, a whole load a... of bloody um, winter soldiers no not, not not winter soldiers Manchurian candidates because I mean yeah see whole... yeah so do, you, do you think that, because obviously The Manchurian Candidate is a couple of good films and a book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, the now, Jason Bourne movies as well, they're the same. Well, Jason Bourne's, those, those are different because with those, similar, he, similar. He, well, he loses his memory. He's, yeah. he's on a... He's on a, a well, he's reprogrammed. He's reprogrammed. Well, he's, first of all, he's reprogrammed and then he loses his memory. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's... That's fascinating too. I mean, do you, there's stories. MK Ultra. Of, well, I mean, the amount of money that's gone into these things, and also some of these patsies, <sighs> some of these, some of these lone nut assassins. Sirhan Sirhan comes to mind. There's also a guy called Volker de Graaf, who was the guy who shot um, Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a, a Dutch politician, uh, Pim Fortuyn, and he was shot in. Uh, the early noughties, I think. Yeah, I mean, um, and some of these. What, what about some of these? Um, I don't know if you can use the word. Shall we say, uh, learning institutions shootings? <laughs> what about yeah. some of them? I know they're young, but why? Why couldn't they? Well, been... there's supposedly there's a connection between a lot of those and certain um, antidepressant medications. Oh, is that, yeah, right, by... yeah. Yeah, there is. Our, you're our right. Friend, you're our, right. Our, 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 not friends. Our and enemies at big fight at big no, pharma. You're right. That's 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 a good point, Ed. And I've forgotten about that because it's when they come off them. You can't come off these. That you can't go cold turkey, and that's what they do. They they try and go cold turkey, and they go nuts. And some of and them it's have like um, side effects too. Yeah, it's like uh, antidepressants. Never go cold turkey off antidepressants. And this is not medical advice, but. Don't do it, right? Because if you if you go cold turkey off antidepressants, 
I'm trying to think how to phrase this, but what it does do, what it can do is it can, because you've gone cold turkey off it, it can put you into a depression, right? And it can give you enough gumption to actually follow through, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And that's why you don't go cold turkey off antidepressants, if you're ever on inhibition. And then especially when you're yeah. somewhere like the United States where you've got easy access to firearms. Yeah, yeah. But don't... Also, it, it, I mean, if you if you look at the the rates of prescription of those sorts of things. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy, 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 crazy. And, and I mean, humans have lived perfectly fine without those things. But then, yeah, but millennia. you're right. You're right. And, and there are, I mean, they're coming out with studies all the time saying that mucking with your brain chemistry doesn't help, right? So these antidepressant things aren't necessarily a need. They're just masking a symptom, but they're not really getting to the root cause and fixing the problems. And that's where dream dream therapy for PTSD seems to work. And another thing that really works that I probably, I, I, I can't say, right? And in fact, oh, hold on a minute. Uh, oh, there's, I, I, I've just noticed there might be a mushroom growing down there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, there's been, uh, the, the thing is that there have, there's, there are reputable scientifically backed studies into the use of these unimaginable yeah. substances. Fungi. The, fungi. The, 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 funky, the funky fungi. Yeah. That were actually PTSD, where um, mm -hmm. soldiers and stuff. And, who, and, to, and to stop addictions, drug addictions as well. Absolutely. And I think it's, I actually think it's criminal that these things are outlawed and that. Even, I mean, it because you can't even study them scientifically. But, but properly. of course, they're outlawed because they're natural products and you can't patent a natural product. Exactly. It's not until you've actually got an artificial substitute that any, you know, pharma company's interested in it mm. because you can't make money on a natural product. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, I mean, that's criminal. Mm -hmm. That's criminal. And, that and is. it's also, I mean, the, it's greed. The, absolutely. But greed is going to be the end of all of us. Yeah, yeah, it probably will. Yeah. Um, whether that's greed for money or greed for power. <laughs> Frank, probably... Frank, he's still not got to my thing about him having an existential <laughs> crisis because he says, I'm enjoying the chat, but I'm thinking behind 15 minutes. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, I don't know if he is, though. I don't know if he is because that appeared just... After the the mushies, a great thing from Brit, mate. Well, I, I, I know YouTube is. There's, there's I'd like seconds. to study them, John and John. I'd like to study them, but I, because of my um, record, not record, but because of my upbringing and and um, previous occupations, I have no contacts in these fields. I don't know where to get any of this stuff. <laughs> anyway, um, if you can hit me up, uh, what was I going to say? <laughs> Uh, don't say things like that. I end up with wine all over my keyboard. <laughs> that would be bad. <laughs> so, so yeah. So, so um, the the CIA, the CIA are all over this. They love this kind of stuff. They really do. And and you know, there's an awful lot behind it. An awful lot behind it that that seems to be coming true. And I think they probably find that all the stuff that's been released is really old research. You know, obviously because it's it's fallen well, out. I I think you only have to look at the last four years to see a lot of that research being put into practice, particularly, mm -hmm. um, particularly starting in 2020, um, yeah. where it, it kind of, I mean, it's always been there. If you, once you, once you sort of work up to the, the rabbit holes and, and the, the fact that we're being lied to about everything and you see the media for what it was, then you can see through it, but they ratchet, they've kind of ramped it up yeah. significantly. So, and also, there's sorry, just yeah, one more, one more yeah, thing. There was a on. brilliant interview that I saw at the beginning of the whole coup period, which was actually a stage hypnotist that he did a breakdown of the the government's fear propaganda posters. Yeah, yeah. And and he actually he went through it and he he said, look, he was a stage hypnotist in the nineties, and he said that with stage hypnotism, the show starts before you even actually enter the the theater where the uh -huh. um, the the uh, hypnotist is 
that the posters and the marketing material yeah. specifically designed to get your brain into a specific space yeah. before you even start the show. And he was comparing his posters and the posters that the government was putting out and the kind of colors and the sort of imagery. It's, it, it was just like mind control, yeah. effectively. Yeah. And, they, and if you think about the, the scale of the mind control mm -hmm. and the ongoing nature of the mind control, because mm -hmm. we because the mind control shifted seamlessly from the coof to the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't did, did you notice that too? How it was almost like oh yeah, snap, yeah. someone snapped their fingers and suddenly there's there's no more of that. And hey, there's, yeah. there's this new thing. Yeah, and everyone suddenly had flags out and the whole it's just like, hang on a minute. Yeah, like, I mean there's still there's, there's still a, there's still a Ukraine flag flying over the town square here. <laughs> I mean, it's like fuck off. I mean, these people are like—it's like ridiculousness. It really that's, is. Ridiculous. That, and then you know the well, you know, you know, you know what the current thing is. You know, so I mean, it just switches to the next current thing. And yeah. the only the only reason that keeps going back to Ukraine is because um, Mister P isn't taking any shit. In fact, it seems to be ramping things up now. But anyway, let's get back to let's get back Dreams. to. Um, Let's get back to dreams and the CIA and dream tasking. Okay, so you would then put people into these these uh, sleep states, hypnagogic state between between proper deep sleep and and uh, and and wakefulness, and then they would give them the idea to go somewhere, you know, to go somewhere and and check something out and whatever, right? And people would go to these places, and sometimes they wouldn't go to. Th they would go to the place and everything would be fine and they would actually report back and it would be like an 80% hit rate. But then they would go somewhere and it's like they took a wrong turn or something and they end up in somewhere that they don't recognise. Right? And people come and take them out of there and put them back where they should be. Right? Hmm. As if they've gone into a part of... This, a part of the dimension that they shouldn't be in. And then you get the reports from the ones that go, I walked through a door and there was a demon with eyes 400 feet apart looking at me. You know? Yeah. Well, there's just, I mean, there's people that do um, ayahuasca DMT that quite frequently report contact with some sort of creature I mean, they, they have various different names for it, but the thing about it is, is that a lot of the stories and a lot of the things that people talk about mm -hmm. are actually very similar. And, yeah. and the descriptions that they give of these, this is where some of this, this lizard people stuff comes from. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, David Icke talks about it quite a lot, but he's not the only one. And more to the point, there's a lot of people that have actually experienced it themselves and come back from this experience and say, yeah, I, I encountered some sort of creature and it wasn't particularly nice. Um, <laughs> but then... The... <laughs> I'm sorry. Your, your mate is winding you up again. Um, shut up, John. <laughs> Just shut up, John. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> Right, sorry. Yeah, the lizard people. I know, I mean... Here's a question, though, that I meant to ask earlier, and I'm sorry, people, I should have asked it earlier when we were just getting into the kind of, you know, why do we even sleep thing. What about things like dolphins, right, and whales? Okay. Now, they do sleep, but they don't yeah. sleep... They don't sleep for long, do they? And seals and stuff like that. Well, seals can pull out, but dolphins... <laughs> But what about cats? Huh? Cats, I mean... Are cats, cats ever awake? <laughs> That's a fair point. <laughs> but, do I mean, because you see, you see videos occasionally popping up on social media of dogs that are asleep, that, that where their legs are going and they look like they're running. Yeah, 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 yeah. So do, I mean, and if dogs dream, yeah, then you would think, I mean, do elephants dream? Probably, do and which would which would suggest that whales must dream and yeah yeah but my point is they 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 can't sleep in any lengthy they can't like get a good solid eight hours because they drown 
Yeah, but humans, you don't have to start. You don't need eight hours of sleep. To start no, dreaming. I know. I mean, no, it, no, it, no, I know, I know. If if they're if for whatever reason biologically, they're able to fall, they're able to go into a deep sleep much quicker, and require less of that sleep. Where if, if you're a smaller creature with a smaller brain, then maybe you need less sleep, for example. Um, but maybe they still dream. But then the more fascinating question is, what what does an elephant dream of? Uh, luscious grass? I don't know. Um, having yeah. a shower? <laughs> well, I, exactly. I mean... Did... Um, uh, hold on. Your mate's apparently sending me links. Don't send, don't send links in the chat, John. Um, put them in Twitter or something like that, because... One, I'm not opening links on the on the the chat, uh, and there's always a chance they get blocked by YouTube's automatic software type stuff. So send me links by all means, but please do it at Calator uh, at Accolator on on Twitter if you if you don't mind or 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 whatever you know somewhere. You can email me at John at chasingdescent dot com. That's that's there. Right. Uh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Ed. What? No, I'm 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 just about to apologise for the fact that my best mates are now probably going to spam the shit out of you to the point he drives you insane. No, it's okay. <laughs> I, I'm I'm well I'm well well versed with um, the the tools for blocking stalkers. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't go that far, but yeah, maybe sometimes a little bit. <laughs> Right, let's then um, wait. Hold on, I know I interrupted you there, and, and I need to. But, right, let's play this one. This one's good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's foretelling our doom. Well, it, this is. I mean, this is late nineties. This came out, and AI he, was not just in. Was it not eighty? Was, it, was no, ninety. No, it was ninety. Was it ninety? Ninety-seven, ninety-eight. Yeah, right. Like Ninety-six. Ah, okay, something like that. Um, yeah. Well, the thing is that AI was basically just a, a gleam in its father's ball bag at the point. At mm -hmm. that point, um, and they—I mean, there was rudimentary machine learning and stuff, nothing like the the large language models and so-called general generative AI that we've got now. But even so, even the AI that we've got now, uh, it's uh, uh, unfortunately. I don't know if governments have something more powerful and sophisticated. But currently, it's not artificially intelligent. It just it's looks, not intelligent. It looks like it is. I mean, it passed the Turing test, but that just means we'd have need to update the Turing test. Yeah, yeah, I think um, so. But I mean, is. if you look at, and and they're all stealing each other's code. I mean, Grok's just a lifter. Chat GPT. It's even got Chat GPT error messages on it. Yeah, and it, it's it it, <laughs> it it has the same kind of. It just has some kind of rubbishy with, stuff. Well, it, it's they've they've layered on top a kind of uh, like I don't know, sort of Elon Musky type personality where it's it's trying to be cool and it just sounds a bit lame. And well, that's kind of like Musk, isn't it? <laughs> he tries to be yeah. cool and he just sounds a bit lame. So I, I I don't I I'm, I just asked you a question. I, I don't need a load of attitude, thank you very much. And mm -hmm. and if you want it to be serious, you have to tell it to be serious. And it's just like, <laughs> oh, come on. When I was thinking something more along the lines of the Star Trek computer that was actually bloody useful and you could just ask it natural language yeah. questions. Yeah, so you're thinking that, and what we actually got was the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> Although I think it's slightly more insane than Hitchhiker's Guide to the yeah. Galaxy because this is like clown guide, Hitchhiker's Guide to, guide to Clown World. Yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, dear. But it, then here's an interesting thought to bake your noodle. Go on. As and when an AI is created, would that AI dream? Do I androids that, dream of electric sheep? Well, I mean, the thing is that they don't need to dream because they don't have to sleep. Well, why don't they have to sleep? Don't they need downtime? Well, I, I'm not sure that humans are inventing 
I don't know well, right. What's the point, what's the point uh, in having an Android hold on. if it needs di- yeah. downtime? <laughs> but hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Windows needs downtime. That's true. And all the droids in Star Trek needed to be recharged. Yeah, because if you run your Windows like I do for two or three days without um, rebooting it, okay, you know, just putting it to sleep, at the end of three days, it's fucked. It just can't go on. It's had enough. You've got to restart it. Oh, I, I, I shut my laptop down every night. Yeah, yeah, I know, but I, I, I just put it to sleep generally and... Um, I mean, sleep just puts it into hibernation, so it wakes up with exactly, almost exactly the same uh, memory load and usage and windows open, that, you know, like 83 and a half tabs open and Google and all that. But anyway... It also depends on what you're doing with it. Well, yeah. I, I have I have a separate um, server that is, I run as a media server, and that probably gets shut down three times a year for me to... Yeah, but that's not, that's, not, that's not doing a lot, right? Okay, whereas my PC is doing everything, right? I mean, it's doing video editing, it's doing streaming, it's doing research, it's doing YouTube, it's doing everything, right? And after about three days, it's done. It's fucked. You've got, uh, if you don't restart it, you're, you're, you're not going to get a Okay, here's, here's a question for you. On average, how many browser tabs do you have open at one time? On average? Well... I have three different browsers that I use for different <laughs> reasons. <laughs> so I have a Brave browser open. I have a Google Chrome browser open, and I have a Firefox browser open. Right. Each of those has in the region of fifteen tabs open. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I do. T- I mean, if I'm using DaVinci, um, which is quite a beefy part of uh, software, I do tend to close it and close it right out when I'm finished with it um, to free up some resources. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a I'm a tab Nazi. I, I'll only I'll generally if I have more than about seven or eight tabs open. Um, you my see, the problem is to go a bit squiggly. The problem is I'm using them all, you know, like I've got, I, I need three tabs open in YouTube studio for the three different things. Cause I've got one for one, right. one for the live stream, one for the, the dashboard and then one for Ben's channel. And the problem is I need a different browser for that. Cause you can't have two channels open in the same browser unless you go incognito. Right. So, right. and then if you, you can't use it, you can't really sign in as incognito because then it, the, nothing sticks. So. You're better, you know. You know what? You know where it, you can see where this is going. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, anyway, there you go. Right. So, um, where, where are? Let's go back to the matrix. Um, well, let's finish that off. I think there's only one left. <laughs> oh, that is so true. Fate is not without a sense of irony. Indeed. Um, in fact, so, in fact, fate is quite often a sarcastic, ironic, facetious wanker. <laughs> mm-hmm. Indeed, it is. There you go. So. Um, if I could, be, if anything would make me believe that a computer-generated dream world existed, it would be Keanu Reeves in that movie. Because he's he's good, but he's not great. You know what I mean? He yeah. could he could be AI himself. Well, yeah, and I I think that that's part of because all of them were quite young to start with, um, and also a little bit more rough around the edges than they are now. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it was also intentional on the part of the yeah, directors. Th- yeah, it probably was. Because their, their whole... Because it almost has an anime, manga, kind of cartoony sort of... Yeah, it does. Uh, it. The, um, the Wachowskis. Yeah, absolutely. So I think they were going for a particular look. But it's there are some fascinating questions that it, it asks because... That diff- it's, it's like when Neo is waking up and he can't deal with it. Yeah. That's almost, that. it's like the ultimate cognitive dissonance. Yeah. And when you look at what's happened over the last three or four years, going back longer, depending on how, how long back you've been researching this sort of stuff, you get a small version of that with, let's call them the normies. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and when you hit someone with a piece of information that is so contradictory to everything, because it's not just to what they believe, but it, it's they've they've kind of constructed a whole worldview around it, for example. And then you come in and you try and poke holes in that, or or trying to explain to people that most of what they learned in school was nonsense. Oh yeah, and, and yeah. actual verifiable nonsense in yeah. other cases. Uh -huh. Um. And they will still refuse to believe it. Yeah, and it's it's more it's easier and it's more comfortable to hold on to their existing worldview than it is to have that worldview challenged. And I think that particularly that last scene with Neo, where he just can't deal with the information that he's been given, it's like, no, what you thought was reality is not reality. This is this is reality, and it kind of sucks. And the world's not what we thought it was. And bu <laughs> buckle up buttercup because you're the one and <laughs> yeah, you've um, got a lot more work to do <laughs> and then he goes then he goes to the, the or, that oracle lady um and i mean just the, the movies are so good once once you got to two and three they kind of got a bit crap but the first one is an absolute masterpiece yeah the first one is brilliant um and it's i mean it's not the best acting in the world and stuff like that but the story is massively original. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also, it's still relevant because this whole question, I mean, we have to worry about machines taking over the world even more now than we did in the late 90s. In the late 90s, it was like Terminator and, and it was all sort of pipe dream, this is going to happen in however many years. And we're now however many years <laughs> past that and this stuff is happening. And the whole world is going to hell in a handbasket. I mean, I saw a video yesterday of a, a Chinese drone swarm that was mm -hmm. hundreds of these bloody things moving in perfect synchronization. And you imagine a, even just a hand grenade and you, you have 200 of these things that have all got hand grenades on them. You don't need a big bomb if you've got lots of little bombs. Did you see the Russian uh, guy with the backpack? Yeah. Uh, the, what the four yeah the yeah. anti yeah the, i mean obviously it's basically just basically a jammer isn't mm, it yeah but they've also got this uh, there was another one where the russians developed a drone gun that that actually blasts out some sort of something or other um i mean obviously not a projectile some some sort of energy beam radio All right, cool. see, whatever yeah and knocks these drones out but there was another one. They've also they've all got shotguns now as well. Yeah. I think I think whoever manufactures um, shotguns for the military in Russia is laughing because they did. The, it's like clay pigeon shooting. Yeah. Except cool. It, yeah. Except for the fact that the clay clay it's pigeon just... is being run by a. Uh, your your opponent who's yeah the clay pigeon can shoot back <laughs> yeah well it doesn't it's not that so much that it can shoot back but it can just go straight up your bum hole and ruin your whole day mm -hmm. yeah and I mean this drone I I don't know I saw something on Twitter of someone saying that drone drones in war need to be outlawed <laughs> but that's not going to happen let's face it why would they do well cluster cluster munitions were outlawed and yet they're still using them yeah but it, I mean it's war changes it's like we went from knights on horseback in armor to soldiers yeah. with cannons and muskets it evolves to automatic weapons to machine guns to missiles and nuclear weapons and icbms and now drones and god knows what they've got in store for us when world war three starts i have I, I have wondered whether the, the the sort of Western powers, particularly the Americans, have just been just getting rid of all of their old crap that they don't need anymore because they've got some sort of super secret something or other waiting in the wings. But it's, it never comes out, and you'd, you'd think that they're they're about to suffer a rather large defeat in a certain part of the world. Um, and you'd think maybe they would bring some of this stuff out, but maybe well, they've they kind of they've kind of backed themselves into a hole here, haven't they? You know, they've they've been at it so long now. And what they've done is they've basically the, the things they thought that would hamper Russian industry and production have actually helped it. Yeah. Right? 
and now so they're that, just doing more of the same. Yeah, so that's <laughs> backfired massively. They have done nothing but hamper their own productions because everything's gone sky high and they can't get anything, you know, like energy and whatever. Mm. So, so yeah, they haven't really helped themselves at all. It was a pretty ill-thought-out strategy. And to be fair, the US doesn't have a great record on strategy abroad. They And it's getting worse. I mean, yeah. the thing is that even three years ago four years ago eight years ago i mean there was there were people warning there's that mm -hmm. memo thanks to wikileaks yep. and mm -hmm. let's let's just say a, a big excellent well yeah. done to julian assange for getting out without yeah. being in a box like other people um but thanks to wikileaks we know about a cable from then yeah u.s ambassador to moscow uh, uh william burns who's now CIA director, I think. Yes, uh, Bill Burns. Um, and he basically, the, the, the memo is famously entitled Nyet Means Nyet, saying, mm -hmm. don't do this. And if you do this, it's going to be bad. And that's what's happened because smart people were not listened to. And here we are. Yeah. But we're, yeah. we're straying that... away from dreams again. Yeah, <laughs> Bill, gonna, well, we, we are, but Bill Burns Bill, um, should be the foreign secretary and not the head of this year to be fair well he i mean he seems to act like it a lot of the time yeah Maybe well he, he, let's face it the rest of them are they, they are a clown show aren't they they really it's, are it, it's the state of u.s leadership well just western leadership and i mean we've now got mark Rutte and kaya Callas uh, just being two of the mm -hmm. like the least suitable people to have the jobs that they've got and I mean, it's like Kaya Carlos, she's she's about as diplomatic as a punch in the face. Yeah. Literally. I mean, I, oh, I just I weep for the future. Um, what was I going to say? What uh, what do you think is going to happen tonight at the debate? <laughs> um, well, they've, they, I, I don't know what they will have had to have pumped Joe Biden. That's apparently them. Apparently they're not using auto cues either. Oh no, he's going to have an earpiece. He'll have a cleverly disguised earpiece, and but most likely he'll have someone like Obama. It's really hard to talk eloquently or when you've got an earpiece on. They've, I don't know. They've, they've drugged him up so much. They've. I, I was gonna, I was gonna say something that I probably shouldn't say on YouTube relating to blood transfusions. But... Oh yeah, okay, I, I know where you're going. I mean. You, the fact that he's even doing it, he's not. I mean, if you saw him at the G8, yeah, or the G7 rather, in oh, yeah, yeah, I in know. Italy, I mean, he's it's like he's deteriorating really fast. And they want this guy to do another four years. Oh, good luck. Not, with that. I, I think he's going to pull out. I still think, I still think he's going to pull out, and Gavin Newsom will be running as president. Oh yeah, and that's going to be as good as Keir Starmer running the UK. Oh Yay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> hey, why? Like, if, you might as well double down. I mean, if you're going to get a shit storm, why not do it together? Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and then, I mean, we've got Trudeau that's hanging on by his fingernails at the moment. I know. Um, but yeah, the world is a mess. It does. Right. So, um, I think we've pretty much. Uh, have we come to the end of the dream state? I think we kind of have. I've got. I do. We, 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 let's face it. And uh, and if you were looking for answers here, <laughs> <laughs> you've come exactly to the wrong place. Yeah. Because I, I don't think there are any answers for many of the things that we talk about. I mean, we we chat about them, and sometimes we come to conclusions and whatever. But I don't think um, I don't think you can ever determine at this point in time what dreams are for. Why we need to? I mean, why? I mean, if you think about it, why do you need to sleep? You know, and and it's not just us. Every mammal does it. Every reptile seems to do it. Even every, insects have downtime. You know, everybody seems to have downtime. So it seems to be a a requirement of an organic functioning entity that it needs some downtime to to decompress. But that's, this, does that mean that dreams are also something to do? Crocodiles have dreams. Do well, you Bum, see, bumpers, bumblebees go to, go to sleep. Do bumblebees yeah, have dreams? I don't know. I mean, the thing is, 
It's fascinating. The, the thing is, why do you need to sleep? I mean, think about it. Effectively, you, you, I mean, you're wasting almost a third of your life sleeping, right? Why do you need to sleep? Because surely, surely there, there should be no reason why, I, if you're getting enough food, rest, and um, nutrients, that you should have to actually just go, you know? Why, why should you have to do that? Let's and see. the thing is, why should creatures that have less mental capacity sleep more? Like cats and dogs. But also, how much of that is about the body Boredom? preparing itself? <laughs> like, like I was saying at the beginning, that, that there's certain processes that happen in the body only when you're asleep. And most of those processes are actually relating to repair. Um, that that while you're awake, your body your body is basically working, and it's not putting any energy into repairing. And then when you're asleep, your muscles relax, everything relaxes. Yeah, I think I've got to. Um, I got. I think I got to disagree with Ray. Those that sleep longer or smarter. I don't. I don't think so. Um, Einstein, Edison, Tesla. None of these guys slept for any length of time. They would catnap all the time. They they wouldn't sleep. I mean, they're, they're that, famous for not sleeping, mm -hmm. or, or for sleeping very little. So, and these are the smartest guys on the planet. Quite obviously recognised as such. So, I think I've got to disagree with you there, mate. Mm. Oh, right. So where are we at? Oh, we've done this an hour and a half. Yeah, we've already done an hour and a half. I think that's perfectly acceptable. Yep. Yeah, no, it's a good amount of time. We've yeah, still got, we've still got people in chat, which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, we've still got a good, uh, we've still got a good uh, amount of people watching us, and thank you very much for attending. Um, if you would like to help us out, you can like, share, and subscribe. That's all free, because we don't make a lot of money, and what little we do goes on um, essentials like food. <laughs> Not drink anymore because I'm trying to lose weight. In fact, I haven't. Uh, this is the first day I've eaten since Sunday. That's good. Yeah, yeah, well, I've lost eight pounds, so that's a good start. Um, so I'll keep going and see how we go on. I really need to get into some, some serious uh, weight, pardon me, weight reduction. Well, uh, and if you have the opportunity, feel free to drop us a donation at ko-fi.com forward slash chasing descent, paypal.me forward slash chasing descent, or indeed join the channel for as little as 99 pence a month. Um, you can pay more, obviously, but you, know, you can join it for as little as that. Yeah, the stream is ending, Frankie. Well done. <laughs> You've got there on the end, mate. He's been going on about the stream ending for about the last half hour. <laughs> I think he's trying to... He's trying, he's trying to... Pre he's trying to... <laughs> he, he, pre premonition? He's trying to get a premonition that he's right. And I think eventually you got there, mate. Well done. So, as always, Ed, um, say goodbye to these lovely people. Oh, thanks, guys. It's been good fun. I hope everyone enjoyed it, and I'll see you again next week. And as always, it's been great for you.